Sergeant Hope, could you please start the recording again? Put him started. Okay, uh, once again, so I'd like to apologize. For Sergeant Hope, could you please start the recording again? Uh, good, good morning and welcome to New York City Council's remote committee hearing on criminal justice jointly with the Civil Service and Labor Committee. Everyone, please turn on your video at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chairman, we're ready to begin. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. We have a lot of... Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers, Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee here in the City Council. I want to thank so many people for joining us today for a joint oversight hearing on the condition of our city's jails. We are joined here today by Chair Denique Miller, who is Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and many colleagues. Hi, yes, I apologize, but I'm, in the, I'm the one starting the meeting, so. <laughs> I think we have a sergeant, if you can, here, so thank you. Um, and we are joined by many folks here today. I want to just acknowledge a number of my colleagues who are here for both committees. We are joined by council members, uh, Lander, Adams, Amprey Samuel, Diaz, Denowitz, Holden, Levin, Lewis, Moya, Riley, Rivera, Rosenthal, Ulrich, Van Bramer, and I will get more if they have uh, joined us. We're also joined by our public advocate. We are also joined by our district attorney from the Bronx, Darcel Clark. We are, uh, of course, also going to be hearing from, but I want to acknowledge them, a number of state elected officials. I know some who have been to Rikers Island this, earlier this week. Uh, we have some member Gonzalez Rojas, some member Gallagher, some member Burgos, some member Ramon Dani, and I believe we're going to be joined by a few more. I'm sorry that I did not get to them yet, but we, of course, will acknowledge them as they. Senator Ramos, Ramos, excuse me, here as well, and I will acknowledge others as they uh, make it in here. I want to thank everyone for being here because, as many know and have seen in the last few weeks, the city jails have been described as a humanitarian crisis. We have seen the condition of our city's jails deteriorate over the last several months to the point where it's no longer a safe environment for those in custody or those who work in the jails. We've had one staffer come forward recently to sound the alarm on the collapse of basic jail operations. But if you look at the numbers, you can see it very clearly. A pro a situations that were already problematic are going up drastically. We have assaults are up, both on staff and on those in custody. Use of force is up, self-harm is up, and we have seen an alarming amount of deaths, 10 so far this year, at least five, which were suicides. And I want to send my deepest condolences to the family and friends of those who we have lost, and of course, anybody who has been attacked or assaulted inside of our city jails. Those in custody are not getting the most basic of services, such as food, showers, and medical care. And I want to be quite clear, and I want this to be on the record and clear that we cannot long let things continue to spiral out of control. And this hearing, and this is a moment we are sounding the alarm about the state of our city jails. We are calling this hearing to highlight those conditions, to hear from the administration on their plans, some which they have announced yesterday, but to think, short and long term about how to get out of the situation, to advocate for better solutions, and to end this downward spiral that we have seen over the last year and a half. One major issue is that DOC has been grappling with is a severe staffing shortage, despite having one of the most robust staff to detainee ratios in the nation. They've been, we have seen staff calling in in record numbers, or some simply not showing up at all. We also, of course, then see folks working double and triple shifts. That means often working 24 hours without food, water, or bathroom breaks. And I have to be the first, as we all know, it's unacceptable for somebody to be expected to work a triple shift inside of our city jails. We've heard about housing units going completely unstaffed. All these scenarios create life-threatening conditions for those in custody and, in, and for those in custody and the staff working there. We are going to be hearing today from DOC, and I think we're also joined by our first deputy mayor, Dean Fullahan, um, 
about the specific, specific initiatives undertaken so far to address this crisis, the mayor's plan that he announced yesterday, and what steps they will be taking. We'll also ask what our immediate steps need to be taken to prevent any more harm to people working inside of our jails and people in custody. And I just wanna, this is in my script, but I just wanna say one additional item, which is that whether you are in custody, whether you're working there, if you're a doctor, if you're wearing a uniform, this crisis affects everyone. Everybody should be concerned about this. I know there's lots of folks here who are persuaded by different arguments or different politics in this Zoom here right now, but what we are facing is a crisis and anybody who's in custody, anybody who's going to work there is facing the same safety and security issues at this, popular, at this particular moment. I think the administration could be doing more to look at uh, 6A releases and other ways to lower the population there. They are, of course, taking steps to correct some of the staffing issues. Uh, we're going to discuss all those issues today, but uh, I'm very appreciative of everybody who's taking time here today. We have over 100 panelists today. Uh, so I want to say thank you to them. And I just want one programming note that we are going to have hear from a lot of folks today. So we are going to be very strict with timing. I can with council members too, but of course, folks that are testifying. So we can give everybody an opportunity to get to their testimony and hopefully limit the amount of waiting time that will be happening here for folks. So with that, I want to turn it over to Chair Miller. And then we're going to, after that, we're going to hear from our public advocate, Jamani Williams. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, I'm Councilmember Member Ida McMiller, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us this morning and those who are partic participating in today's hearing. Thank you, uh, Chair Powers, for your insight and your leadership and your sincere commitment to a safer and more productive uh, and humane jails. And thank you for having this Committee on Civil Service and Labor and allowing us to join you this morning and, and bring a voice from from labor and and a broader uh to address the broader home holistically uh those uh impact uh that we've seen over the past few months on on rikers island uh, i'd like to thank the members of the committee on civil service uh and labor that have joined us today all of which are in attendance today and and which shows how just uh, very important this is. But let me be clear that the current state of, of city jails is unacceptable and it must be addressed. This is complex and it is multifaceted and labor relations are no doubt a component. As this city council delves into today's testimony, I want to ensure that we work, that the work that we do is grounded in facts and, 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 and the questions are grounded in facts. First, both incarcerated folk and, and corrections officers and other employees of DOC are entrapped by these conditions on Rackers Island. Solutions require investment in both parties because the safety and the well being are codependent. Commissioner Chevaldi, in a re recent briefing to the Black Latino Asian Caucus, offered a compelling antidote about surprise and camaraderie between uh, and cooperation between uh, the CEOs and the incarcerated individuals. It is important that we do not accept a reductive, skewed understanding of this dynamic of the two, difficult as it may be. Secondly, we must ensure that we are asking proper questions about the workplace safety and standards. Uh, as it relates to delivery of services. It is imperative that the council receives clarity and, and, and of definition so that we can accurately understand the context and the scale of the problem. Third, as a chair of civil service and labor, I must emphasize uh, collective bargaining. I, am, I, I represent the 27th council district, which, which has the largest population of municipal employees uh, in, in the city. Uh, as a, a former municipal employee uh, myself, we recognize, and I think that we are all in agreement that this system is broken and has to be fixed. But the workplace conditions are also broken. Scheduled to testify today is organized labor representing not just as the correction officers, uh, but civilian employees and also uh, uh, captains um, who work to support the capacity alongside incarcerated individuals. We can all agree that double and triple shifts without meal breaks is inhumane. Some CEOs exhausted after 24 hour shifts have gotten into their cars 
and, and, and had crashes while driving home. Others have, res have resorted to sleeping in their cars until the next shift. As the pandemic continues to rage, nine have died and over 1,400 have been infected. Given the correction officers are a majority of people of color and women, I would be remiss if I did not mention the disturbing trends of sexual assault, harassment against female uh, corrections officers. Such a tremendous physical and psychological toll, whether it be from sleep deprivation, lack of nutrition, or threats of safety, will inevitably affect the availability of officers. Our civil service system is rooted in the promise of merit and fitness. We must ask, what effect are these terrible conditions having on the delivery of services, namely the abilities of the corrections officers to oversee the service of the incarcerated folks and a uh, seamless and humane way. When workers are forced to work double and triple shifts without consideration for workplace standards, seniority compensation, we undermine the workplace and break the promise of civil service. How does this impact the ability of corrections department to manage its workforce and provide services? Questions that must be asked. At today's hearing, the committee are eager to hear DOC's plan to remedy the crisis conditions in cities jails. Among them, things the committees want to he hear are greater detail about DOC's plan to address staffing crisis, as well as the time frame for which these changes uh, will be implemented and the resources that have been identified to move forward with this plan. Finally, I would like to thank my staff uh, for putting this together, as, as well as obviously um, the Committee on Criminal Justice staff. And uh, uh, I am thankful for the opportunity to co-host this afternoon. Once again, thank you to, to my chair. And uh, I, I will turn it over to my co-host and then back to the public after. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller. Thank you and your committee for being here as well today with so many labor issues that this, uh, these agencies are facing right now. We're gonna hear now and pull up our public advocate, Jamani Williams, to give an opening statement. Uh, thank you so much. As mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams. I'm a public advocate for the city of New York. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell's uh, and Miller, uh, both for holding this hearing and Chair Powell's for always highlighting the issues that have been going on here. And, and Chair Miller uh, for always highlighting the issues that have to do with labor. Two days ago, I was one of the elected officials, uh, some of whom you will hear from today to tour Rikers Island, and honestly, no words can describe uh, the inhumane conditions, the trauma and pain uh, that I saw. I visited there this past May. It was bad then. The precipitous drop-off to the humanitarian crisis that I saw uh, is simply stunning, especially for a city that prides itself on how it tries to do its best for New Yorkers, how that city can literally leave detained people along with vulnerable staff to fend for themselves in a environment that seems created to breed violent situations. These conditions are so bad that I thought there would be uh, an Attica style uprising. Uh, I'm surprised there hasn't been. Uh, and in fact, it seemed that one might happen while we were there. I don't think anybody there working or housed feels or is safe. And based on what I saw and what we saw, I can understand why people feel that way. We have people detained for the, some of the smallest of infractions. People are detained for very long periods uh, for something like a fist fight, something simple as technical parole violations. And made to sit across from garbage, rotten food, feces, urine, people using shared bags as toilets with limited access to water, showers, or meals. People on Rikers Island are not afforded recreational time to get fresh air, much less access to phones or transportation to take them to their court dates. Everybody on the island is on edge. There are people who have made weapons for self-defense or protection. One of those weapons fell out of someone's pockets while we were touring. That person had to be apprehended. Uh, we've seen people with swollen hands who reported that they had fractured arms, who did, denied medical attention, spoke to someone who was living with HIV, said that they were denied their medication for at least seven days. There were multiple people with mental health uh, issues that did not have their medication as well. 
We saw one trans prisoner who was moved from uh, the women's housing unit to the men's and was suffering tremendously. People were seen lying on the concrete. We heard stories of people going hours without food unless they begged for it. We were treating those with mental health conditions who probably shouldn't be there in the first place. We saw several people who were housed in showers. Some of the showers had the ability to lay down, some didn't. We saw two people who in those showers that could not sit or stand, I'm sorry, or lay down. I was told one was there for a few days. He was naked. Uh, I was not sure if it was urine or water that was dripping from him as he stared off into space. They were standing there alone. We failed correction officers as well, uh, who was mentioned have been working triple shifts. I have officers who have told me they have worked quadruple shifts and they are facing other conditions that have only eroded morale. Some officers, primarily women, complain about being sexually harassed, abused, and assaulted while on tours. Let's be clear, this is a human rights crisis. No one should be treated this way. The city has failed every single person who's detained and works on Rikers Island. And let's remember that most of the folks who are there have not even been found guilty of something. Even if they had, they shouldn't be treated this way. I will remind again that both communities on either side of those bars are primarily black and brown, the corrections officers and the people who are housed there. I will again say, if that were different on either side, I don't think we would have been here. With all that I described as someone who spent less than a day touring Rikers Island, why do you think anyone would willingly abide by all of the restrictions and all the issues that we saw that are in place? How long must people go without speaking to their families? I spent a few hours calling the people that I was able to get their numbers to let their loved ones know that they were at least physically for the moment okay. How long must people go without meals? How do they not have a demand uh, to, to demand this numerous times? How long must people feel that they are constantly susceptible to violence, sometimes with no recourse? Let us be clear, this administration warned for months that this would happen, and for years that this is where we were heading. This administration has known for months of the problems correction officers experienced and seemed to wait until we got here. This administration is responsible for deterring standards that I've described. And I hope when Dean Foulahan testifies, it is taking ownership, ownership of the problems that are here. I will say we all have to take some ownership uh, for not listening to the cries of both COBA and the people who are uh, advocating for folks who are housed there. But number one in that would be this mayor and this administration. The families of Laylene Le Polanco, Khalif Browder, Isaias Johnson, Brandon Rodriguez, and so many others have told us time and time again that the city failed their loved ones. And this continues to happen. Five people on Rikers Island have died by suicide over the last nine months. And astoundingly, from April to June of this year, the Department of Corrections recorded 539 incidents of incarcerated people hurting themselves, pushing the rate up to 95 such incidents every thousand detainees, the highest in the last five years. There have been multiple incidents of correction officers being hurt very badly. Further, poor staff management and old administration policies have only led to detriment of detained individuals to the detriment of detained individuals and corrections officers. The health and the wellness of incarcerated people cannot be fully actualized when there are missed appointments, little to no recreation time, and physical and sexual violence pervasive within these jails. Last week, my colleagues and I met with DOC Commissioner Shirali to discuss how all actors can play a part in rehumanizing everyone who lives and works on Rikers Island. The proposed improvements are needed and overdue, and they're a great midterm plan but we must do more right now while we work to close Rikers Island once and for all. Everyone, and I mean everyone, elected officials, district attorneys, judges, the mayor and the governor must act right now. It's time to be out, move beyond myths and blaming like bail reform is the cause of increasing crime. Judges must be trained and learn how to administer the new bail laws. Judges must schedule more cases on the daily court calendar and accept more rates of release. I know people are afraid of coming back to work. That includes some of the judges, but we cannot continue to protect them and have their concerns heard while the rest of the city suffers because of it. It is time judges to come back to work and start hearing these cases and calendaring them. The governor must sign the Less Is More Act and release everyone on technical parole immediately. 
We must ensure the supervised release of women and people who are on low level offenses and continue to shut Rikers once and for all. We can all work together and we absolutely must. I look forward to hearing all the steps DOC has in place to urgently approve the conditions of the island and what steps DOC has already taken to alleviate these conditions. DOC must also make good faith efforts to show staff that they are concerned about their security. The staff must return to work. I do understand that over a term, it is difficult to go to Rikers as many times as people may say you should. But to the mayor, over the past year, I have to say it is appalling that after all of the things that you have heard, after reports from a federal monitor, after reports of what we say we heard, there's still a refusal to visit Rikers Island. You must see for yourself what is happening. And I call on the governor to do the same. Until we can figure this out, we must remember that everyone on Rikers Island deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you, Chair Powers and Miller for this time. Thank you to public advocate for your words. And I agree with so much of what you just said, including I think a duty for all of us to be at Rikers Island to see those conditions and to witness it personally. I wanna just quote before we hear from testimony from the administration, I wanna just have our city council's committee uh, get up to do some of the protocols and swearing in of uh, folks here from the administration. Thank you. I'm Agatha Mavropoulos, counsel to the city council's committee on criminal justice. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. When it is your turn to testify, you will receive a prompt to unmute. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. We will first hear testimony from the first deputy mayor and the Department of Correction, followed by a period of question and answer from the committee members to the administration. We will then hear testimony from members of the Board of Correction, followed by a period of question and answer from committee members. After that, we will hear from the Bronx District Attorney, followed by a period of question and answer from the committee members. We will then hear from various elected officials, representatives from relevant unions and the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order. Committee members will be limited to two minutes, including responses. I will now administer the oath to all members of the administration. After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? First Deputy Mayor, Dean Fullahan. I do, yes. Commissioner Vincent Schiraldi. I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Stanley Richards. I do. Thank you. Chief of Department Kenneth Stukes. I do. Chief of Staff Dan Wax. I do. Deputy General Counsel Melissa Gilliam. I do. Thank you. Senior Vice President, Dr. Patsy Yang. Can you find out which council I was Yes, Patsy Yang, I do. Thank you. Um, Chief Operations Officer Carlos Castellanos. I do. Director Jeanette Merrill. I do. Director Marcos Soler. So there's three. I do. Yeah. Executive Director Meg Egan. Um, 
Not hearing from Meg Egan. Um, I, or I think she just left and she's on the next panel, so I think right she's in the panel at this one anyway. Okay. Oh, found her. Sorry, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I was not unmuted. I, yeah. Thank you. And board member, Dr. Uh, Robert Cohen. I do. Thank you. We will now proceed with testimony from the administration. First Deputy Mayor, you may begin when ready. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Chair Powers, Chair Miller, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and the Committee on Civil Service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify you before you today on the conditions of the jails. Uh, I am joined by the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections, Vinish Araldi, and members of this team, as well as members of the Correctional Office. I want to thank everyone at the Department of Corrections for the work they are doing. And I particularly want to thank every DOC employee who has worked so hard during this incredibly challenging time for the department. Particularly the officers have worked throughout the pandemic. We are all grateful for that service. The conditions are on Rikers, as we have heard, are unacceptable, and we are taking immediate action. We know we are facing a number of serious challenges. Some are historic, which this administration has addressed by reducing arrests and driving crime down. Then we were hit by the pandemic, which has created so many challenges, and we are working hard to address them. As the mayor said, we must recreate our progress and stay focused on the bigger goal. And we can do it. The city is working together and working with our partners in government to do that. And we can actually change the situation immediately as we need to do and for the bigger picture. We've been working hard to address many aspects of the situation, but there is no one solution that can help solve it. As you will hear from all of us today, we have steps to address both our immediate issues and the larger. Yesterday, the mayor announced a five-point emergency Rikers relief plan to provide immediate assistance to the jobs. To address immediate staffing shortages, we're using NYPD officers and providing staffing support in courts, allowing staff to be transferred back to Rikers. We're toughening accountability for absent without official leave, AWL employees, imposing 30-day suspensions for correction officers who do not show up to a post. We'll be using contracted medical providers to evaluate officers to make sure every single officer is on duty and should be. Through the mayor's executive order, we are expediting emergency repairs on Rikers Island to clean the facilities and make necessary repairs to ensure detainees and correction officers safe. Finally, we are opening two new clinic spaces at the recommendation of Correctional Health to ensure that all detainees are processed in under 24 hours. We will leave no stone on turn to support the department and the people in custody. On a parallel track, we are working and pushing the state. The first and most immediate step must be the signing of the Less Is More Act into law. We are encouraged by conversations with the governor and lieutenant governor and are hopeful and appreciate the willingness to be active partners in the process. We are working with the state to speed up transfer of the sentences to state custody. Additionally, there are over 1,500 people who have been at Rikers awaiting trial for over a year. And we need the entire criminal justice system to speed up these cases immediately. We are calling on judges also to use supervised release for nonviolent offenders instead of using pretrial detention in the city jails. New York City led the way in ending mass incarceration. We drove incarceration rates to the lowest level it had been since the 1940s while keeping crime at record levels. We have an immense challenge ahead, but we cannot lose sight of our first and foremost goal of getting off also getting off Rikers Island permanently and creating a correctional system that is fundamentally smaller, safer, and fairer. 
Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Schwalde and and then uh, happy to uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Powers and Miller, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Criminal Justice and Civil Service and Labor Committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on conditions of our jails. I'm pleased to be joined by members of my leadership team, Chief of Department Kenneth Stukes, Chief of Staff Dana Wax, and First Deputy Commissioner Stanley Richards. My first three months as commissioner, I've been impressed by the dedication of my staff, especially the officers who continue to come to work despite, despite the incredible challenges we're facing that many of you have outlined. Because so much has been said and will be said during the course of this hearing about officers AWOLing and calling in sick, I'd like to mention that during the depths of this pandemic, there were 403 officers who didn't miss a single day of work. There were also numerous officers who contracted COVID and when they were better, immediately returned to work. These officers are my heroes. I don't think anyone says that enough. They're right out there on the front lines, confronting some of our city's most dire social problems and caring for our most vulnerable citizens. And I can't say enough about how proud I am of the officers who come back day in and day out, despite some really grueling conditions. So I'm here today to tell you all what is happening in the jails and what we need to do to make it better. I'm also here to make a promise to my staff that I'm gonna do everything I can to make it safer for them to come to work every day and to go home to their family safe and sound. I'm proud of the plan we put together, working jointly with City Hall, but I'm absolutely not satisfied with conditions in our jails. And I'm not gonna be satisfied until we get the violence in our jails down and make our jails a better place to work and to be incarcerated. My standard of care is for our jails to be a place where I'd feel good about my son or daughter working there or feel that if my son or daughter were incarcerated there, they'd be happy and I could sleep easy. We're not there yet, but that's my goal and I think any other standard's unacceptable. The three primary issues facing the department right now are safety, adequate staffing, and population reduction. These three issues are, of course, intimately interconnected. First, I'll talk about staffing. Without enough staff available to work, it becomes increasingly difficult for the department to provide excellent services and maintain safety within our facilities. By the way, when we do provide robust services and programming for people who are incarcerated, everyone's life inside our jails, correctional officers, healthcare workers, civilian staff, volunteers, and of course, incarcerated people, will improve dramatically. I've seen that throughout my 41 year career in other jurisdictions and in reforms I've undertaken myself. The more people are productively occupied, the better facilities run and the better people do when they return home to their neighborhoods and their families. <clears throat> the situation in jails is worse than I imagined before I came on. Before the pandemic, the department had about four to 500 staff out sick on any given day. Now, out of approximately 8,400 staff, roughly 2,700, or 32%, so almost a third, are unable to work with incarcerated individuals because they're out sick, AWOL, or medically modified. That means officers have been forced to work triple shifts and that there are sometimes posts with no staff on them and makes it extremely difficult for us to provide basic services and maintain a level of safety that our offices, civilian workers, healthcare workers, and people in custody deserve. Despite all the challenges we're facing, I continue to be optimistic about our ability to turn things around. Our New Day DOC plan focuses on safety of staff, ending triple tours, improving morale, and keeping people in custody meaningfully occupied. We have to do all of these things together. You can't just do one, you have to do it all. And that's what we're going to do. We're engaged in what I consider a balanced and multifaceted approach to tackling these problems because that's what it's gonna to take to get the job done. There's no home runs, just a lot of singles will put runs on the board. Let me just touch on each of those and then I'm eager to get your questions. First, staffing. In terms of resolving our staffing issues, in addition to the previous 400 new staff City Hall committed to hiring before I started. We now plan on hiring an additional 200 
increasing our commitment to a total of 600 new correction officers to fill in the gaps in our ranks and contribute to the overall safety of our facilities. Our first new class of officers will join the Academy on October 1st, and we expect the first 75 to 125 of them to be available to work on January 1. On top of these new 600 officers, we're also making efforts to bring back DOC staff in good standing who have retired or resigned within the last four years. With rapid reinstatement, these officers can return to work after two weeks of refresher training. Out of 520, uh, I'm sorry, out of 425 former officers, we reached 58 indicated they were interested in coming back, additional 77 interested indicated that they may be interested and we're now providing incentives both to new recruits and to and folks looking to be reinstated so they don't have to pay up front fees and they don't have to pay for their uniforms which can be pretty costly further by partnering with mount sinai hospital and requiring officers who call in sick to see a doctor we have reduced by about two-thirds the number of officers who are calling in sick but we're also trying to make things easier for the staff who are putting in long hours by providing meals to staff on double and triple shifts and offering free rides home and back to work for those people who are working triple shifts. We've created space in our staff wellness center for staff to sleep after long hours. They choose to do so and refurbish the staff garden to provide a restful place for staff to relax. Just yesterday, we announced that officers who have not been AWOL or called in sick for more than five days since April, will receive a bonus for each triple they worked, and that bonus policy will extend through December. We've also ramped up and streamlined our disciplinary process for the most egregious cases of officers being AWOL or abusing our sick leave policy. As the mayor announced yesterday, people who don't come to work, don't call in and don't have a real reason for doing so, effectively AWOLing, are facing immediate 30-day suspensions. OATH is planning to set aside specified, specified days to hear uncontested AWOL cases so we can resolve them as quickly as possible. But I feel strongly that we will not be able to discipline our way out of this problem. Instead, we need to create belief in the department's mission of turning lives around, and that's when we'll get people eager to come back to work. Another facet of our New Day DOC plan that will help improve conditions in the jails is our focus on young adults and people who are mentally ill. The units containing young adults and our mental health, and our, sorry, our mental observation units have some of the highest rates of violence throughout our system. By the end of July, we met our goal of fixing half of the broken cell doors at RNDC, which is our young adult facility where most of the young adults are housed. When I started in June, the timeline to fix the remaining doors was two years, but with focus and pressure and help from City Hall, we now anticipate finishing, fixing those other 250 doors by February and still pushing to do so sooner. We're also working strategically to safely reorganize housing across the department in order to minimize conflict and reduce the presence of gang activity. It's been a big issue in our discussions with our labor unions. Yesterday, for example, we began the first in a six-week series of gang interventions with credible messengers from King of Kings and Exodus, with some of the key gang-affiliated youth in custody as part of our efforts to quell gang activity and increase the peace. Meanwhile, because we recognize that people must be held accountable when they commit serious acts of violence against staff or other incarcerated people, we're working closely with the Bronx District Attorney, who personally came and visited Rikers Island, and with whom we've been in frequent contact to prosecute individuals who commit serious acts of violence in our jails. However, we also understand that when conditions in our facilities improve, incarcerated individuals' morale improves, their behavior improves, and violence decreases. Primary focus of New Day DOC is increasing programming, and there are a few reasons for that. First, it's just the right thing to do. You should not deprive people of their liberty and force them to sit around idly, pure and simple, even if, even if it did nothing else. But second, most of the people who enter our custody are going right back to their communities. It's our duty to ensure that they're better off when they come out than when they came in. And then third, engaging people in programs gives them focus and hope 
for their futures, which makes them less anxious, less prone to violence, and eases tensions within the facility. And as I said earlier, that makes our staff and everyone else in our custody and everyone else who comes into our jails safer. In addition to bringing back to work and targeting the root causes of violence in the jails, we need to reduce the number of people in custody. We're actively working on population reduction efforts by identifying areas within our control that contribute to case processing delays. We're also working closely with the district attorney's office and the office of court administration to get court cases resolved and get people where they're going faster. We're also asking the court system to prioritize the 2% of individuals in our custody who are responsible for 38% of the violence we see. The average length of stay for those people is over 400 days and one of them on that list has been with us nearly five years. Case processing is vitally important because jails are not meant to be long-term facilities. People are supposed to be here a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but nobody's supposed to be here a couple of years. Prior to the pandemic, 700 people incarcerated in our jails were incarcerated for more than a year. Now that number is 1,500. These long stays can cause frustration, which can in turn lead to violence on behalf of those whose cases feel interminably unresolved. Moving those cases forward will be of great help as part of our efforts to quell violence and improve conditions. We're not trying to say it's all the courts. We're not trying to say it's all the DAs, all the defense attorneys. We know we have our part to do in this. But people have asked us, what can we do to help? And when they ask us, we give them an answer. Lastly, the city has been working with state government to pass less is more, a bill as, as Dean just reflected, a bill that will greatly reduce the number of people who violate state parole held in city custody on any given day. There are about a thousand people held on state parole violations, including 275 on purely technical violations in our custody. And reducing this number would immensely help ease the strain on everyone who works and lives in the jails. Reducing the jail population is particularly important given the increased COVID risk that we've seen across the country recently. Correctional Health Service Services has identified people at elevated clinical risk for serious course of illness should they contract the virus and provides documentation to their attorneys and other relevant stakeholders as appropriate to help prioritize who they divert in the face of the pandemic. Since March 13, 2020, CHS has provided advocacy letters to 3,000 767 patients incarcerated in our facilities. Of the patients provided letters, approximately 65% have been discharged. CHS conducts additional risk assessment to identify its most medically vulnerable patients, including those under the care of the geriatric and complex care services for enhanced advocacy. With your continued support and the support of my colleagues in the administration, all of these initiatives represent a balanced approach bringing folks back to work, making the lives of people in our custody better and more productive, and reducing violence in our jails. Finally, I'd like to address the recent tragedies we've experienced. Over the last 12 months, there have been 11 deaths in custody. Five of them have occurred since I've been on as commissioner. I never thought I'd be saying that to you. I never thought I'd be saying that to you. With everything that's going on, it's too easy to forget that human beings are at the core of what we're doing here. Every single life that's been lost on my watch is one that I'm going to carry with me. I want you all to know, and I want the families of people who died in our custody to know, that I take every incident, every death like this personally. We're in the, we in the department owe everybody in our custody and everyone who works in our facilities a measure of dignity, humanity, and safety, and losing someone is never acceptable. We recently spoke to a nationally recognized expert in suicide prevention and correctional facilities, and we learned that depression during the pandemic is pervasive across the country, everywhere, inside and out correctional facilities, but especially in correctional facilities. Got to remember, what happened during the pandemic wasn't just scary like it was for all the rest of us, but all sorts of things started happening like folks couldn't have visits, folks didn't have programming, folks didn't get religious services, Folks didn't get basic stuff like haircuts or recreation. So we understand we must do everything in our power to protect the mental and physical well-being of those in our custody. The department recently updated its suicide 
and self-harm prevention policies to better reflect industry standards and move staff with crucial information regarding suicide factors, the identification of people at risk, and procedures for intervention and responses to threats or acts by people of concern. Suicide prevention policy also carries four main tenets that each contribute to reducing these behaviors among incarcerated individuals. We want to change the perception regarding self-injury. All self-harm actions must be taken seriously. Officers are prohibited from discussing, from any discussion of quote unquote manipulative gestures. They're prohibited from having that conversation and they're required to document what they see in terms of self-injurious behavior. We cannot pretend we're cl clinicians. We are not. The requirement of one-to-one -one supervision for suicide watch has been clearly established. We have reinforced the guidance of officers on immediate steps to take if they observe an individual engaged in self-harm. In addition to relying on correction officers to help prevent suicides, we're also restarting the use of observation aids and housing units, which ceased during the pandemic and during the time when so many people committed suicide. These are people in custody who have been trained to identify warning signs and others' behavior and immediately report such behavior to housing unit officers. Underscoring all of these efforts is a robust training plan for staff, which we're ramping up as we bring staff back to work. Finally, the problems we're facing are due to neglect spanning several decades. And as I have said before, I can't fix these problems on my own. Me and my staff can't fix them on our own. No DOC commissioner can. But I strongly believe that the city of New York can fix this. I need the support of every elected official in the city to take whatever measures are necessary to help us fix these problems. The fact that the first deputy mayor is here today with us says a lot about the commitment the city's making to getting the job done. So despite everything, I'm optimistic we can still get there. The department remains committed to ensuring the safety of our staff and everyone incarcerated in our facilities. However, like a lot of you, I'm not satisfied where we are right now. We have much more to do, but we have a plan and with your help, our plan is gonna work. I'm asking you to keep supporting us in what we're doing and also to keep the spotlight on what's going on in our jails. And keep holding us accountable because that forces us to keep getting better. That's you doing your job to make me better at doing my job, and I appreciate all of it. My colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the testimony uh, to both the first deputy mayor and Commissioner Shiraldi. I, I want to ask, and this is for the first deputy mayor, and I appreciate you being here today, and I know you've been deeply involved in these issues, but I want to ask a basic question. It's just a yes or no question. Right now, today, in your view, can the city and DOC manage the jail safely? Uh, can somebody unmute the first deputy mayor, please? Sorry, can you hear me? We can now, yes. Okay, I apologize. Um, the, yes, we can manage this. Everything the commissioner just outlined, which are the acknowledgement of the problems and the serious problems. The actions were, we've taken, the actions we're taking, the mayor, the powers the mayor gave us yesterday, the actions we're taking today with everyone's help, both addressing staffing, the multiple factors, staffing, programming, the life we're providing for our staff and our inmates, making sure no harm comes to anyone and moving forward with these kinds of things. And in particular, recognizing that we also need to reduce the population, which we never expected to be at this level at this point in time. Yes, we can do that. Not easy, but we actually can do it. Taking immediate steps and the steps that, that the commissioner outlined. I do believe that. I have the same hope he does. We talk constantly and we, we are open to all solutions to move forward. And we do believe that what has been outlined, particularly in that five point plan, plus the issues, plus the, the many actions that the commissioner outlined, which often don't get uh, talked about, that will get us there. Okay. 10 people have died in custody in the last eight months. Assaults are up, use of force is up. Uh, 
that is where why we're here today. We are, I think, in a crisis. You have staff working 24-hour shifts and more. What is the point in time where you that answer is no for you? It, it's now. Like I, I, the commissioner acknowledged it. I acknowledged it. The mayor acknowledged it yesterday. It's now. We're we're not. There's not a minute that need, that that goes by here. We all these things need to happen dramatically and now. This is not normally how we would talk about discipline and staff. That's a very different approach. But but we know that we have we have correction officers and other employees of the Department of Corrections who come to work every single day who are who are actually taking the responsibility to do even more. We acknowledge them. They it, it, it's quite amazing the effort they're putting. Their colleagues need to provide that same backup, that same support. We can address that. With less is more can be signed today. It literally, I mean, the commissioner's point of a thousand people, it 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 will have a huge effect on on the population at Rikers, and then what we and then what we're doing. And look, the court, the entire criminal justice system, opening up. The, I'm pleased the commissioner said it. This is not a prison. That's not what it's supposed to be. We are not supposed to have people in our jails for well over a year, and that's exactly what's happening. Okay. Um, as you know, the uh, chief medical officer last week in a letter called on the city council to and called on others to request state and federal assistance, given what he called the collapse in basic jail operations. Given the situation at Rikers, do you believe the city should request city or federal assistance with the issues that we've outlined? I, I, no, I, we we actually do believe, and that's what the mayor outlined yesterday. That we and we we appreciate at all, and the the head of correctional health is here. We we appreciate everything correctional health warns us to do. It is part of the reason that we are now immediately opening two new clinics, and we're expanding to take mm -hmm. on in, intake. We understand that it's the reason we're asking NYPD to help out in the court system, so correction officers can go back to the correction facilities. We have, using all city agents, we can we can address this problem. We do need the help of every other city agency and we're getting it and we now have the emergency powers, the commissioner has the emergency powers to make sure that anything he needs gets done. What, what are the circumstances? I, I, we, had a, we had a meeting last week, I met with uh, folks from your office, all the agencies, and my question repeatedly, the commissioner will tell you is, what are the circumstances by which, uh, if this plan doesn't work, you would ask for outside intervention? Or what if this plan doesn't work? What is this is plan B or the emergency plan? What is the plan after that? And so I think it's important we know, council, public, stakeholders, you have unions here, staff here. What are the circumstances by which you would say the city or the federal government should intervene if this plan doesn't work? And what is the time? What is the timeline for something like that? And, what is the criteria circumstances for you? So I, I apologize. We are asking them to intervene. I, I, it can't be lost here. We're asking them to intervene and sign less is more. We're asking them to intervene on people who are in our jails on technical parole. Breach. I'm talking about staffing, specifically around staffing. But but, but it, it and with all due respect, it it's a it's every single one of these things needs to happen. And we're saying we can, we, it's not one thing. It actually is every single one of these. And it has to happen immediately. Simply, simply bringing in other people who, who aren't trained. We know, and we've seen abuses in other correctional facilities around the country. That's not, that can't be our goal. Our goal is exactly what the commissioner, what the commissioner stated. I, and I don't, I, I do want to just turn to the commissioner and make sure if you have something to add to that. Yeah, I think this is us asking for outside help. It's not that we're not saying we want outside help. Uh, we're asking for the state's help. We're asking for district attorneys to help. We're asking for the courts to help. NYPD is helping. We're going to get the ability to accelerate contracting so that we can get you know, private help to clean the place up and you know, engage in more programming. So we're asking for lots of help. Sometimes things that just seem simple, like Dr. McDonald's recommendation, aren't quite as simple. You can't just bring bodies in 
to be correctional officers, you have to train them. And we're doing that. Two weeks from now, there will be people getting trained to be correctional officers, but we couldn't just bring other people in to do that. So we're asking for help in a whole variety of different ways. The mayor is pressing us heavily to make everything we're doing happen more quickly. And trust me, we are listening to the mayor and doing that, and all your pressure is adding to that. Okay. Um, I want to pick up on, uh, speaking of the mayor, I want to pick up on a question that was uh, raised by the public advocate earlier, or maybe a comment that was made. And I'll just mention, we have a number of folks here from the state who are going to be testifying later who are out there this week. We certainly have people who are working there every single day. I'll be out there soon with uh, colleagues as well. Um, this isn't a political gotcha question. It's a really, actually, a real question. When is the last time the mayor has visited Rikers Island? I'll get you the exact date. The mayor has been to Rikers Island many times. Um, and I'll get you this, the specific date. The mayor did say that, it, look, let, let's start here. He is, he is talking to the commissioner constantly. I am talking to the commissioner constantly. We, we are, understand the issue. The mayor recognized that, that there was, he, he declared an emergency. He recognized that and said he's taking emergency power, something we have done in many times now over the past year and a half in the pandemic. He's recognizing that responsibility. He said he will be visiting, but he also said what I have right now in talking to the commissioner, talking to the police department, talking to other city agencies, and finding out what other health expertise we can bring into, into Rikers, those things we need to do right now. That's okay. I understand that. Has he been here this term in his second term? I, I, honestly, I'm going to, well, I'll get you an exact answer if he's been there this second. Well, I, I guess my question is, don't you? He has, not, he has not been there. His, he has not been there in the past year. I do believe. Okay. That. I think it is, uh, this is the moment for folks to be, I mean, I, I think you understand my question. I think that understanding the urgency of the moment does maybe include being there on the ground, <sighs> walking through those things, seeing what staff is going through, seeing what the conditions are in the units, seeing what people are going through. It, the basic sort of seeing it can be extremely helpful to having anybody understand it. I'm not trying to score cheap political points, making that point. I'm making a, a factual point, which is I think folks going there, going to intake, which we know is a problem right now, seeing the problems around staffing, seeing potentially unhoused units, unstaffed units, I think is part of that equation. And I, I do think it's important that uh, uh, he does go there uh, and, and see it, see it himself. I'm, but I, I, I just want to, I do want to respond. You know, the commissioner moved his offices onto Rikers Island. It's a major piece. He does tours every other day. He reports constantly. He spent hours last night talking about this with the mayor. The mayor is hearing this firsthand. He's not hearing firsthand. He's not just reading about it. He is hearing directly from somebody we have an immense amount of confidence in, which is the commissioner and the team that they that the commissioner put together. So the mayor's hearing that absolutely con constantly, and he did say he will be visiting. But right now, the issue is immediate, dramatic action of all aspects of the city government working together to make sure that we address these issues. Okay, I won't harp on that point, but I think you understand what the point I am making is. Um, the, I want to talk about, we talked a lot about there's kind of sort of crises uh, converging on each other. You have a, uh, the, the staffing issues that you are trying to resolve at the same time the population has gone up. Uh, both the commissioner and, and yourself in the testimony have talked about the Less Is More Act, talked about other measures to help lower the population, to help make it, obviously that helps with the staffing issues and helps with COVID and a number of issues. But I, there's one that's directly in your power. Those are 6A releases. You had the commissioner during the first wave of the pandemic, was a prior commissioner, exercised the power conferred by correction law, 6A, to grant work release to people serving jail sentences. That was a meaningful reduction in the jail population to address the COVID crisis and the public health crisis that was being faced at that moment. And considering the current conditions that we're talking about right now, why hasn't, and maybe Commissioner Schwal, do you want to start, why hasn't the department acted to grant work releases to people who are serving jail sentences? That so, is. I'll start, I'll okay. start. And, and let's remember that when that happened, what you're referring to is also pre-trial release. And there were a significant yes. number at the, height of the, at the height of the pandemic. What we are saying, and I don't wanna lose track of this, is, is that there are significant ways to reduce 
the Rikers population. It's not, it's not success. It is actually talking about less is more and it's getting the court system to function. Those are the places we want to focus on. And that's the effort we want. To, that's where we need to put our efforts. Those are immediate. Those can happen. The process you talked about actually took a long time. It took weeks and weeks of review involving NYPD and others. What we are saying is we know things that can happen immediately and they need to happen. How many people are in on, how many people would be um, uh, released based on less is more being signed in our city jail population? Why don't I, why don't I, we have our director of the mayor's office of criminal justice who sure. will do this more accurately than, than I will. So if you don't sure. mind, uh, Marcus, yeah, no would problem. you mind addressing that please? Hopefully we have him. Yeah, he's here. We'll go and meet him. Can somebody please uh, unmute? Make sure it's still there. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, no, 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 sorry. We're, we're waiting for the mock gig. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I have a few more questions. Um, I, I, I mm -hmm. believe I'm on mute now. Sorry, yeah, they were not letting me unmute. Sorry. Can you repeat your question? Sorry, Grace. Uh, the the question, I'll just answer two questions at the same time. How many folks are in custody today for uh, that would be uh, a release under the Less Is More Act being signed? And then my second question, the follow-up to that is, how many are uh, in our city sentence right now in your custody? In total, we have, yeah. uh, our estimates are about 400 people that will be released on a on the less is more. So right mm -hmm. now there are a thousand a thousand people in total with parole violations of different kinds. And of those we estimate four hundred will be impacted directly by the decision. So right now we have a allow around two hundred and twenty four city sentences. Of those a, a much smaller number would be a will be available for a six days release. Uh, our numbers would be about 65 to 70. 65 to 70. Okay. So what has the city done at all with this 65 individuals? I, I, my understanding was the numbers are higher than that, but let's just say it is 65, the modest number. And as you're making it line, but that, but nevertheless, whether it's a small or large is not really the thing. It's the question is whether the city is actually taking any measures to look at those individuals. So what, so why don't you guys, why don't you folks tell us what, has occurred when it comes to those 124 or, or 65 individuals with any consideration of uh, doing a 6A work release? I, I, honestly, the focus, the complete focus we've been is is what would what would significantly reduce those numbers, and that's what we outlined. I, I I understand what you're saying, and obviously we can continue. To have that conversation, but we actually think there are, there are significant population reductions that can happen, right now. and that's the effort we want to. Have. We need dramatic action, and that's what we're asking. We need the court. We need the entire criminal justice system to be functioning. We need less is more. I understand that, but do you understand how it how it looks? I, I would hope you would understand how it looks to say we need to do everything we can and then be asking the state to do something and be asking the DAs to be doing something and be asking the judges to do something. And the thing that's directly in the power of the commissioner of the Department of Corrections is not being used, is not being done. I mean, for any elected official sitting here, the rhetoric sounds good, but the action isn't actually happening when it comes to looking at something that's directly within the DOC and the mayor's control. Those things seem to be in conflict with each other. So again, the mayor took emergency action yesterday. We are we are doing everything. We'll take back any any potential option that we have not that we are not that you believe we have not thoughtfully looked at. It is a partnership. I totally recognize that. At 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 the same time, we need your help on what we do recognize as much bigger numbers that actually would reduce significant pressure of need. We, I, look, I'm, supp I'm supportive of it. I have asked the governor as well to sign the Less Is More Act and uh, had done a control. I think some of the staffing you are doing are all right. It just, we face another moment where there are uh, options here available and it seems like we're not 
uh, using all of them. But I, I will move on. I see lots of my colleagues with their hands up. Um, I want to talk quickly. Okay, the, the announcement on the NYPD yesterday to use NYPD officers to staff the courts to then free up, as I understand, to free up DOC staff to come and work with us. How many staff are we talking about that that will make available? How many NYPD staff will be going into the courts to replace DOC staff? So we're working on that right as we speak. I know uh, the NYPD at the uh, at Department of Corrections are, are viewing the courts, I believe, as we're speaking right now, but I'll hand it over to the commission. Yeah, that's exactly right. I don't know if it's exactly as we're speaking, but the chief of department, Chief Stukes, will be touring uh, with uh, high-ranking NYPD officials to sort of kick the tires on what's going on in our court so they can better assess how many staff we need and how many they can provide. And as soon as we have those numbers, we'll get them to you. But I mean, how many DOC staff are, in, are working in the courts today? Different court uh, parts have different numbers. It ranges from about 160 to the smaller courts to uh, nearly 300 for the larger courts. Of we'll your all, of your staff that are working there? DOC staff at all levels. From and you will be replacing all of them with NYPD staff? No. no we'll, be, we'll be getting a number back from NYPD as to what they can do and what makes sense. I'm not okay. saying we're replacing all of them. Okay, staying on the staffing issue, there have been numerous reports of units with this, within facilities that are understaffed and in some cases completely unstaffed. How many units across all facilities today are unstaffed and how many are understaffed? Too many of both. We will get you the number. Are there units that are unstaffed today? Yes. Do you have an understanding what that number is? No, I'll get it to you. Okay. It's a different which number every day. Depending on which, are the, which facilities are the most understaffed currently? I got to get you all those numbers. But it's, it's the, it changes every day depending on how many people AWOL, how many people call in sick. Okay. How, is the department tracking the number of officers who are working double and triple shifts? Yes. Can you share us with that every number? Day. Again, we'll, we'll get them to you, but it's too many. Shouldn't be anybody. Should when do we? Yeah, when do you, it, it shouldn't be any, and uh, we understand the staffing I I issues. But obviously, when do we expect to end a triple shifts in jails? Um, before I answer that question, uh, I wonder if my chief of staff, Dana Wax, has a better answer on the data part of it. And then um, while she's looking yeah. that up, whoop, sorry. Um, good afternoon, or sorry, good morning, Chair Powers. What I can tell you, and the commissioner is absolutely right. Hey, Dana, hey, Dan, it's very hard to hear. You might want to pull that little device okay. a little closer to yourself. Is this better? Yes. I get Great. It. Um, okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Powers. Um, the commissioner is absolutely right. We do track this on a daily basis. Um, but per the commissioner's point, we get information about the previous day. Uh, each new day. So I'm going to give you yesterday's information. Um, and of course, I will follow up with you after today's hearing so that you have today's information as well. Um, yesterday, um, there were approximately 40, 50, 70 posts, 70 housing units that did not have a B officer in them. And I want to be clear on what that means. There, is two, there are two officers in every housing unit. The A officer is uh, the officer who sits, if you've ever been to our jails, uh, behind the plexiglass. Um, the B officer is literally on the floor. When we say that a housing unit is unmanned, that means there's no B officer. So there's always an A officer, uh, making sure they have eyes on the people in the unit. But there were 70 posts that at one time yesterday did not have the B officer. We rapidly moved uh, work to identify and relieve uh, officers of triples, but prioritize first getting someone in that unmanned post. Okay, 70. Okay, and you can share us the other data too. Wow. Um, okay, I, I have a lot of questions. Um, I do want to just move it over to Chair Miller and then my colleagues because I know. A lot of them are here uh, waiting patiently, and a lot have called me uh, in the last few weeks and visited to talk about it. So I want to go to them. I, I will just say, I, I did, we, we are, we're here for urgency. 
I do think the mayor should go out and visit Rikers Island. I think he should walk inside the facilities. And I think in addition to emergency plan, I'm not, again, I'm, I, I really want to thank everyone for their uh, the putting out a plan. And I know that Commissioner Shrawley and his team are working quite hard for Deputy Mayor's office. And of course, all the staff that are there working triples and stuff. But to see it is to understand it better. Uh, the 60A releases seems like low hanging opportunity to help one of your goals here in addition to everything else. I, I may come back with more questions, um, but I do want to be uh, respectful to a lot of folks' time who have different questions and concerns. So I'm going to head over to Chair Miller, and then I see we have a lot of folks here with their hands up, and then I'll come back after that to follow my questions. Good morning again. Thank you so much, Chair Powers. Uh and to everyone that's in. So I, I want to focus a little bit about some of the uh, new policies that are being instituted or were, were uh, announced, not sure if they're being instituted, and, and which is part of the question, line of question as well. Um, and how much of, uh, um, so uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Chivaldi and, and First Deputy Mayor, uh, how much of, of the new policy has been instituted if, and, and, and what uh, portion, if any of it was, was subject to collective bargaining and, and what role did your uh, labor partners uh, play in these new policies? Um, specifically, um, let's, you know, they say that, that the best ability is availability. Can we talk about availability? Um, and and what we're seeing now, we, we, so obviously we have now the advent of double and, and triple tours, um, but quite frankly, this is not really a new phenomenon, right? This is something that has gone on for a number of years now. And so while we, a, a lot, we're talking about uh, conditions of, of, of those who are, incar uh, th those, um, who are incarcerated um, conditions, of uh, the correction officers and, and, and the rest of the staff there, but could we talk a little bit about uh, the management of the staff and, and availability? I know that, the, the, uh, Commissioner, you, you just came in and there was a turnover, but uh, you inherited a workforce that, that, quite frankly, was in disarray. What, what did the availability look like over the past year or two? Uh, what, what is your... Uh, I'm trying to get to preparedness, the attrition over the past two years, um, retirement, resignations, terminations, and, and how did we get to the point that we are today so woefully uh, unprepared to staff Rikers Island? Let me start, and then I'm going to hand it over to the to commissioner. The council member, there were many questions in there. The, we have both, I have and, and I know our Office of Labor Relations, our Commissioner of Labor Relations, and Commissioner Chiwaldi have regular conversations with the unions about how we address these issues. Doesn't mean we agree all the time, but we've had conversations, some things we agree on. The measures that we took yesterday are not collective. We are taking measures on an emergency basis that we believe need to happen. Need to happen, as you know, we do have a collective bargaining agreement with uh, with the unions in our correction facilities. We negotiated pay increases. Uh, we obviously care about them. We care about every single one of our employees, and we want to keep them safe. But we do believe that we have enough correction officers to address the immediate what is immediately confronting us, and we needed to take extraordinary actions to make sure that happens. I'll turn it over to the commission. Uh, so a uh, couple of ways of uh, responding to that question, and uh, thank you, Chair Miller, for it, and also for the time you allowed me to have with the caucus. Um, that was, I thought, very productive. Um, if you go back to the, when the mayor first started, January 4, uh, 2014, we had 11,000 people incarcerated and 9,000 uh, uniformed staff, correctional officers at all levels. Today, we have 6,000 people incarcerated and 8,400 uniformed staff. So it's been about a 46% decline in the number of incarcerated people since the mayor took office 
and a 7% decline in correctional officers. So it's, we now have more COs on the books than incarcerated people before it was the opposite. And so uh, that meant to us, I can't just keep coming back to the mayor, I can't keep coming just back to uh, council and asking for more and more and more staff. I had to do a, a combined multifaceted effort. Part would be get people to come back to work and part would be bringing on new staff and training them. So I did all of those things. I tried to do all of those things at once. Now, if you go back to February of 2020, what was happening at the time was that advocates were uh, getting more and more uh, uh, reductions in solitary confinement and secure housing. The lawsuit, the Nunez lawsuit, was requiring us to ratchet up discipline for correctional officers. So the way this was perceived by our correctional officers and the unions have brought this to my attention, but also if you just walk around in here, people will just tell you this, is that we were punishing staff more and incarcerated people less. And that did not feel good to people. So there was a lot of frustration around that and some uh, lowered morale. Then of course, in March, the pandemic hit. And a lot of people did authentically get sick. Some people tragically died and people started calling in sick, some of whom indeed were sick. And then it started spiraling from that point on. Uh, more people called in sick. The staffing complement got thinner. People had to work triples. Violence rose. Programs were cut. The more violence rose and the scarier it got, the more staff called in sick. Some of them were absolutely sick and they should call in sick and they should stay home till they feel better. Some of them I don't think were. We have six times the sick rate of NYPD. I don't think we're six times sicker than NYPD. We may be sicker, I just don't think we're six times sicker. We had almost three times as many people out. Commissioner, could, could, I'm, I'm sorry. There's a lot, and, and there's a lot of questions that I want to ask, um, and, 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 and very specifically uh, uh, about sick and, and AWOL. I kind of want to drill down on what constitutes that because obviously you know uh, you guys have a very specific uh unlimited uh, sit and 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 that I'm, I'm told has been changed of recent as well um to address the, the uh staffing needs um but again um and then and then able I'm, I'm kind of just trying to I, w I want to get to where how we got to where we are, but also some of the work conditions, because what I'm seeing now for for, you know, uh, health and safety is the basic ten tenets of organized labor. Um, and there appears to be an absolute disregard for that. Double and triple chores is the absolute canary in the coal mine. Right. And and what impact has this not only had on delivery of services, but, and you know, it is, is, is mental and physical fatigue, does that constitute sick? If someone works a triple tour and falls asleep in their car or, or doesn't wake up uh, and call in or out within the prescribed time of their tour, is that an AWOL? Um, and in fact, the, the, you know, have, have have the Department of Corrections actually studied the health and safety impacts and consequences of uh, officers and other employees uh, working under these conditions? Because you, we're comparing them to, you know, apples to oranges, the police and 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 other municipal employees. Like who's working 24 hours a day? And, and if in fact that is the case, what are the conditions? I had had the pleasure of being a civil servant for more than 30 years. I've had the, the honor of representing uh, working men and women. And, and um, availability and safety that goes into that is, is, is a big part of it, right? I, I represented the New York City Transit, and and you know if if someone gets into an accident, the first thing they check to see if he was working a double tour, because that's a liability on the authority. 
um, you know, are people able to deliver the same level of services in our one, two, three, four, and five, as in hours 14, 15, and 24? And if not, um, should the accountability be the same? Have we taken these things into consideration in, in doing so? That, that, that's just, you know, because everything seems to be so cut and dry that someone just didn't show up. But if someone came more, th those are really, really special circumstances. Not having um, a meal, not being relieved for 24 hours, you know. Do we take those into consideration? Um, because we're, we're, we're blatantly saying that someone is absent without leave. Uh, absent without leave is probably you can call them within an hour of your tour. Well, I overslept because I was out for 20, I was up for 24 hours for the second time this week. I, I, how does that work? Deputy Mayor, you want me to take this one or first Deputy Mayor? Yes, please. I, I'm sorry, is, is there a safety officer and a safety committee within the agency? Chief Stooks, do you want to handle that question? Can you hear us? Yes. Yes, uh, good morning all. Uh, there is a uh, Bureau Chief of Security at, uh, oversees the department who is responsible in connection with the executive leadership for the security and operations of all facilities. I, I didn't quite hear that. Was that a yes or a no? That, that there is a safety officer? Yes. And, and that is, who would that be? That would be our Bureau Chief of Security. Okay, and is there a safety committee? Uh, we don't have a safety committee. That, that's unusual. I've not heard of a city agency that did not have one that did not include labor and management that has regular meetings to discuss health and safety of the agency. Um, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Um, so I, I do want to say that uh, the leadership of this agency meets regularly with um, the union representatives. Um, I know Commissioner Shirley actually went all the way to New Jersey to go to a uh, union um, summit uh, the other week. Um, so I, 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 I'm not with, sure. With, with all due respect, the question, with all due respect, the question is simply health and specifically health and safety. Understood. I, I don't know that we have a formal health and safety committee, but we are in constant. Because I think what we're talking about is, is really health and safety here and in and, and order to get to some of those underlying problems. How do we get to this point? If we had a standard health and safety commission or, or committee, I, I think that we would some of these problems would have been addressed and potentially resolved and never gotten this far. Again, it, this is, we're talking about some management issues, availability. How do you get to the point that all of a sudden you're down so many people that we have people working 16 and 24 hours daily? So that people of, yeah. Uh, we, 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 let's start at the beginning. We agree. We have self health and safety issues. We have correction officers who should not be working triples should not be working, except for occasionally, doubles. We understand that that is not appropriate. We clearly have tried with the union, doesn't actually, but we have a crisis today. We have an emergency today that we have to deal with. That's what the mayor gave the commissioner the power to do. Doesn't mean that we're not open to constant dialogue, to constant conversations. If we need a different structure, I'm quite sure the commissioner. With all due respect, first of all, how do we how do we safely, effectively, and efficiently deliver services when people are working 24 hours a day? But but, but with all due respect, that we have. Do you believe that that's possible? 
I know what I do believe is possible is that we have men and women showing up every single day, actually doing it, actually dedicated to do that. They need their colleagues to join them. It is, it is the commissioner said, it is not, it, it just does not make sense that unlike the other uniform agencies that we have this rate of both AWOL and sick, anybody who's legitimately sick, of course, but we need these colleagues who've been trained to come and help the people who are showing up every single day. Commissioner, you have anything to add? And Councilman? Yep, good. Uh, Councilman, I just wanna add, we do have a wellness center that provides care and response and support to officers. We have staff who are dispatched to facilities to check on officers who are doing doubles and doing triples. We have a wellness center for staff to, to participate that has social workers and psychologists to help staff work through crisis, both crisis on the job and crisis in their life. So we do have a wellness program set up for officers and we have dispatched wellness staff to each facility to check on officers who are doing doubles and triples in addition to distributing food and some of the other items that Commissioner Shirodi spoke about. Okay, and, 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 that, and that information is readily available and aggregated to, to help us as we move along. Okay. Yes. Um, again, when, when, when there's been a lot of talk about uh, uh, absent without leave. Um, and, and, and doing so, so sick, do you assess and, and, and commissioner and, and for those who are responsible for dispensing and uh, oversight of discipline, um, do, do you have sick patterns, um, and, 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 and the, that you look at in terms of discipline when it comes to, uh, uh, sick abuse? Yeah, some disturbing patterns that seems to go up during the summer and on holiday weekends and on weekends overall. We have our biggest problems with people calling in sick and AWOLing on the weekends, which suggests to me that they are using it as an unlimited vacation pool rather than Correct. some of them. Some of them are sick, but some of them are not. It, it, oh, and also before, after RDOs, which I'm in your case is rare, regular days off before yes. and after regular days off? No, they, they actually, it's not, uh, regular days off are not rare. They have regular days off. No, and, no, and yes. before, calling in sick before or after regular days off. In other words, extending. Uh, also, council member, one thing that happens frequently is people are in facilities, but also we have posts all around the city that are preferred posts and all around Rikers Island that aren't in living units with right. incarcerated people. Right. And they will sometimes go and ask those people after they're done with their single shift to come and relieve their colleagues in uniform uh, so that they don't go into triples. And even though they've worked and are were completely healthy all day, at that moment, they will say that they are sick. And because we're not doctors, we can't. But uh, so are, are, you, are, are, you, are you mandating these folks to leave one assignment and come to Rikers Island and work a, a second assignment? Yes, which we're allowed to do. Okay, so you're not asking, you, 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 you're mandating and then they are then saying that they're sick, they can't do it. Right. And we are, we're not just attacking this with discipline. We're giving bonuses for people who work triples. We're also giving bonuses for this exact situation. So people will go well, one that's a good question be, be, because I've, I've heard stories that for me is paramount to wage theft, that people have worked doubles and triples and they have not been appropriately compensated as months out and they have yet to see um, that premium pay associated with that. When you say a bonus, because you're already paying time and a half, right? So what does that bonus look like? Yeah, so it's gonna be, we're, you know, we're still, we have a plan, we're still resolving the exact details. We didn't announce all the details because we had a meeting set up with our three union presidents tomorrow. So we wanna negotiate them but it'll be some compensation for working four hours into a triple because every triple is not 24 hours. So four hours into a triple or more than four hours into a triple, that'll be the compensation for bonuses for triples and then a different bonus for
for people who what we call fly. They go from one post to another to relieve their colleagues. And, and, and how accurate is your, your pay system? So is it is it accurate that, that there are occasions on occasion that folks are working doubles and triples? I'll, I'll jump and, in. Sorry, I, and working through their meal and not being compensated for months. It, I'll jump in. Every time we have heard this, we have acted through our Office of Labor Relations has actually taken this over and gone through every single case. And we don't believe that's the case. Any anytime that happens, and I'll speak on behalf of the commissioner and our OLR commissioner who's not here, we will address it immediately. Any name of anybody who that happens to, we will take care of meeting. Of course, we're going to pay. We understand what so, the with, with all due respect, the first deputy mayor, this is this is this is this is a low, all politics and local. This is really local. Are people getting paid after they work? We believe they are, and we believe in a timely are. fashion. Yes, we believe. My answer is yes. If you okay. know of any case where that's not happening, we will address it. Okay, I, I have seen grievances. I, I, without again, effect. Again, we have gone through these. If we have missed anything, we will make sure that happens. Okay. Okay. I, I want to go back though. Your questions are all appropriate and they're right to ask. And the commissioner and I talk about this every single day. We do care about those people who are showing up every day and that we're asking an extra burden. We are asking everyone to participate in this because we know we have enough staff to address this problem. If we can address the staff problem, if we can reduce the population, with the other measures in the in the emergency actions that the mayor gave the commissioner yesterday, we can actually achieve this immediately. We share your concern. We share your concern about every single one of our workers. So we uh, hate uh, these uh, triples. Uh, in studying that, how, how many people have been AWOL or sick after working a triple? If you document that. Most I don't have that data. Animals. I don't have that data, but I will get it to you. But we hate these triples, and that's why we developed the plan we have to extinguish them. I've looked these folks in the eyes when they're on triples, and it's 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 heartbreaking. And they're hardworking folks. I hate them, and that's why we're trying to do all these different things. Not one thing, but a whole bunch of different things. I know sometimes it feels like we're just picking on staff. We are not just picking on staff. We're trying to help them out. We're trying to compensate them properly for when they do this, but we're also trying to extinguish these triples because I hate them. And finally, what, what, what was your last exam, schedule exam, prior to the one that's coming up? I think it was two and a half years ago. I think, that was, I, la I think our last academy was two and a half years ago. Does anybody, Chief Stukes, do you have a answer to that question? Three years ago. Was there anything scheduled in between? We'll, we'll get you the exact date. It, it certainly has been a while, I do, but I don't have the exact We'll get it. Okay, and, and, and I know there's a lot of people waiting. I, I just, for me, this is not a new phenomenon. Friends, family, constituents, and neighbors um, have been complaining about working doubles and triples for years now. And so I, I, I would like to see an emphasis on, on management and how they manage their workforce, deploy their workforce, and, and, and create a be better uh, uh, environment for, uh, for availability. So, so with let, that, let me, yeah. Let me respond on behalf of the commissioner and, and me, and certainly the mayor and all of us. Any, any ideas? We're, we, we are open to any ideas to address this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powers. Thank you. Uh, throw it back to you. All right, thank you. And on one question before I hand it over to other folks. Can you, uh, maybe Commissioner Sheraldi or staff, give us the exact staffing? Like, do you have the data from yesterday or recent data? I know you've given me data recently. Can you give us those numbers on and, staffing? Uh, and what specifically are you asking, uh, Councilmember Powers? Uh, you, you've talked about the staffing shortage and absenteeism. Can you give us those numbers? Yeah, Dana, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, we'll get you those numbers, definitely. 
You, I, I think the question is, will we provide the chair those numbers? And after, hey, after I'm asking hearing, to I'm provide, we're, we're in a public hearing. I'm asking to provide the most recent yes. data on absenteeism. Dana, you've got sure. the data. Yes, in front of you. Sure, sure, Chair Power. So um, of the 8,000, this is yesterday's data, um, of the 8,370 uniform members of service, 1,789 of them were out sick yesterday. 112 of those were newly out sick, meaning it was their first day out. Uh, 727 staff were MMR3 status, meaning that they are fit to come to work um, and do a post, but that post cannot involve the care or custody of a person, of an incarcerated person. Uh, 70, or sorry, 68. Uh, and you're green, huh? 68 staff members uh, were out for a personal emergency. 93 were out on AWOL, meaning they did not let us know they were not coming in that day. 27 were out for an FMLA related reason. Okay, thank you. We'll hand it over to members now. Thank you. Thank you. I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you've not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to two minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. Again, this is only for council members. Only council members can be raising their hand at this point. First, we'll hear from Council Member Lander, followed by Council Member Rivera, and then Council Member Holden. Council Member Lander, you may begin when ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair, for both chairs for convening this urgent, urgent hearing. And thank you to the Deputy Mayor and the Commissioner for being here. I was out there on Monday with the public advocate and with our state legislators, and it was just truly harrowing. I went to RNDC and GRVC. I was not even at OBCC, where intake is, where things are uh, uh, really the worst. But I saw in the intake unit at RNDC, like three or four people sleeping on the floor of one cell. I talked to people who hadn't gotten food into the afternoon. I talked to people whose units weren't being cleaned and they couldn't even get cleaning supplies. I talked to doctors and mental health providers who are not seeing 90% of the people on their list every day. They've got a list of 50 people they're supposed to see, but because there's no one to bring them from their unit to the clinic, they're only seeing 10% of their patients. So of course, more people are going to decompensate. Um, it, 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 Deputy Mayor, well, there's really two levels of emergency here. Rikers is a long-term emergency, and that's why we committed to close it, but seeing that instead of continuing to bring down the numbers, which were when you got there at 12,000, and then got down to 7,200, and then to 4,000, that they're back at 6,000 is an emergency, but the short-term emergency created by all these unmanned posts. Deputy Mayor, I know you answered yes to the chair that you believe you're providing safety, but you just are not providing safety when people are locked in suicide watch units without staff to observe, when they're locked in showers. Um, it's not safe. So I, I guess my questions are these. Um, there have been reports of people locked in suicide watch units without staff to observe. Is that being tracked? And how many times has it happened? We saw people locked in showers. Is that being tracked? And how many times has it happened? And then finally, will you give detailed reports on all of the 2020 and 2021 deaths in custody? What units and circumstances and what led to those deaths so that we can make sure nothing like that happens again? So I want to clarify, at no point did I say we were not in an emergency situation and that we don't have to do dramatic action to address I, it. Okay, so, I heard the chair ask, do you believe you are and can currently be operating safely? Maybe no, you didn't no, no, answer I, that I, question, but you answered. I was answering you, I believe, with the powers that the mayor gave us that we can get there with it without the additional uh, national and state help. And I answered that, that yes, we actually do need state help. But, you but I do believe with the with these with these actions that the mayor and the other actions that the commissioner detailed that are happening and with help from the state that I know you support, 
that we all support and we need, and opening up the criminal justice system, which I actually also know you support, all those measures, that's what I was answering. At no point, please, at no point am I saying that we are, we, and nor did the commissioner, that we are in, that we are fine today. We know we're not. We can do these actions immediately and move forward. That was the point I was making. Commissioner, do you want to add to this? I am. I want to totally acknowledge your public advocate Williams and the two chairs' concerns about safety. I am concerned about the safety of people who live and people who work in our jails. We are. We we have a plan that's going to reduce the population, increase the number of staff we have, and increase programmings, clean the place, and make it safer. Uh, but if you're asking me today, and I thought I heard the first deputy mayor say this as well, we're both concerned about safety. Yes. Okay, but I just want to be clarified then what we're saying is it's not safe today. And while there is a longer term plan in place, we don't have a timeline for when we will be operating at safety. And when Ross McDonald says it's not safe, and I just want to praise him here, like he rang an alarm bell because his patients are not safe. And his job as a doctor, and I'm glad to hear more from CHS on this, is to say we are not currently operating these facilities in a way that can guarantee the safety and in some cases the very lives of people you know who's are entrusted to us and every day we aren't doing that it is not okay and so uh, a long-term plan um was not enough like when outside help is being asked for what i saw what i understand dr mcdonald to to be calling for is something that moves faster just to guarantee basic life safety, to get people to doctors, to make sure people are getting their medicine, to get intake done in 24 hours so people aren't going without mental health screenings, not to have people on suicide watch without staff, not to have people locked in showers. And we can't wait for a new class uh, or, for, or for reductions over time. And so I, I just, I hear you that an emergency has been declared, but I don't feel emergency action is being taken to move quickly enough to make sure that people's lives are not at risk in the very near term. And when outside help is being sought or something more is being done, that's what I understand Dr. McDonald to be seeking. That's what I observed as necessary. But I guess I just want to put my questions back on the record because I am, you know, I think some of these things like tracking suicide watch units without staff to observe, tracking where people are locked in showers and providing good detailed reports on what happens with deaths in custody so we can see where, you know, and what conditions and circumstances caused it. Uh, that's what I'm, what I'm asking. Anything you could tell us now, I would really appreciate. Um, I, will and I, hand it, I will hand it back over to the commissioner with this. I, I, I agree with your concern. And I know you're both concerned. I, I don't no, know no, no, about no, whether I, you individually, I, I, I think very highly of both of you individually, and I know that you share these concerns, but that just doesn't mean that we're taking urgent, sufficiently urgent action to make it safe. You're right. You have to, there are two parts there, and I'm going to hand it over to the commissioner in a minute. I, at no time, yes, the long-term solution that we all support, you certainly support, is the borough-based jails. We do have a long-term solution. We continue to drive down uh, drive down crime and we continue to drive down incarceration rates. That the incarceration is going up. It's not being driven down. Your, it's back up immediate, to 6,000. To your immediate question. You, you my time is up. I should put my questions on the record and let my colleagues ask theirs. No, but no. I mean, do, can you answer the questions that I asked? No, of course. On the on the immediate, we do believe the emergency, the emergency, and I'm going to answer if you just let me finish. Okay. We do believe the emergency, the emergency pieces that the mayor put in place yesterday allow us to take immediate action on the very specific things of what we're tracking or not. Let me turn to the commissioner. So. I agree with your concerns and with Dr. McDonald's concerns, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And if you would talk to any of the elected officials I've briefed between when I started and today, you'll, you'll hear that I've been very blunt about my concerns and I've raised many of the same concerns that Ross has. So yes, he, he's issued a clarion call, but the, 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 the caucus I briefed of uh, Chairman Miller's I said very much the same things. I, I was, um, I'm nothing if I'm not blunt about this stuff. 
Uh, I think that what this package and the package of stuff we've been doing, I don't think it's accurate to, con to, to um, consider it a long-term plan. There's short, medium, and long-term things in there. We're tracking every single bit of it. So today, if people who were in one facility would go to work in another facility, we wouldn't have triples. Today, if a portion of those people, not even all of them, were out sick, came to work, and the folks calling an AWOL, we wouldn't have a triple problem. I'm not waiting for that to happen, but I am encouraging that to happen, both through incentives and through discipline. Okay, just, I'm sorry, but suicide watch without staffing, people being locked in showers, and reports on deaths in custody. Can I get, can I get answers on those things? Yeah, well, so the staffing does affect all of those things. Councilmember Lander, I, I don't understand what you're, whoops, I, I can't hear you. You're, you're he's muted. been muted, but can you answer the question then that we have? Sorry, Councilor Orlando, I think we have to. Yeah, uh, and the, the question being, uh, what are we doing on those three specific things today? So it was, it was suicide. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the other two. All right, could you un 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 unmute Councilor Orlando if we can get his final question out? Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was asking what data is available to you and what will you make available to us on where there is people on suicide watch units without staffing to observe, how many people are locked and have been locked in showers this year, and when can we expect uh, reports on deaths and detailed reports on deaths in custody from last year and this year? And I'll go back on you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, great. So the, su the suicide and the locked-in data we will get you this week. The reports on uh, deaths in custody, generally that's done by CHS. They do uh, post-death uh, reports and analyses, and so does the Board of Correction. So I'm going to have to turn that over to both uh, uh, Dr. Yang and also Meg Egan, because they're the ones. This way there's oversight being done of us rather than us inspecting ourselves. So I, I would turn it over to both of them to report out on when they're going to be issuing those reports. Dr. Yang first. Somebody's got to unmute. Yes, hi. Uh, it, my name is Patsy Yang. I'm uh, the Senior Vice President of Health and Hospitals for Correctional Health Services. Thank you for the question. Uh, the cause of death and the, and the reports of death actually come from, um, thank you, Commissioner, from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner um, in the City of New York. Uh, no, no worries there. Uh, And then but I can. We, I, go ahead. Sorry. In the board, right? Yeah. I, and I think I, this Meg is. Egan with the Board of Corrections. Um, we, the board actually conducts death reviews of all deaths in custody. Um, and we have a pretty robust process to do a preliminary report and then a longer term investigation. Um, I want to give uh, kudos to our Deputy General Counsel, Kate McMahon, who, um, who leads the, that investigation work. Um, they take up. They take a while. We do, as I said, we do a robust investigation, um, and so when we finish those reports, um, we try to make our recommendations public. Um, so I can't necessarily give you a timeline on these um, on these cases, um, but I assure you that we are investigating each and every one of them. Okay, next we're going to turn to Council Member Rivera and then we'll hear from Council Member Holden followed by Council Member Dinowitz. Again, please keep your testimony to two minutes. Um, we will be muting you after two minutes. Thank you. Time starts now. Hi there, good morning. Thank you for being here. I'll try to ask my questions very, very quickly and not go over time. Thank you, Commissioner, for being here. I also have been kind of tracking some of your conversations and interviews that you've been doing publicly. And, and I appreciate your appointment of the first deputy commissioner, Richards, who I know comes from the Fortune Society and has personal experience being incarcerated. So we recognize that DOC has presented multiple actions to address mass absenteeism, but we need urgent intervention, as you've heard again and again. 
that address inhumane conditions that I have personally witnessed and, and many others have that respond to staff, staff safety concerns and actively prevent the further spread of COVID now. And as someone who has visited the facilities and completely changes your perspective on what is necessary. And there is no question, as you have also mentioned, not only is change urgent, but also basic medical services for the incarcerated are in crisis. So jail data shows that there were 15,009 missed medical appointments um, just in this year alone in June. What are the primary causes for missed or delayed medical causes according to the administration? If you can answer that. And then I just wanna follow up with the chief medical officer noted in his letter to the city that for the first time this year, COVID-19 rates in the jail seem to be outpacing the spread in the city and as chair of the committee on hospitals clearly very very alarming and the department has also made changes to its sick leave policy so how do these changes include necessary COVID-19 precautions and tracking commissioner can i turn it over to you yep so i'll start with missed appointments and changes to the sick leave policy i'm going to throw it over to dr yang for uh our rates outpacing the rates in the rest of the city uh, the largest, the largest uh, reason, I would say the sole reason for missed appointments is inadequate staff. We literally do not have enough staff. There's an officer on a post by herself and no one to bring people to the, to the clinic. We're working on this with, the, with CHS right now. Part of what we might bring other uh, departments in to help do would be to provide some security in the, in the um, uh, clinics so that staff can then just leave people there and go back, but we're still working on that. But that's the primary reason for missed appointments is lack of uh, sufficient staff to bring people to medical appointments. And then- and just sorry, the Member time has expired. My, my brief follow-up is that we know that weekly meetings happen between staff unions, DOC and H&H &H to discuss solutions to this crisis. So my last thing and, and thank you for the time how is the feedback implemented from frontline workers to improve the solutions and of course i'll let you finish what you were saying sorry to interrupt but i do have a very limited of time so thank you for all of those questions uh, so i've been i've been receiving also monthly meetings with uh, chs unions the doctors the, the nurses as well as as the weekly ones that chs has with them and they are harrowing um uh so we are incorporating that we actually triage my uniform staff and chs regularly triage people who need appointments so that if we're going to miss appointments we miss the least important ones i don't think that makes it okay i'm not trying to say it does uh what will make it okay is for us to make every single appointment uh, or the vast majority of them like we did before the pandemic uh, as as far as I, can you just uh, tell me again the changes to the sick leave question you had. There was something. There were three questions. One was about changes to sick leave. Shit, can't hear. You. Just, uh, just unmute Council Rivera very quickly. She's uh, trying to get her question clarified. So well, I asked about um, the implementation of of solutions from frontline workers with the meetings which you went into but the changes to its sick leave policy and how do these changes include necessary COVID-19 precautions oh, and yes. tracking. And I mentioned Thanks. the letter that was written by your chief medical officer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right, COVID-19. And so I'll answer that one and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Yang about uh, the rates of COVID infection. Uh, the, uh, there is an exception in the sick leave policy for people who have COVID-like symptoms. Uh, they're not, they are not to go into a medical clinic uh, if they do, because then they will potentially infect people. Uh, we, we have, as you know, instituted the mayor's uh, new policy of requiring everybody to be vaccinated or to get tested weekly. Uh, and that has resulted in an increase in vaccinations. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Yang uh, regarding- Yeah, I'm gonna, may I jump in for just a minute and then turn over? Um, one of the direct results and the CHS recommendation was to open two clinics, which we're about to do, and to uh, spread out intake, but I'll, I'll turn it over to CHS. Hi, thank you. It's Patsy Yang again. Um, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, the, the 
we, we continue to prioritize um, services for our highest risk patients, um, and we work closely with the Department of Corrections to make sure that those patients and we are connected. Um, in terms of COVID, our protocols basically have not changed since last year. Um, they continue to rely, rely on containment, which consists of testing um, and vaccination most recently, um, certainly as soon as it became available this year, um, as well as quarantine and isolation housing. Um, each of those, of course, also rely upon uh, the Department of Corrections staffing um, and their ability to uh, manage appropriately patient movement uh, and, and quarantine and isolation. Um, we do, do continue to work with the department on that. As the first deputy mayor just noted, um, the opening of the two clinics uh, and, and the EMTC facility will be of great assistance to us. Um, it allows us a, a, a better space in which to, to handle not only intake, um, but also to take care of patients who need care other than, than, than uh, their new admission processing, um, is, which includes some of the, the prioritized service that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, the rate, I, I will say that um, the early on in 2020 when the pandemic just hit, um, the, the rate of positive um, results in the jails in our, in, among our patient population was higher than that of the city. Um, we enjoyed a, a, a reversal at some point in, in later 2020, but that, that uh, regrettably has, has reversed again. Um, we have always said, and I think everybody here is gathered uh, in recognition of the fact that um, carceral congregate settings are not a good place and a healthy place to be, period, much less in a time of pandemic. Um, and one of the, the very important strategies uh, that, that helped us contain um, transmission last year um, still hold valid now, given the, the concerns about um, the con congregate setting, which is um, the, the high population in, in these settings um, and, reducing, and reducing the population, um, which not only protects the people who are vulnerable to serious disease um, should they, should they uh, contract the virus while in jail, um, but also gives relief to um, everybody who remains in detention. Um, it, it gives uh, both the people who certainly live there um, and also the people who work and care for them. Um, so that, that remains a very important piece, and I think people have spoken to, to the need to deal with the population, the census, uh, earlier. Okay, thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Council Member Holden. Um, then, I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. It's going to be Council Member Adams, then Council Member Dinowitz, and then Council Member Rosenthal. Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Deputy Mayor. A um, couple of, um, you know, follow up on my colleague, uh, Council Member Danique Miller's question. Um, it sounds like we don't know why correction officers are not coming into work, or did we do a survey to find out the reasons? as to what, you know, what's their number one reason? Is it conditions? Is it illness? Do we really know why? I'll, I'll start and hand it over to the commissioner. The answer, the, the first answer is to deal with the emergency. We know we, we, look, we know that we need to make improvements in conditions. We definitely care about our workers. We care about their safety. The commissioner is working with uh, with the DAs, with in particular the Bronx DA, to and to prosecute and rearrest on any assault on a correction officer, we know all these things have to be addressed. But we also know, again, I'm going to keep going back to it. And the reason the mayor did the merge five emergency yesterday, and the reason we're taking this action, which we don't take, is because we have men and women who are coming every single day and performing their duties as um, in an unbelievable level, and we need to get their support. So yeah, no, but, uh, I don't so have an mayor, exact knowledge of why right, everyone is doing it, but I do know we have an emergency. Yeah, I, I, my time is limited. The commissioner, so I just wanna... the commissioner may have a different, the commissioner should jump in. Yeah, but first I wanna, I wanna get to the, cause I, I, I understand that um, it's like uh, the chicken to the egg here. What we're getting, we're in a, a catch 22, it sounds like. We're, the conditions are horrendous. Um, but what we heard is that, you know, correction officers are not getting paid for the incentive to work triple shifts. So it's a joke. Uh, what, you know, I, the I, administration I, is responsible. The, hold on. The administration 
is responsible for not having a class for three years and even having a, a training center that's subpar. If it, it's in my district and I visited that. And, and um, first deputy mayor, what did you notice when you visited Rikers Island recently? Member time has expired. I, I, want, to, I want to go back and I will hand it off to the commissioner that, that the, the, the number it is, if we do have to go back and look again at the, and I, I'm going to ask the commissioner to recite the number of people that we had when this administration started and the number of correction officers we have now with a population that was almost 12,000 when we started versus 6,000 now. So commissioner. So a couple of things. One is we have a plan that has many facets. It's not just trying to get more people back to work. It's bringing people in. It's reducing the population. It's treating the people who unfortunately have to work in tough conditions better. So it's a, it's a bunch of things. It's not just one thing, but yes, when the mayor was uh, first came on, uh, uh, was sworn in, we had more incarcerated people than we had staff. Now we have more staff than we have incarcerated people. So it was 11,000 incarcerated people then when the mayor came on and 9,000 staff. Now it's 6,000 incarcerated people and 8,400 staff. So much so that the monitor said, we actually have too many staff. I don't know if I necessarily agree with every bit of what the monitor said, uh, but the real problem is people coming to work, the ability to have them come to work. We have to ferret out better who really is sick and cannot come to work and who just needs to come to work. And so that's why we have this plan. We're bringing people to see doctors before they can be considered out sick, and then we'll know. And when we know that, then we'll have to make other decisions about how many more people we hire. Uh, but right now, we already have upped the previous commitment by 50% plus. Went from 400 to 600, plus we're bringing back a bunch of people who were here before who can be quickly reinstated. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Council Member Adams, followed by Council Member Dinowitz, then Council Member Rosenthal, and then Council Member Riley. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairs, uh, for holding this really, really important hearing today. Uh, thank you for all who have testified. I've got a lot to say in a very short amount of time, so please bear with me. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, my mother retired as a cap captain in correction. Um, I have seen Rikers Island on various occasions um, and uh, very recently as well. So I, I guess my, my overarching statement to the administration is that atrocities against detainees and officers have been happening for years. What took you so long to come to the realization that ignoring this would ultimately lead to crisis and chaos? That's my first question off the top. The next thing that I'd like to say is by no, no other greater means, a crisis of of humanitarianism against black and brown individuals who are resident in these jails. There is a lack of respect, there is a lack of concern, and there is a lack of care for people who are primarily black and brown in our jail system. I'd also uh, like to highlight the sexual assault of women officers on Rikers Island that can speak today, which gets little to no attention when it comes to forums like this, but I will continue to be that voice for these women who continue to be sexually harassed, raped, violated. In fact, one woman was actually violated while she was pregnant inside of Rikers Island. We have a federal law called PREA law. It's Prison Rape Elimination Act. It was under President George Bush. And it happens to penalize those officers who commit violations against inmates, yet there is no such law protecting female officers inside of our jails against the same atrocities that are happening as we speak right now. So I am asking for PREA recognition in our jails for our women. I would like to know to what extent does, does the DOC keep track of sexual harassment and assault against female officers? What is the rate of assault 
against female officers in our jail. I'd like to also know when it comes to housing detainees, what was the thought process behind creating and keeping gang members housed together? What was that thought process and how has that benefited anyone involved in this scenario today? Member, time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, chairs. I have a lot more to say. Thank you. Can you guys, uh, uh, you can start to answer those questions. I, I'm sorry, Chair. Did, did I, did, I apologize. Did you ask me something at that point? I asked very specific oh, questions. Oh, no, no, I know. I was asking if Chairman, if Chair. No, no, I was asking, uh, I was asking to answer the question. Sorry. Oh, okay. Look, and I'll hand it over to the commission. I'm, I'm not, we, Every single thing you're saying, we're not sharing. We have, we are recognizing again the emergency. We have been trying, and and I compliment the commissioner with great faith in and the team he's put together to uh, to address these issues. It needed more, and the mayor acted yesterday with the emergency. That's how we believe we're going to address this. Commissioner, you want to add? Please. Yes. Um, the. Uh... This is the only uniformed staff in the city of New York that is predominantly people of color and the only uniformed staff in the city of New York that is majority women. And of course, the population who's incarcerated here, overwhelmingly people of color. And I cannot help but agree with you that for decades, that's been part of why this is a system that suffered neglect. Uh, I have personally spoken to the uh, staff members who raise issues around sexual assault and I'm horrified by the issues they've raised. I've asked my chief of staff, Dana Wax, to specifically meet with them and create a plan to address this issue. And I'm gonna turn it over to her on that. And then uh, also uh, um, the detainee questions, the gang question, I'm gonna ask Chief Stooks to address that question, but I absolutely am concerned about the issues you raised, Council Member Adams. Commissioner, before, before we go, I just have to get this in there because I have to compliment you and your heart for this work. I don't be it known on the record that your predecessor as a woman left you a deplorable legacy in correction. I, I feel like you and I have had these discussions, council member, and I value them tremendously. I hate this hearing, not because you guys are telling falsehoods, but because you're telling the truth. This is extremely painful to sit through as a person who spent his entire career trying to fix the garbage that mass incarceration has left us with. I appreciate you guys kicking me around on it. You should kick me around on it. And uh, I, I don't know what else to say about that, but I'm going to turn it over to Chief of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chief of Staff Dana Wax and to uh, Chief Stukes on the gang issue. First, Dana on the uh, sexual assaults. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilmember Adams. Um, first, I, I want to thank you for bringing this issue to light and for centering the women of, of this department and specifically centering and speaking up for the women of color who work in this department. It has not happened uh, in prior years. It should have, and I appreciate your advocacy. As one of the highest ranking female members of this department, it breaks my heart that women here are suffering sexual trauma and the effects of that trauma. Um, and I am dedicated to seeing that end, and I am dedicated to working with those women and helping them heal from what they've experienced. Um, I, I, we've spoken about this before, um, but in brief, I put, to, uh, in full, for, the first let me say that I have met with the highest ranking female COVID delegates um, roughly every two to three weeks over the past three months. Um, I'm working with them and the Office to End Gender-Based Violence to develop a plan to address this issue and to provide services to our members of service. Um, in brief, that involves prosecutions, uh, for persons who are assaulting our, our staff members. Um, 
we have assaulted, or sorry, we have prosecuted uh, or rearrested, I'm sorry, we've rearrested eight people in custody this year alone, one of them for a felony. Um, we are also in the process of finalizing dedicated trauma services with some of our city's top providers, uh, including a warm handoff from four DOC staff members to those providers through the Office of Gender-Based Violence. Um, I am also working to get dedicated training to help our leaders across the department have these difficult conversations with staff members. Um, and I'm also working with external providers to work with the young men, in particular in our custody, to help stop this behavior before it starts. Again, uh, I really thank you for bringing light to this issue, and I hope that we can continue to partner on this uh, in the months to come. We have no, no choice but to partner. Thank you, Dana. My final comment will be that my fear is that some of those who are out right now considered AWOL who have been traumatized because of their experiences of sexual assault within the walls of the jail. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, chairs. Thank you, council member. Thank you. I appreciate you are highlighting those concerns, which are so important here. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Dinowitz, then Council Member Rosenthal, Riley, and Dharma Diaz. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, Commissioner, I think we, I agree with you. I, I hate this committee hearing as well. I don't think any of us want to be here for this reason. We've spoken a lot, and the word harrowing uh, has come up multiple times. I'm particularly concerned about the youth at Rikers for ages 18 to 21. I'm interested to know how many, first of all, how many are in the age bracket and how many of those children, I'll call them, are still enrolled in high school. Of those kids, are, how integrated are they with people who are older, people who are, um, we've heard about the atrocious conditions there. Are our youth facing those atrocious conditions as well because it pains me uh you know to think that our youth who may or may not have made one single mistake are now because of where they are going to be set on a terrible path for the rest of their life thank you i um i, I don't know if you know this about me but uh the first time i worked in government was to run the juvenile justice system in washington dc and so I am deeply concerned about the young people in our system. That is the, a big part of the Nunez consent decree, violence amongst the young people. And violence amongst young people in our system is higher than it is in any other part of our system. It's nine times the rate of violence in the rest of the system. And so when I came on, my biggest primary focus was to fix the problems in the young adult housing. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to First Deputy Commissioner Stanley Richards in a second because he co-chairs the Young Adult Task Force. But here's the dream, Council Member, for what well, sorry, I respect, Commissioner, respectfully, because of time, I don't doubt where your heart is. I don't doubt what the dream is. Right. What, what I'm concerned with are our youth, um, and if and if time allows, I'm particularly concerned with the number of students with dis or youth with disabilities, including learning disabilities, which often go overlooked. We talk a lot about mental health, but I'm particularly concerned with those, including learning disabilities. And if screenings are done, if they are receiving their proper services related service providers, the proper services they need to address their disabilities, and if our youth are evaluated or re-evaluated for their disabilities. Member time has expired. Thank you. Yes. Um, so remember, the 16 and 17-year-olds are gone now. So the 250 or so, because you asked that question, young adults between the ages of 18 and 21 who are there, don't have to go to school. They can voluntarily go. They can voluntarily not go. If they go, they are tested. And if they are found uh, to have learning disabilities, they get uh, special education services. So when, let me just, just sorry to interrupt, just to be clear, all of those who choose to go to school, regardless of whether or not they have an IEP, 
are tested universally? If tested no, universally? not to my knowledge, but I will get you that answer. My belief is they are tested if they show signs of a learning disability or if they already had one, not if they don't show any signs. But I don't know that for a fact, and I will circle back around with you on that. Okay, and my assumption is that you do not provide that same service for adults who may display disabilities. In other words, you don't test people over the age of 21 who are not enrolled in the school. So DOE is increasingly enrolling adults in education, and I will get you the answer on how they go about testing on that as well. Thank you. So, so I, I, I don't want to be too much over my time. I respect your time and, and all of my colleagues and all the advocates um, here today. But so to be clear, those enrolled in school may or may not be screened or rescreened, but there's no universal mandate or push to have every inmate or detainee screened for learning disabilities, emotional disturbances, correct? Not to my knowledge. And the housing of the youth, they are housed with everyone aged 21 or older, uh, uh, over 21, but they're also housed in these same areas where it was described in vivid details of, of you know, fecal matter and attempted suicide. They're, they're all housed together. They're housed in separate facilities, 18 to 21, except in some rare special circumstances where there's only very few of them. And what, what, it, what is, I have 250 youth, how many is very few? Stanley, do you have the, uh, the, the circumstances under which uh, kids or young people are co-located? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you have the number. We'll get you the number, but I want Stanley to, uh, because he's more on top of this than I am, to give you the, the reasons. Thank you, uh, Council Member, for your question. Thank there you. are circumstances in which we co-mingle young adults. One of those circumstances is medical. If there's a medical reason, we will uh, uh, co-mingle. If there's a mental health reason, we would co-mingle. And if there's a restrictive housing reason, we would co-mingle. But the majority of our young folks are housed in RNDC and are not co-mingled with folks over 21. And we have established, as Commissioner Shiroli said, the Young Adult Task Force to really focus on young adults. We just instituted our Young Adult Summit. We brought in Kings of Kings and Exodus we re-engaged our seven contracted providers, and they have now been assigned to each of our young adults housing units. We've expedited volunteer IDs so that volunteers don't need escorts to go to the housing area to be able to provide services. So we're doing what we need to do to lean in to work with young people, in addition to building out by young people, for young people, model housing that we hope to institute throughout all of our young adult units. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, I have, I have no doubt that your hearts are in the right place, um, but we, you don't have a number on the number of youth, and you also don't have, I, I guess I could forward these questions later, but the number of youth with disabilities in the facility. You don't we have will get you that. all of those. Thank you. All right. Thank we will you. get you all of those numbers, and, and I, I just want to say it's not just our hearts are in the right place. We have been doing a lot of hard work on this. We've issued for staff to get preferred posts who want to work with young adults so that they we know exactly who's working with those young adults because they want to be there and they're specially trained. And then all of those programs that Stanley just mentioned, that's more than just our hearts. That's actual stuff that we're doing to ameliorate the negativity in the young adult and also increase the positive programming engagement the young adults are involved in. So it's a it's a not just a planning process, but a deep working process that we've engaged in. Okay, I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there. I know I'm over my time. I want to thank the chairs, uh, Councilor Powers and Miller, for this hearing, and I, I look forward to, to getting that information. And we'll be sending you more uh, questions regarding the youth at Rikers. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll you, make sure we follow up to get that data for you as well. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Riley and Councilmember Diaz. Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairs, for holding the hearing. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for Deputy Mayor, and, and all your staff. Um, I appreciate your being here to account for the inhumane conditions 
in our jail system. And I appreciate the plan that you set forward yesterday. Uh, very quickly, one piece that is missing from your plan is what you're doing to expedite building four new humane jails. You have three and a half months left. There's a lot you can do with procurement, design, and construction, and laying the groundwork for those four jails. And I think that is starkly missing from your plan um, because you can be doing that now. Um, and, and for Deputy Mayor Fulham, that might involve, uh, you know, encourage, strongly encouraging DDC uh, to move quickly and finding out from them what resources they need in order to get it done. Um, so I'll look forward to hearing back from you on that. What I'd like to ask right now is doubling down on council member Adam's point about sexual assaults, which for some reason, uh, the women seem to know about and ask about this issue. So um, I, I would like to know what resources have been made available to the survivors of sexual assault how many people do you know of have been sexually assaulted this year? How many people have been referred to resources? Um, and, uh, and, and let's start there. And, and Deputy Mayor Fulihan, I'd love, I'd love to hear your, if you know this information. I'm going to hand it over to the commissioner on your, on your, I, well, I have to, um, but on the first piece, um, I, if there's something you think we're not doing on borough, I just want yeah, to. Yeah, I would, I, I mean, I, I I'm will, happy I, to meet with you on the first piece, but the problem is that you don't know the answer to the question on sexual assault. It I'm tells me that you have I'm, not asked the question yourself. Yeah, we, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I respect if that's you. not true, I please. I respect you greatly, but I, there is a reason to have a commissioner who has the facts and I'm gonna turn it over to him to answer. We are talking about all these issues constantly. I yeah, keep and rape is not first and foremost, and about. that's my concern. I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you and I respect you, you know that. Member time has expired. So uh, to, Vinny, I, I apologize, Commissioner, if you want to address that, and then I will quickly address the borough based. I will get you a number on how many people have been sexually assaulted. People don't have to tell us when they're sexually assaulted. So what's tended to happen is that people have raised it, the, particularly COBA delegates have raised it very specifically. Commissioner, it's, of course, no one wants to talk about rape because this society I, has made women the, the uh, bad person. And we know that the perpetrators are the one at fault. So of course, you don't know the exact number. Of course, others have raised it. That is a common thing to, that people who should be accountable say, but I'm asking you specifically, how many people have reported that they've been sexually assaulted. You tell me any number you want in the last month, in the last six months, since you've been here, the year prior, I don't care. But what I wanna know is that you've asked that question to your staff and that you have a number firmly fixed in your head. And so I wanna know how many people have been raped? You don't know that? How many people have said it's a problem? You don't know that? How many people have been referred, actually been referred to resources. And to hear that you're reinventing the wheel and working with the Office to End Gender-Based Violence about what to do. I mean, let me just flip my screen for one second. Honestly, here's what you do. Refer them to people who know what they're doing in terms of providing trauma-informed care. So. You know, hearing that you're now creating a plan is, is just painful. But do you have any of this information at hand or do you want to refer me to your chief of staff? 
I'm going to refer you to my chief of staff. I'm also going to get you the information. And I'm, uh, we have also just separate and apart from the questions you're asking, met with the sex crimes unit of the Bronx District Attorney's Office to prosecute these cases. I know that's not everything. How many, t how many cases have you brought to them? I'm going to, I'll, we'll get you that data. Dana, do you want to answer the, the council members' questions? Sure. So, um, council member, first, again, thank you. Thank you, council member Adams, as well. We must center the women of this department, and you have, council member Rosenthal has been a champion for women across the city, and I really appreciate you bringing your attention to the women of the Department of Corrections. Um, since council member Adams began her line of questioning on this, I've been in touch with our head of uh, investigation. We are working on that data. I don't have those data points in front of me right now, but we will have them uh, by today or tomorrow. Um, I want to let you know that sexual assault is a logbook, or sexual assault, abuse, misconduct, it's a logbook entry, so we do track it. It's, it's recorded and tracked every day. I just don't, I don't have an aggregate count to give you. Um, with regards to the dedicated trauma services, again, I, I can't agree with you enough. And so what we do have right now uh, on island available for people today is what the wellness center and those staff have been trained in trauma support care from the mayor's office to end gender-based violence. Uh, we also have reintroduced the employee assistance program. Now that's not enough and I'm not satisfied, which is why in the past month or so, I've been working with the mayor's office to end gender-based violence to provide dedicated clinical trauma-informed care to our staff. Uh, and that's gonna be made available within the next week or two. Um, and I'm happy offline to give you the names of those support services. And so when you pull up your dashboard, how many people have been, have, have said they've been sexually assaulted? So that's the number that I would get you by the end so of So you story. don't have a dashboard that tracks it, but you track it every day. So what I can actually, it's, it's, I'm glad you raised that point, and that is the same point that's been raised to me by COBA in my co routine conversations with them, and we will be adding that stat to our team's meetings, which are, are essentially DOC comp stat meetings, because it needs to be raised publicly and tracked constantly and publicly. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, and, and you and I also go way back, and I'm, I'm happy you're in the position you're in, because I know... Um, I know how amazing you are, so thank you. But for the record, you know, we had an entire hearing about that and were lied to because we were told that all of this was already being tracked, that it was already on a dashboard, that there was already a robust system, that everybody had been trained and all cases were being investigated. So, and then the PREA report came out saying that the jail system past all PREA standards 100%. And it is on uh, all of us to have not challenged that report because of course it was a lie. So I feel now, Commissioner with you there and Dana with you there, I think we will start to get answers. So thank you for that. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Council Member Riley. Can I just, uh, because the Council Member did have questions on borough based jails, uh, Marcos, do you want to just give us an update? Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member, for your question. As you know, we here at MACJ and other partner agencies, we are remain focused on the ultimate plan of closing Rikers. That has no change, as you know. Procurement is underway in all four sites. A, of the borough facilities, and we'll allow them that happen soon. We already have broken in Queens beginning in June, construction of the parking and community space, and we'll go along with the site a, where people with attention and staff will have access to better programming. Uh, on July 1st, we made an initial down payment on the commitment to close Riker, transferring jurisdiction of a shutter facility to DCAS. And again, we are completely committed to closing Rikers as soon as possible. I hear you. You, a, it's a good call. We will continue to put pressure and uh, to move the timelines. That's always what we aspire to do. I think what I was hoping to see was a strategic plan, maybe sharing your screen where you could show us your roadmap for closing and building. So I, I have that and I will be happy. That. 
I, I'll have that and I will be happy to share Great. that with you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Chairs. Really Thank appreciate you, the opportunity. Appreciate it. We'll follow up on Thank that uh, plan as well. Thank you. Now we will hear from Councilmember Riley, followed by Councilmember Diaz, and then Councilmember Lewis. Councilmember Riley. Time starts now. We can't hear you, Councilmember Riley. Councilmember Riley, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. No. Well, yeah, we'll go to the next one and we'll come back. I think that's what you're indicating, and I, I'm going to oblige. We'll come back right, come right back to see that. Okay, we'll go to Councilmember Diaz next, then. Time starts now. Good. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I'm not sure. It's telling me that I'm not you can hear unmuted. We hear you. I want to um, <laughs> start uh, by thanking Councilwoman Adams for being hard, and asking the hard questions, and also Councilman Rosenthal to sticking to the fact that women are being sexually abused. As of May, we have 81 women on record that have been abused, and that's documented. So why, you know, 81 is a big number. Over the summer, I did meet with officers, female officers that work in, in Rikers, and I'm going to stand by their numbers. I don't think they're fastidious. Um, I like I like to go back to original conversation in reference to when when the federal government went in and made the um, the assessment. It was declared that there was issues with locking the jail cells. I'd like to know what's the turnaround time to correcting that issue. Commissioner, thank you, Council. Thank you, council member. Uh, when I got here, there was a two year timeline on fixing all the cell doors that were broken. Uh, I talked to first deputy mayor Fulahan about that and neither of us found it acceptable. So we've been pushing on that uh, and offering incentives for the door manufacturers to uh, move that along more quickly. There's you know, obviously been supply chain issues, but we've gotten it down to February. We expect to be able to fix all the doors by February. We did just complete 50 more door repairs. So that got us to about halfway in the number we're supposed to get. And we anticipate being completed by February, but we're still pushing and we're still pushing on the door manufacturers who happen to be located in Sunset Park. How feasible is it to relocate in inmates to areas that can both protect the inmates and, and the staff? until this yeah. issue is rectified in February. Thank you for that question. All the facilities right now are pretty much right up at the top of capacity. If we had fewer people and we had more staff, it would be totally feasible and the right thing to do. But right now, we're pretty much at the top of every facility except the women's facility, but you, know, you can't put men in there. And then we really don't have other staff. The, the only thing we can do, uh, which we are planning to do, uh, uh, through our conversations with CHS is to open up the clinics in EMTC and there are just a few beds there, but really it's not, we don't have a lot of ability to expand just because we don't have staff to expand with, with the expansion of facilities. And, and, and to the commissioner's point, the plans that he's, that he's outlined here at the hearing today and the five point plan the mayor put on, all of this will allow us that kind of flexibility. That's, that's exactly why we did it with the mayor. Okay, then my last is, is more that's, of a statement. I'm expired. May I please just make a statement? Yep, go ahead. I hear numbers, two shifts, six, which is 16 hours, three shifts, 24 hours. Let's not forget that the staffers are human beings. We're not robots. We do not yep. press a reset button where a body just rejuvenates and our brain is clear. So we need you to do better and be more sensitive. Even we're speaking to numbers and hours, these are our people. So not only are our behaviors impacting our staff, but also the inmates. And we wanna make sure that we have a clear and fair path for everyone. Thank you. Our people are human, it's not numbers, it's not shifts, is what could happen. We need to be able to prevent the likelihood of any more negative occurrences. Thank you. Thank you, I couldn't agree with you more, Council Member. That's exactly why we're trying at all these different points to have a plan exactly to help both make the people who are incarcerated and the staff have 
better conditions to work in and to live in while uh, reducing the numbers and bringing more folks back to work. But I could not agree with you more, Council Member. I appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Council Member Riley and then Council Member Lewis. Council Member Riley. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Powers. Thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just want to uh, kind of focus on the culture of Rikers Island. Um, within the inmates, I have speaking to, uh, spoken to some people who are incarcerated in Rikers, and they're saying uh, kind of the inmates are kind of running everything in there due to the lack of staffing. And kind of speaking today, it seems like the lack of staffing is a huge issue. But this didn't just happen during COVID. This was an issue uh, prior to this. And uh, actually, one of my staffers used to be a correctional officer. But it seems like when rookie staffers or um, rookie correctional officers come in, they're the ones that are kind of uh, put there for the double shifts and the triple shifts. So is there any plan to kind of fix that culture within Rikers where uh, we're making a state um, for the staffers, the correctional officers, and the inmates. And also, I, I did hear some programs that you had, uh, such as King, King's um, Helping Kings. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that and kind of speak on any mental health uh, programming that you have there for COs and also inmates? Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you. I'm going to uh, address the first part, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, First Deputy Commissioner uh, Richards for the programming question. Um, you know, it's really been fascinating and troubling to walk around the living units. And I've, I've been to every facility, every different shift, the midnight shift, and every uh, uh, command that we have, uh, just talking to staff and talking to incarcerated people. And what's, for people who haven't been working inside, uh, it's not surprising, but for people outside, it is a little surprising that sometimes I'll talk to the incarcerated people and they'll say, can you send her home? She's been here 20 hours and she's tired yeah. talking about their CO. And when I say to the CO, I talk to them, they say, can you get these guys their rec? Can you get them commissary? They're frustrated and, and tensions are rising. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a actually heartening in some respect thing to see that even in, in when people themselves are having issues, they are caring in some respects, for the others. Um, so yes, the lack of staffing is causing, as you as you ask, uh, lack of services on occasion, on more occasions than I'd like to, to have happen, uh, services to, to the people who are incarcerated. And I'll turn it over to uh, First Deputy Mayor, uh, First Deputy Commissioner Richards, who can answer the questions about uh, programming. Uh, thank you, Council Member Riley. Uh, King Kings is a credible messenger uh, provider, along with Exodus, that created a sort of gang mediation program. It's the foundation of what we're doing with some of our young adults. As Commissioner Shirovi said, young adults and people in our mental observation units are the two populations with the highest incidences in the department. So what Kings of Kings is doing is a six weeks ongoing uh, intervention working with some of the most influential gang leaders in our facilities to create the kind of space for them to mediate without violence so that they could manage their differences by seeing each other. And we have our officers who work with young adults part of that. Because what we've been saying is we need to see our officers and we need to see incarcerated people. And when we begin to center all of our work on their humanity, we can begin to lift them up and create the conditions where balance isn't the tool people use to manage the conflict that they have in our institutions. We've also re-engaged our providers, expedited their contracts so that providers can come back in. We have assigned providers specifically skilled in working with young adults in RMDC. They have been assigned to units. We have 27 correction counselors assigned to those units so we can provide crisis intervention, social services, and every one of those providers, including DOC staff, can make a mental health referral if one of our young people are uh, is distressed and need mental health care. Thank you, Mr. Richards. And, and just for the sake of time, are any of those programs actually helping them with the workforce also? 
Yes, yes. We, we have SEO, we have um, Youth Justice Network, uh, and we have our own workforce development program, Department of Corrections has our own workforce development program in the Peace Center, where they're doing some on island work with folks. And when they get released, they can do the transitional work to help people get connected to employment. We have a huge Jails to Jobs program that was created underneath this administration to guarantee people when they get out access to jobs, paying minimum wage or above, both as a training opportunity for people and for entryway into the world of work. And we have a number of community partners who manage those programs, including Fortune Society, Osborne, and other organizations. Thank you, Mr. Richard. And just for the sake of time, I just, uh, Chair, if, I, if, I, if I could just leave a, a statement real quick. Um, if there's any programming that we could do moving forward, because it seems like there's a culture being uh, built within jail that, that gives kind of a badge of honor in the streets, uh, with especially with our youth. So I do believe that these programs are great and amazing, but there's something in there that's not working because when they're coming back out to the streets to our communities, it's giving them a badge of honor instead of you know kind of elevating them to another level. So I would love to you know speak with you further on how we could kind of you know uh, think about how we can improve that. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, First Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and thank you, DOC. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, I, I attended the kickoff of the uh, King of Kings um, gang intervention work Monday, and they addressed exactly the issue you're just talking about. And they said exactly the same thing, council member. They talked about how um, this, when they were young, when they were these guys' age, because they walked in their shoes, uh, they thought of this as a badge of honor. And now, you know, after having done 30 years, 35 years, been locked up, never got to see their kids get raised, never got to see family members pass away and go to their funerals. I mean, it was really, really emotional. And you could see it in the young people's eyes that they really just hadn't, you know, because they're thinking about now, they're thinking about five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now, but they're not thinking about 30 years from now. It was really, really impressive. And now both them and Exodus will be their launching efforts to quell some of the gang tensions, while at the same time, uh, First Deputy Commissioner Richards and the task force that's been established, which includes unions, uniform staff, advocates, formerly incarcerated people, will create the kind of environment for these young people where they're not looking for those kinds of badges, where instead they're incentivized to finish their education, they're incentivized to get job skills, they're incentivized to get counseling, so that it's both peaceful inside, but as you talk about, more importantly, when they go back home. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Council Member Lewis. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Chairs Powers Adams Miller. Uh, for holding today's hearing on this atrocious issue occurring in our jails. And I do want to thank the commission and the administration for being present today for this conversation. Uh, Councilmember Diaz ended up asking one of the questions I had regarding the expedition of repairs. Um, and with all due respect, it's truly a disappointing response on an urgent matter. Um, so I hope that we can um, get something a little bit better later. But in addition, I'm also frustrated that even after last week's briefing with the BLAC, that the Department of Corrections still fails to provide the number of cases of female officers that reported violations. And that's still not available. And that's really, really disappointing. But I wanted to ask, um, regarding the intake process, how soon can these intakes be expedited? And regarding the NYPD now coming in, um, will they be trained to deal with this population? And when will the D NYPD be deployed to Rikers? Thank you. I'll, I'll start and hand it over to the commissioner. The NYPD is looking at their facilities right now with the Department of Corrections. And thank you. Yes, everybody needs to be trained. It's very important. So they do have their own training. And remember, this isn't this is at the courts where the NYPD has had experience in the past. So we're not. We're not talking about in, in, at Rikers, we're talking about in the court facilities. Um, Vinny, Commissioner, can I turn it 
turn it back to you. Thank you, council member. As far as the intake question you raised, uh, we anticipate opening the new intake facility in EMTC as well as a second clinic there with CHS next week. All right. Thank you, First Deputy uh, Mayor and Commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, so within days. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Um, we have a, more questions. We were going to send them to uh, the First Deputy Mayor and agencies in respect for time. So many people are here waiting for us. Um, you know, uh, I think you've heard a lot of the priorities here today from folks in the council when it comes to the population and, and, and lowering that population, the staffing issues, the security, the conditions of the cells, and much more. And um, we're going to hear, obviously, from public, so we'd appreciate folks uh, to be here uh, from, from your respective teams to hear those questions and testimony as well. And we'll be, of course, following up, uh, hopefully having a conversation soon to follow up on all the concerns from council members and from the public. So thank you for your testimony, and um, uh, thank you for being here today, First Deputy Mayor, Commissioner, and all your staff. Chair Powers. Can yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, Chair Miller. Yes. Sorry, uh, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm sorry. Before before they leave, um, there there were a number of questions, but at, specifically, um, uh, on on the housing and uh, how how congregate housing happens in terms of gangs. Uh, there was a question that wasn't answered on that. Uh, Commissioner, can you speak to that? Yes. Is that still happening? And why? Uh, yes, thank you, Council Member. We do not have an official policy of housing gang members together. However, there are times when our units are uh, disproportionately housing one or another gang member, gang group. Uh, we are in the process of breaking those up, but we cannot just break them up and send them out there until we have proper number of programs and proper number of staff if we do. There will be violence that is worse than what we have now. So I do not like having gang, uh, ha having houses with a dominant number of gang members in them, but we have to carefully break them up. We cannot do so in a manner that jeopardizes public safety. And then, and then, and, and then finally, um, there was the question uh, on compensation, particularly around uh, uh, overtime. Is, is the current payroll system uh, equipped and does it have the capacity to pay people after working a triple tour? Or is there something that has to be done manually? First step, oh, the, the, whether it's manual or uh, uh, automated, I'm going to turn over to Chief Stukes. But I do want to reiterate what uh, the First Deputy Mayor said, which is we've heard this and we're not denying that it might be so, but we need yet to get uh, evidence of it in a specific way that allows us to pay somebody. So we're always open to anybody telling us, I worked overtime on such and such a date and I didn't get it, but we have asked for that and not received it. So I'll turn over to the automation question and whether it's done by hand or not to Chief Stukes because he's much more familiar with that than I am. Yes, uh, Chief Stukes stepped out the room for a minute. But our current uh, members of services time process is a manual system. At one point, we did have the hand scanners for electronic timekeeping. During COVID, we had to pull those back. Uh, when we came on board, we are looking at reinstating that or another kind of technology to track time, but their time is tracked manually. We have timekeepers who manage their time and process the payroll. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Powers. Thank, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner, and the rest of your team uh, for giving us a, a great deal of your time this, this morning, this afternoon. We look forward to the follow-ups. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairpersons and members of my staff will stay on to, uh, to hear this and report back to me on uh, any issues that are of concern. But Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're moving now uh, to our next group, and we're going to try to keep this moving because I know a lot of folks want to testify, and we have elected officials and uh, union representatives, and of course, other folks from public here. So, thank you to all, and I'll head back to our staff. Thank you.
Thank you. We will now move on to the Board of Correction. First, we will hear from Executive Director Margaret Egan, followed by Board Member Bobby Cohen. Executive Director Egan, you may begin. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Powers, Chair Miller, and members of the committees on criminal justice and labor. I'm Margaret Egan. I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Board of Correction. I am joined today by Board Member Dr. Robert Cohen. Uh, board Chair Jennifer Jones Austin is unable to join us today and sends her regards. I would first want to thank you for inviting me to share my testimony on the state of the city's jails. As you know, the New York City Board of Correction is an independent oversight and regulatory agency charged with ensuring that the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services meet the board's minimum standards, which cover areas inclusive of the entire experience of persons in custody, including, among other conditions, access to counsel, family visits, religious exercise, and the provision of health and mental health services. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, the Board of Correction has continued its active oversight through monitoring conditions of the city's jails, processing complaints by people in custody and their families, and through rulemaking. Just this summer, the Board passed a, his a historic rules package eliminating the use of punitive segregation or solitary confinement and mandating a new progressive discipline system called the Risk Management Accountability System. Which is, and this is based on the presumption that safety of all people in custody and staff is paramount, that people need human contact and programming, and that any stay in restrictive housing should be brief, constructive, and based on clear rules and process to ensure forward movement. The Board of Correction has unique insight into the state of the jails, and what we currently see is a system in crisis on multiple levels endangering the safety of people in custody and staff. Most recently, the board issued a public statement decrying the sharp spike in suicides and the incidents of self-harm self in the jails and calling on criminal justice stakeholders to meet this crisis through urgent efforts to reduce the jail population. It is the board's belief that without these steps, the problems that I will describe today, staff shortages, extended stays in inhumane conditions, and lack of access to mandated services such as basic health and mental health care will only worsen, and a correctional system will experience a rapid increase in serious injury and death. Throughout the pandemic, the board has continued to monitor conditions in the jails. When the COVID-19 hit New York City in March of 2020, the board adopted its oversight model and prioritized monitoring the Department of Correction and Correctional Health Services evolving COVID-19 response. In May of 2020, the board began targeted on-site inspections to strategically supplement the remote oversight work that we began doing. Board staff also conducted tours to monitor facility compliance with agency plans and general operations, and to also monitor compliance with DOC minimum standards amidst this public health crisis. Each of our visits is carefully planned to be responsive to the ongoing and exceptional health risks, as well as the oversight needs. Since the spring of 2021, DOC has continued to refine this process and our on-site inspection work to allow for more robust strategic tours as issues beyond the pandemic have emerged. Today, I want to provide a brief, brief summary of what we have seen over the course of the last 18 months. The current state of the city jails cannot be described without acknowledging the extreme challenges posed by the pandemic. The threat to pe both people in custody and staff living and working in congregate settings was immediately understood, and the first wave of the pandemic prompted coordinated efforts to rapidly reduce the jail population. By April 29th of 2020, the jail population fell to a historic low of 3,832. Over time, however, that trend has reversed. For the week ending September 3rd, 2021, the average daily population in the jails was 6,043, which surpasses the 5,557 people in the jails on March 16th, 2020, as the pandemic hit the city. And immediately prior to coordinated efforts that reduced the population to approximately 3,800. The board calls on all stakeholders to again come together to immediately decarcerate. We know that there is not one silver bullet to reduce the jail population. Instead, it must be a multi-pronged approach that utilizes all options, 
judges, DAs, and the defense bar should evaluate those held, for pre held pretrial for a safe return to the community through release on recognizance and supervised release. For those individuals who have been held for over a, a one year, these stakeholders should review cases for an appropriate disposition. The commissioner of the Department of Corrections should continue to review and release those held on city sentences. And finally, the New York State Department of Correction and Community Supervision should stop detaining individuals on technical parole violations and review those currently held for release or release from jail. Not one of these is the only option, and all must be utilized immediately. Increased population, the increased population and DOC staffing shortages add to the already difficult challenges presented by the pandemic and have exacerbated safe, unsafe and unsanitary conditions. If the population continues to steadily rise, persons in custody and those who work and protect them, protect and work with them are an in an impossible situation and these troubling conditions will persevere. Our observations over the last several months have revealed four key takeaways. And while these patterns and trends are not necessarily new, again, they have been intensified by the pandemic, steadily rising jail population, and more specifically, the staffing crisis that it has engendered. DOC staff have not seen improvement in any of these areas in any facility. First, there are severe prolonged staffing shortages. DOC has reported that upwards of 35% of staff are unavailable to work with people in custody on any given day. While all areas of the jails are impacted by these current staffing shortages, board staff observed inadequate staffing ratios and restrictive housing units like ESH and Secure. Staff also state that there should be four uniform staff assigned to ESH level one units. So board staff have observed only have observed two ESH units with only one officer on post during two tours in July and August. Board staff spoke with uniform staff and learned that staff are obviously experiencing low morale and exhaustion from working triple and quadruple tours and fear for their safety in these current conditions. According to DOC data from January 1 to September 1, assaults on staff without serious injury or use of force have increased 53% from 726 in 2020 to 1,112 in 2021. For five incidents categorized as serious injury to staff in the same period. Additionally, our analysis of the incident reports show the 530% increase in still fires when compared to the first eight months of 2020 with the first eight months of 2021. During that time period in 2020, there were 179 incidents categorized as still fires, and in 2021, there were 1,178. While these fires are not always life threatening, they prevent a safety issue for people in custody and staff and are clearly a sign of distress contributing to the chaos present in some units. These incidents make the jails less safe, less safe for persons in custody as well as staff. They also lead to massive disruptions to normal process, including access to services like medical and mental health care, because they divert staff, which is already spread thin. When far too few staff are added to a steadily increasing jail population, now again, now above pre-COVID levels, the inevitable result is violence between staff and persons in custody, as well as between persons in custody. Staffing shortages and the increasing jail population are also the result of delays moving people out of intake. Every person entering the New York City jail system must first go through intake where an initial de determination about housing, medical, and mental health care are made. Intake spaces are also used to send people to court and process their return from court, as well as process transfers of people from jails, other jails in the system. It is important to note that intake facilities are not designed for extended stay. For example, they do not have beds. A person staying in overnight and intake has a choice between a stone floor or a bench. Because of the pandemic, DOC has made several changes to the physical location of the new admission process so that it has shifted among the following facilities this year, EMTC, OBCC, BCBC, and AMCC. Despite the changes in location, the same concerns persist. People in custody are spending extended periods of time in intake with limited or no access to mandated services like showers, medical care, and recreation. Furthermore, staff are not adequately trained to work in the intake areas. 
during a tour on June 24th, 2021, staff observed the intake bathroom that is used for showers and decontamination of people in custody, instead being used as a holding space for individuals and also in use of the force. The area was filthy. The board has also received several concerns from people in custody, advocates, and family members about their loved ones spending extended amounts of time in intake areas or, as they say, living in intake. The department has reported as recently as this weekend a multidisciplinary approach to managing these intake areas. The team is to include security leadership, health affairs leadership, and custody management leadership, and is charged with expeditiously moving people through the intake process. And the board will closely monitor these changes to ascertain their success. Third, there's a lack of access to mandated and other services. In June, DOC began providing some congregate services, such as religious services, barbershop, and in-person visits. Based on recent observations, review of housing area logbooks, and conversations with individual, incarcerated individuals and staff, these and other mandated services are occurring with very limited capacity, or sometimes not at all due to the staffing shortages. Or there is a deterioration in the sanitary conditions of the jails. It does not appear that proper sanitation is being maintained in the jails on a consistent basis. During recent tours, board staff, staff observed unsanitary, unsanitary conditions in many housing areas, which were dirty with garbage, ash, garbage, ashes, and feces on the floor. Additionally, some housing areas did not have adequate supply of personal hygiene items or were unable to provide access to showers due to staffing shortages. PE and cleaning supplies were also not get available in one unit on a recent tour. These conditions are unsafe for both people who live and work in these units. One heartbreaking result of these overlapping crises has been the sharp increase in self-harm incidents, results, some resulting in fatality. It seems undeniable that there is a direct link between the COVID-19 pandemic and a growing mental health crisis. And as an article in the City Illustrated this week reports of reported the incidence of self-harm spiked dramatically after the appearance of COVID-19 in the city, and that increases persistence. We believe that the dramatic increase in self-harm incidents is, as a, is a direct result of the conditions listed above, and that the surest way to alleviate these conditions is to take immediate steps to reduce the jail population. In addition to advocating for decarceration, the board will continue to conduct our strategic on-site inspections across DOC facilities to measure compliance with board minimum standards, and will continue to work with facility leadership as well as the commissioner and his executive team to highlight concerns observed during tours and aid in addressing them. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today, and I will now take any questions. Thank you. I'm gonna. Have, I have a few questions, but um, I see Councilor Holden has his hand up, so I'm gonna let him go first, and then I'll listen to my questions. Actually, I think was. Um, oh, and, and Dr. Chair Miller. Yeah, let me just. What's that? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Then I, I of course, I want to make sure Chair Miller goes, and then Councilor Holden, but I can go last. Sorry, did Dr. Cohen have testimony to provide as well? I believe so. Is he still on? Chair Powers, you can you can call on uh, Council Member Holden. Okay, that, that I think we had one more person from the board who wanted to testify. Yes. And then we'll also Councilor Holden. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. You're on mute. You may begin. Um, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Powers and Chair Miller. My name is Robert Cohen. I am a physician. I am the City Council appointee to the City Board of Correction, and I speak to you in this time of crisis and tragedy. At this time, the jails are unsafe for all the people who work there and the people who live there. It is not a moment, but an extended interval when death is stalking the people housed in the city's jails and will kill more until there is mass decarceration and an end to the current job action. The Board of Correction was not created because someone thought oversight was a good idea. It was created because of repeated crises which have plagued our jails for decades. I directed medical services for Montefiore Medical Center in the jails from 81 to 86. In the early 80s, the leading cause of death in the jail, as it is now, was suicide. The board reviewed the suicides at that time and found that they were, they were the result of a functional absence of effective mental health services. The city asked Montefiore to provide adequate services, and within a year or so, the number of suicides had dropped from 12 to zero. 
there is an epidemic of suicides in the jail today, and it has the same cause. Severely troubled individuals already identified as mentally ill, receiving inadequate or no access to mental health services, who harm themselves, hang themselves, or kill themselves by twisting their heads into food slots in clinic waiting rooms, as Tomas Carlo Camacho did on March 2nd. Last week, Dr. Ross McDonald, chief medical officer of CHS, wrote to Councilman Powers and called for help because he could not reliably provide basic clinical services. He told you that persons living in the jail were dying and would continue to die as a consequence of the chaos in the jails. I am surprised and disappointed that CHS did not bring Dr. McDonald to speak with you today about his clinical concerns. Hopefully they will. I have visited the jails in recent months investigating deaths in custody and found men who spent days in intake waiting for housing and medical ex examination. As we heard, board staff visited the jails and how found that people do not have access often to basic medical, mental health and hygiene services, and that medical staff are sometimes afraid to deliver basic medical and mental health services. Dr. McDonald has stated that the current conditions are resulting in a rapid increase in COVID-19 infection rate in the jails and that previously effective control mechanisms such as isolation and quarantine will not be possible because of the department's dysfunction and overcrowding. The reports of the Board of Correction for the past 50 years have repeatedly described crises in access to medical care, preventable deaths of seriously mentally ill person and violence. Years of litigation have confirmed that persons living in the jails are routinely subjected to unprovoked violence by staff. During the five years of the Nunia monitorship, the population steadily decreased, while the amount of unprovoked violence increased each year. The 11th Nunez report stated, quote, the pervasive level of disorder and chaos in the facilities is alarming. The conditions that gave rise to the consent judgment have not been materially ameliorated. The monitor identified the cause of the chaos. First, the poor quality of facility leadership hinders progress and must be addressed for the agency to ever become successful. Then Commissioner Brand resigned the day the 11th Nunez report was released. Yesterday's at the Board of Correction meeting, concerned citizens asked why we were not calling citing the department for mass violation of our minimum standards. They said the department was not providing minimally required medical care, mental health care. There was recreation was not available. There was no access to or limited access to courts. There was limited access to attorneys, to basic hygiene necessities, and the department was not assuring the safety of incarcerated people. All these are true. The department is and has been for months a dangerous and deadly place to live. It is a dangerous place to work. What can the board do? What can Commissioner Schiraldi do? And what can the mayor do? And what can the city council do? The Board of Correction, because we have unlimited access to the jails, must visit the facilities regularly and report our observations publicly. It is critical that all New Yorkers know what is happening and not happening in the jails today. The board has an obligation to visit each jail to write up our findings and to publish them for all to see. I don't know if this is possible, but if it is, the, this council should require us by legislation to provide this information to the people of New York during this crisis. I have known Vinnie Schiraldi for many years. He's an extraordinary leader. The actions he has taken and the programs he has announced, particularly for young adults, are the right ones for the department right now. The mayor should lead the effort to decarcerate. He should immediately release eligible persons into the 6A program, despite police commissioner Shea's stated objection. He should call on the governor to sign less is more, work with the parties to increase supervised release, encourage DAs and defenders to review all pre-sentence detainees and identify those for whom alternatives are available and for those who are medically vulnerable and are at risk from COVID, death from COVID and of course, increase case processing rates and internal processing delays. SES Johnson, who died on December, September 7th, a week ago, was incarcerated on $1 bail. DOC staff failed to take him to a scheduled court of hearing that day, and he died in AMKC. 
The mayor was the national leader in the movement for decarceration. He reduced the population. Do you, do you mind just summarizing at the end? Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, I, I I think that you ch how do you change the culture in the jail? The appointment is of the commissioner is the right direction, but crucially, we must all understand and remember that jails are intrinsically terrible and violent institutions. In the United States, they are fundamentally racist. They injure and deform everyone who lives in them and everyone who works in them. They should be as few and as small as possible. Mass decarceration, as the city did last spring, will mitigate the violence, will make everyone safer, and will shorter, shorten and end the long, terrifying season of death, which is now upon us. Thank you, Chair Silver and Power, for this opportunity to address the council. Thank you. Um, uh, I think Chair Miller said we go to members, so I'm gonna call on Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Thank you, and thank you, chairs, for allowing me to ask questions first. Um, uh, I, it seems like we're spinning our wheels, um, and and the board, you know, obviously, um, people aren't listening to to the board. Obviously, your recommendations for years and years, um, but I'm not sure um, a smaller population will fix things uh, at at, uh, at any jail. Uh, it, the, it's the management that has to, you know, change. Obviously, so. You know, I know that, for instance, there's been a huge amount of sexual assaults on female officers. So how is the board addressing that? What are the recommendations? What are the recommendations from the board on dealing with the, the fact that officers are out sick? Um, how is that being addressed? I'm hearing everything from a prisoner perspective, but I'm not hearing the, the actually the, the correction officer's plight. Because even when they work triple shifts, they don't get paid. I mean, this is total, total mismanagement. It's like we need somebody else to step in here. If the mayor is not listening to the board and the board can't solve these issues, obviously, and the city council can't, um, what's the answer? You know, a takeover by the feds? I mean, what is the answer? So we keep spinning our wheels and it's getting worse. Um, and the board seems to be kind of powerless on this. Do, do you have a, a response to at least, I don't even know if there was a, um, a survey and I didn't get an answer as to why officer, correction officers are out sick because the conditions are so horrible, right? Because it's a, it's a terrible place. We didn't have locks on, on, the, on, the, uh, on 500 jail cells. Can you believe that? That it's, gone that, it's gotten this bad. So it, it, it seems to be, uh, on all sides out of control. So I just like some response as to the sexual assaults on female officers. What's your recommendations? And what's your recommendation on trying to get these correctional officers um, better, better facilities, obviously, and, and certainly um, to have the detainees obviously get services they need. Yeah, thank you, council member. I, I mean, I, th I think this, this is a crisis. This is an all hands on deck moment. Um, and I think I think the, the conditions that our staff sees in the jails, in housing units, in intake areas across the system impact people in custody and staff alike. There is no question that they are that staff is experiencing the same awful conditions that people in custody are experiencing. Um, I'm we're certainly encouraged to hear that the department is 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 starting to investigate and and refer for prosecution incidents of, of sexual assault against female staff members, that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable in, in any workplace. Um, and and we, we, as we learn about those incidents, we will continue to raise them with the department. Um, I think to, to address the staffing crisis, again, we, you know, and I think Commissioner Chiraldi spoke to this earlier, the conditions are again. The conditions are awful for everyone, and and I think that people people need to feel safe and respected in their place of, of work, and they will they will begin coming back to work. Um, and I think I think taking a multi pronged approach, addressing the, the concerns that staff have, um, a, and addressing the, the people who are not coming to work. I mean that that impacts their colleagues. 
um, and also addressing the population with a lower population, the department will have, um, can have fewer housing areas and can deploy staff more effectively. Um, and so again, I think this is, this is, you know, everything needs to be on the table right now and everybody needs to do their part in addressing this crisis. I don't, again, I don't think there's one person or one group responsible. Um, if I could just interrupt for a second, because I, I know my, I don't want to. Her time has expired. Yes, but I just, I just want to bring up this, that did you, have you uh, done a survey or have you, did you sit down with correction officers to find out the issues that, why there's such a problem in the jails, why they, they uh, so many people are out, so many officers are out. That you have to solve one problem at a time, and if the problem is staffing, then that has to be solved first. So, what recommendation has the board made to get the officers back and to to make their lives a little, you know, easier uh, in their jobs? I mean, obviously, the mayor has to control a lot of this, but you you're the board. What recommendations have you made, other than you know, um, you have to understand the problem and have to solve that one first, because that seems to kind of you know, control everything else. There's the staffing. So if we don't have the staffing to deliver services to the detainees, the then everything starts to fall apart. So I, 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 you know, I've walked around with, uh, with, 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 with the executive director, President Basio. I've walked around the jails with, the, with, his, with his executive board. And I've talked to the, in the, this past summer, and I've talked and with council, council members as well. And I've taught and I've talked to the officers for years and years and years. Uh, and uh, I think that the that the monitor actually described the situation well. There's been terrible mismanagement of the jails for many, many years. And that has resulted in a, a crisis situ situation. However, uh, Councilman, uh, emergently, uh, un until people come back to work because they feel safe enough to come back to work, we must decrease the population because it's the only way to, to adequately protect the staff and the people who live in the jails. And that, that's why I think uh, it's not just spinning our wheels. It's a real, it's a real uh, solution. And it was the city's direction until they reversed it and increased the population. Uh, thank you. I, and I, I guess the, what I would add is, is, is on each of our tours, we speak directly to staff as well as people in custody. And we, we get there, we, so we have not, I will say we have not conducted a formal survey of staff, but we talk to them on each and every one of our tours. And, and, have, and this is part of our findings on the conditions, which we raised to facility leadership and, and to the commissioners office um, and and you know I think Dr. Cohen is right we need to we need to immediately decrease the population to take the pressure off of, of staff and and then I think Commissioner Giraldi can can address the staffing issues can address the programming issues and and the facilities will be will be safer for people in custody and staff and, and I think we also have to have officers, find out how many officers are getting the state mandated refresher courses in suicide prevention and, and CPR and so forth. I don't know if that's happening even. So I, I think, think there's I a think lot of things that are not happening. It's not yeah. happening and it has to happen. I agree with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks Councilman Roldan. Um, and, and we'll on the, on the, um, uh, around the training, I, we are going to follow up on that question as well. So appreciate it. Um, I had just a couple of questions and we'll move on to the next uh, uh, folks, but um, and I, I thank you everyone for being here for a long hearing. Um, just a quick question, it came up earlier, but has the board undertaken a preliminary death review for all the people who died in city jails in 21 and 20 to date? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And have you, have you undertaken a more extensive death review for, for those people? I know you do a preliminary and then a longer term investigation. Have you done both of those for 21? We are. We are Yes, we are starting those and, and we're actually staffing up to, to bring more um, resources to bear to conduct those investigations. Got it. And uh, are those on your website or where does somebody find the results of those? So, so the, I, because there, so 
so let me back up. So we have the preliminary report, which is a which is a report of, of that we deliver to the board in the first five days. We do not release those publicly. Um, those at that point, it's five days after the person has died. Those are preliminary uh, allegations, and of course, we want to balance the the need to to provide the public with information and respecting um, the, the, the privacy of, of grieving families. Um, and then, you know, we, we conduct longer investigations. Um, we have not released, um, I think the last report that we released was on the death of Laylene Polanco. Um, we are finalizing a couple, one or two other I can get back to you on the exact number of one or two other reports. We will, we, you know, we will release those as they are finished. Um, I gave credit, a huge amount of credit to, to Kate McMahon, our Deputy General Counsel, who leads these investigations. Um, for the last um, couple of years, she has basically been the one person investigating, and so this is why we're, we're bringing more resources to bear to speed up that process. Okay, thank you. Um, just to respect the time, I'm going to uh, end my questions there. We'll have a follow-up conversation, of course, as we do. Uh, so appreciate you guys being here, your testimony, and we'll be reviewing it and your suggestions. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and uh, so I want to say to uh, Chair Miller, did you have any questions? Sorry. Apologies. No, not, not in, I do, but as you said, in the follow-up, in, in the interest of time, I, I think that you asked all the, all the relevant questions there. Uh, certainly, um, as, as uh, Councilmember Holder said, that the, the, the boards often from a perspective of those incarcerated, and we are, uh, but rightfully so, um, the panel uh, did speak uh, from a, a more holistic and, and, and not just nuanced area that everything has to be on the table in order for us to successfully navigate our way out of this. And I'm glad to hear that the board is supportive of that and including that of the workforce and those uh, that are being housed as well. So um, I, I, I look forward to working with them in the future, but more importantly, um, this we, 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 we need to move this thing along. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. There are yep. tons of folks that voices that have yet to be heard. Yeah, I agree. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to the Bronx District Attorney, Darcel Clark. You may begin when ready. Uh, am I, uh, can you hear me? Hey, we can hear you. Thank right. you for being here. All right. I started off my comments by saying good morning, but it's good afternoon now. <laughs> it's almost good evening. Yes, well, thank you so much to uh, Council Member Keith Powell, the chair um, of the uh, Criminal Justice Committee, as, and as well as members of that committee, and to Council Member I. Danik Miller, chair, and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Um, I'm here to provide a greater perspective about my office's role in maintaining order and safety at Rikers Island. I want you to know that I have personally visited Rikers Island a few weeks ago to meet with Commissioner Sheraldi and um, his leadership team. And I also want you to know that I have an office on Rikers Island. When I took office, part of my campaign was that at the time I took office in 2016, there was a backlog of cases. There was violence at Rikers, nothing was happening. And I vowed to do more about that. So I opened the office on Rikers Island. So I, till this day, have an office open on Rikers Island where I have a, uh, assistant district attorneys there. I have investigators as well as professional staff. I've also had the opportunity to meet with correction union leadership as well, all you know, with the goal to talk about the safety and welfare of everyone who has to be on Rikers Island. First, I'd like to tell you about the level of violence that we're seeing, which I don't have to explain to you because it has been made very clear to you, what we're doing to hold people accountable and the urgency of the situation at hand. Currently, the dangerous environment and staff shortages are impacting the criminal justice system by depriving victims of justice, 
and defendants of their due process and protections for DLC staff. The inhumane conditions are denying those on Rikers Island the basic needs that the city and the nation must provide. Defendants are sitting in jail for over a year because they can't go to trial, they're not receiving much needed services amidst, amid this chaos, which in turn leads to violence, including those no, most notably the suicides that we are seeing. It is clear that something must be done and it has to be done on all levels and by all individuals to resurrect safety and security for inmates and staff at Rikers Island. The current condition is a perilous situation putting lives at risk. I wanna emphasize that we're all in this together. We're all united in our shared goal to make sure the jails are decent places and that everyone who must be there, whether you're a detainee or you're employed there, you must remain safe. My role is interlocked with the Department of Corrections and the courts. My job is to prosecute incarcerated individuals um, on their underlying Bronx cases. So those individuals who are accused of crimes um, committed in the Bronx, but I also have jurisdiction to prosecute those, um, those individuals who commit crimes on Rikers Island and in the facilities. These prosecutions move forward when the defendants are produced in court and then they need to be arraigned. And then eventually they go to trial. During my first year, like I said, I opened up the Rikers Island Prosecution Bureau to increase the speed of justice for holding defendants accountable for violence in the jail, whether that conduct was inmate on inmate or inmate on staff or contraband or, or smuggling by visitors. I have a public integrity bureau that handles crimes that are committed by DOC staff. Um, and we have some investigations open into um, three of the uh, pending suicides. Of course, the attorney general's office now has jurisdiction. So that has changed. So anything that I'm looking at happened prior to the AG taking over. Um, I lobbied the city council to fund high tech scanners utilized to intercept razor blades and, and undetected um, contraband that was coming in. And I worked with the unions very hard to get that protection for their members, as well as for the safety of the detainees. The adjustment in my office's bail policy, along with criminal justice reform, led to fewer defendants incarcerated. Then we worked with the city to address the impact of COVID-19 at Rikers to address, uh, which led to the release of many defendants as possible who would not pose a substantial risk to public safety. We never stopped working with the defense bar in the Bronx to identify detainees for release or disposition to get them off of Rikers Island. The population of the Bronx defendants fell to 700 in the fall of 2020. But as of September 11th, there are 11, so over 1,100 Bronx defendants in DOC custody. The population has been steadily increasing since 2020 due to the surge of violence within the Bronx. Defendants at Rikers are largely accused of serious crimes such as murder, attempted murder, shootings, rape, domestic violence, child abuse, et cetera. While this population is smaller than historical numbers, it will be more, it's, it's a more volatile population. And if, con if conditions persist that are unsanitary, unsafe, and with an inadequate supervision and without lack and lacking repercussions for people that commit violence, the situation will become even more dire. Since grand juries reconvened in March of 2021, the Rikers Island Prosecution Bureau has indicted 45 cases involving assaults on staff as well as assaults on detainees on detainees. One particularly cruel act occurred when seven inmates overwhelmed an officer, then stomped and punched another detainee while defendant poured boiling water on the victim, causing the skin, um, causing skin on the face, head and arms to burn away. Fortunately, the victim survived and so did the officer and they are recovering. 
We currently have 328 open investigations involving assaults on staff. And we're prosecuting violent cases for beatings, slashings, and rape. No one, and I repeat, no one should be subject to degradation, harm, or fear if they, if they um, have to be detained at Rikers or they have to work there. But regardless of how many cases we pursue, we cannot prosecute our way out of this. The district attorney and prosecution should be the last resort and not the first to prevent violence and to keep the jail safe. Mayor de Blasio announced a few measures yesterday and it's a start. Increasing staffing levels is crucial to stabilizing Rikers. Opening more intake centers is a critical step as well. Previously, there were intake centers in each borough. A month ago, all new intakes were funneled into one intake center at OBBC. And OBBC was, is not built to handle this influx of that many intake cases and, and due to staffing issues and medical clearance and COVID issues, it's just not able to handle that. And there lies the problems that we are seeing right now, the, the things that those who went to, to the jail recently saw. Yet and still new, new detainees must appear in court within six days. And unfortunately, OB, OBCC has not been able to produce defendants for this quick turnaround in many instances. There's homicide cases where defendants are not produced for court appearances. There's, there's defendants that are not produced for all kinds of appearances now because of the staffing um, issue. We have inmates indicted for violence while in jail who are not being produced for arraignment in a timely manner. I, I announced an indictment on several cases that have been happening recently of the violence and the Department of Corrections could not even get those individuals to court for them to be arraigned for the process to continue on those cases. Um, we have to, of course, work with the courts. We have to increase the court capacity. There's no other way to do this. We have been held up in processing and going to trial and eventually getting people off island because the courts are not at 100% capacity. Right now, we're only being able to try three cases at a time. That's simply not enough. We're two, the, we're two backlogs. These trials are very serious. People are being hurt. Staff are being hurt. Inmates are being hurt. We have to do better and we can do more. But the, the courts opening up will actually help this in a number of ways. The less is more legislation, which I have publicly supported, releasing parolees who are jailed for curfew or other administrative violations will help and, and they should be released. Less is more should be signed by the governor. I totally support that. And I believe it would be some 400 individuals that would be released right now if less is more was in effect. Also, there's a number of the inmates there who have been convicted and are due to go to state prison and they are still being held at Rikers Island. But again, because of staffing and other things have not been uh, sent upstate. If we were able to remove those, that's another, I believe, close to 400 individuals that would be removed from Rikers Island. Anything that we can do to, to decrease the population is important. And like I said, I am working every day with the defense bar. We constantly look through the, the people that are there to see that those who don't need to be there should be released. Also, there needs to be administrative tools that are swift and certain punishment after a violent incident. DOC and the Board of Corrections must come up with a plan to address these gradual sanctions that would help the officers and give them the tools that they need to maintain order in the jails. Because again, prosecution must be the last resort. I will continue to do all I can to fulfill my duty, but there must be, and we're starting this, an immediate plan involving all stakeholders to restore sustainable conditions at Rikers. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation is urgent, is life-threatening, and is unconscionable. We cannot afford to wait for another incident. We must act now. And at this time, I'll take any questions there, maybe.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I had a couple of questions. You answered some of them, but I was going to just to turn to Chair Miller uh, as a starting point to get any questions. I uh, appreciate the testimony. No, I, uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam DA. It's always a pleasure. And, and, you, and, and, and um, with the facts as usual, thank you for that. Um, but, but just, just you know, as, as you depart specifically, is there anything, anything that you would prioritize from the council perspective and the perspective of the other uh, stakeholders that are involved here today that, that we can do um, as a priority? And then what can we do? What, what, what is the low hanging fruit that we can manage now? And, and I know you laid out a few things. All right, definitely the low hanging fruit, uh, get the state set, the prisoners that are sentenced to state prison or other places need to be removed. People that are supposed to be moved to be extradited to different states, get them out of there. Anybody who has a waiting sentence or been sentenced, have that, have that happen so that they can move on to the state um, facilities. That should, that should happen. Um, I think that we, um, we need to get the courts open. We have to work with the courts. And, and listen, I've been sitting down with the city with the, the Commissioner Sheraldi has sat down with me. We're all in this together. There's a priority list of those individuals that are causing some of the violence. And it's not every detainee. Most of them are, are decent people that deserve to be treated humanely. And I, as a district attorney, am telling you that they should be treated humanely. Some people may think that the DA doesn't care that long as they're in jail, I don't care. I don't think that. These are my constituents, just like they're your constituents. And they deserve to be treated with respect and they deserve to be treated humanely. We need to move the processing you know, more so that we can get more trials happening, more hearings so that these people, their, their cases can be adjudicated. So the detain, detainees, because they haven't been convicted of anything yet, as, as I think uh, um, it was mentioned, they haven't been convicted of anything. So they need to have their day in court. The victims need to have their day in court. So the process has to move on in order for us to be able to remove them from Rikers Island. And then we need to equip the staff so that they can be safe. They should not have to depend on the Bronx DA to, to prosecute somebody who harms them while they're working on their job. My, this process takes a long time. You see the detainees are waiting for their day in court. Well, so will the officers and the DOC staff, even when I indict them because we can't, the cases are not being processed fast enough. Look, we're coming out of a horrible pandemic. There's a backlog, there's a lot of things, but we can prioritize those cases that need to go through. The mayor has indicated there's some 500 cases that are over a year old. Let's prior, prioritize those and start getting those moving and um, we'll be able to see you know, some progress. But also you gotta give those officers some kind of sanctions that they can deal with when these things happen, swift and certain that they can deal with it and they don't have to wait for me to investigate and indict and prosecute and then they go to trial. That is not gonna solve the problem nor will it make it any more safe. So I think that's some of the things that, that I would prioritize. But I think everybody should sit down, all the stakeholders, and we really build a strategic plan on how to get this situation under control. Thank you, uh, Madam DA, for, for, for that comprehensive assessment from, for all that we all collectively need to do, all the stakeholders involved in here. And I certainly concur uh, that, that this is not mutually exclusive, that that the staff and, and those that are being detained there are equally suffering because of these conditions. And there are, you know, there's a plethora of reasons why they exist, but we are here to kind of figure that out. And obviously that this is the impact, impacting, you know, black and brown communities uh, overwhelmingly. I also want to say unequivocally that, that government has a responsibility to lead. And, and we, there's been a lot of conversation uh, about availability of the DOC em employees and, and, and many of my colleagues and others, we're not working. There are agencies around the city that, that, that you can pick up the phone and can't get through to anybody. Um, there are, you know, but yet our expectations of the men and women uh, of, of that, that, that are performing these tasks at Rikers Island that 
not only can they work their tour, they can work a second tour and they can work a third tour and that's okay. And yet we that are supposed to be setting the example, we're sitting at home and our offices may or may not be open. And, that's and those an offices and DOC staff never got off. Although many of us for COVID were able to work remotely, their job can't be done remotely. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, and, 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 and we have to deal with that accordingly. And so uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank you for your insight and, and your commitment uh, to mitigating the circumstances that we see on Rikers Island and for whatever role that you can play. And I know that you will be at the table when we convene once again. Uh, so um, Chip Powers, uh, I, I'm sure I, I don't see any, oh, uh, Council Member Adams has her, uh, our Chair of Public Safety has her hand raised. Council Member? Thank you so much, uh, co-chairs. Thank you, D.A. Clark, for your testimony thus far. Uh, always good to hear you. You always bring it. And um, I, I'm, my, my question basically is in line with the questions that I asked earlier today having to do with, um, you know, the sexual assaults of uh, female officers on Rikers Island. You mentioned 328 open investigations of staff. How many of those are sexual assault cases? Um, I, I can tell, I have the, um, I have some of the numbers that we've had over the last three years as to what we've pros what we've prosecuted. Uh, the, no I have to get back to you on how many of the number of the 328 are um, sexual assault. Let me, let me check that. But I know that in the, the recent um, cases that I um, indicted at some 37 cases, how many, three of them were for um, sexual um, assaults or sexual uh, misconduct against um, um, staff. So for 2021, I have inmate on inmate sexual assault allegations. I, I've had two staff on inmate, um, none inmate on staff, six of them that we've done um, so far this year. Um, last year, inmate on staff, another six. And um, in 2019, I, I don't have that number. So when we get them, we are doing them. We have to investigate. Unfortunately, the pandemic put the stop to a lot of things because even if we had investigated and it was ready to, let's say, go to a grand jury or whatever, everything was on pause. So now there's such a backlog that DA's offices now, or at least I am, having to prioritize which cases go forward. But I absolutely take serious any sexual assault cases on um, DOC staff members. I have uh, my Rikers Island Prosecution Bureau does those prosecutions. They confer with my um, Sex Crimes Bureau as well, and we confer with our Crime Victims Assistance Unit for any member of DOC staff or anyone who needs any type of advocacy or therapy that we're able to give them the services that they need while we continue to investigate the case. Thank you, Dear Clark. My final question, just one more, has to do with exactly what you said, uh, your history um, and knowing about these in instances in your estimation, does the occurrence of detainee on officer uh, assault happen more frequently than in the reverse? Member time has expired. Um, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know if I could really speak to that because it depends on the year. It depends on the. It depends on the circumstance. But it 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 does exist. So it's not like it's non-existent. It does exist, and we take each of them seriously. I've had some very serious inmate on inmate sexual assault cases as well that I've indicted, and even people have actually pled guilty to. So it, it's a problem. It's something, I, I cannot say that it's non-existent. I'm not going to say it's a, you know, it's an extreme problem. It's something that's, it's a problem that's a problem. And it's that important. So whether it's one or a million, it's serious enough that it should be um, handled. And we're doing all that we can to make sure we pay attention to it. And that members of the Department of Corrections should know that anytime they can reach out to me because I do take it seriously and will investigate. Thank you, D.A. Clark. I will go on the record by saying it is an extreme issue. Um, uh, it most certainly is. And again, um, from my perspective, it's one that does not get nearly as much spotlight and attention as it should. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, District Attorney. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for your patience waiting for us. And uh, appreciate your work. Thank and you. Just for time, so we'll keep moving. Thanks so much. Thank you. We will now turn to testimony from a number of state elected officials. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and will also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would like to now welcome Assembly Member Kenny Burgess to testify, followed by Senator Alessandra Biagi, followed by Assembly Member Emily Gallagher. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Powers and Miller and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm Assemblyman Kenny Burgos, representing the 85th District in the Bronx, which includes Rikers Island. To call Rikers Island Horror Island is an understatement. Since taking office, I've visited on multiple occasions, and each time has been more gut-wrenching and more grim than the last. As my colleagues can attest, the conditions that both detained individuals and correction officers face are an ever-deteriorating human rights catastrophe that is just short of a concentration camp, of which every person who crosses that 4,200-foot bridge becomes its prisoner. Never mind that close to 85% of detainees are simply awaiting trial or intake, or that 89% are black and brown New Yorkers, or that nearly 50% are suffering mental health crises, or that the rate of self-harm in city jails is the highest in five years, or that correction officers are stretched their physical and emotional limits working triple or quadruple shifts as the jail population has swelled to well over 6,000 people. These are our constituents, our neighbors, our family and friends. We wouldn't allow animals to live in these conditions, yet we allow human beings to live in abject squalor, many without access to showers, toothbrushes, or toilets, with 25 people to a room, urinating and defecating in bags, no access to air or sunlight, using sandwiches as pillows to eke out some semblance of comfort in this hellish environment. 10 individuals have died already this year on Rikers Island, and what's even more tragic in these deaths is that death itself feels like the only escape from these conditions. This is on us. This is on the leadership of our city and state. This is an administrative policy problem, and it's on us to solve it now. Isaiah Johnson is on the mayor, an administration who hasn't even visited Rikers in over four years and has seemingly written it off. Brandon Rodriguez is on the governor, who hasn't signed and implemented the Less Is More Act. Thomas Bronson is on you, the city council, who has the power to reshape the city's correctional system. Richard Blake is on the court system that is slow to a halt in swiftly hearing cases. Jose Mejia Martinez is on us, the state legislature, for not doing enough to hold leadership accountable. Thomas Carlo, Javier Velasco, Michael Tyson, Segundo Goyapa, Juan Cruz, Raymond Rivera, Walter Ange, Ladine Polanco, Khalees Browder, and countless others are on all of us until we solve this crisis in our jails once and for all. Time has expired. The only solution to end mass incarceration, and we must act now before we lose another human life. Thank you. Now we will hear from Senator Alessandra Biagi, followed by Assemblymember Emily Gallagher, followed by Assemblymember Soran Mamdani. Time starts now. Thank you very much, um, Chair Powers and the members of the committee for allowing me to provide my testimony today. My name is Alessandra Biaggi and I represent Rikers Island in the 34th State Senate District, um, which also includes parts of additional areas in the Bronx and Westchester County. Um, my visit to Rikers this past Monday was horrifying beyond, beyond the word that I can even share with you now. Um, I've actually really been struggling to find words that I can use to even describe what my eyes saw. Um, I witnessed inhumane conditions um, that, I, that I have never seen before. Um, never ending piles of garbage and feces covering the floor. Water bugs and lice um, that have been biting at the skin of the incarcerated individuals who picked up their pants to show us their legs, um, where it looked as if they had chicken pox, but they were actually all of the bugs that had bitten them. Clorox bleach that had been 
not only poured on the walls and the floors, but also were on the skin of the incarcerated. Um, people locked in solitary confinement in very narrow shower stalls um, amidst their own feces because many of the cell doors are broken. In fact, 500 of the cell doors are broken. Um, in addition to the fact that those in those solitary cells don't have running water, um, many are actually not even able to see the sunlight. Um, incarcerated individuals who are given two and a half ounces of water, barely any food, no medical treatment for conditions like diabetes, psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia, and HIV. Um, many have become so hopeless that choosing to end their life is really deemed a better option than remaining in, in Rikers Island for another day. The conditions are hellish, um, and frankly, if any other country in this engaged in this inhumane treatment against their own people, I believe that the United States and New York State and all of us would be the first to call it out. And yet we are here denying our fellow community members the most basic dignity which all human beings deserve. In fact, in addition to what I mentioned above, many are not able to even call their loved ones they mentioned to us, many of them have mentioned to us that they, their loved ones don't even know that they're there and that they have not been able to be in touch with their attorneys. Um, Time has expired. Um, I believe that Rikers Island and the safety of all inside are jeopardized. Um, many constitutional rights are also being violated. There are many things we can do. I will happily reiterate that publicly. Thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, Senator. Thanks for being here and testifying. Yeah. Next, we'll hear from Assemblymember Gallagher, followed by Assemblymember Zoran Mamdani, followed by Senator Jessica Ramos. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Gallagher, and I'm an Assembly Member from Brooklyn. I visited OBCC this past Monday. DOC and the mayor's office is trying to tell us that less is more alone will change the conditions in Rikers, will decarcerate jails and make them safe. That's not true. One tool is less is more to decarcerate, and it must be signed and implemented immediately, but it alone is not enough. The mayor must release hundreds of people under 6A, and the biggest change must be the ending cash bail. These tools must be used in tandem immediately. I spoke with a 20-year-old named Ishmael Dowling Jr. who is trapped in OBCC on a parole violation. He has been constantly moved around OBCC since August 18th, 2021. His sink and toilet were broken and he was begging for water and defecating in a bag. He did not receive his commissary and he did not have a mattress or any bedding. He asked me to call his mother Belinda who, because he could not contact her for the last week. Belinda told me that Ishmael has sickle cell anemia and has struggled with illness his entire life. He was diagnosed with COVID in OBCC from a shared cell, but was not told. The health department instead delivered the results to his mother, who was unable to contact her son. Despite being diagnosed with COVID, he had no regular access to water, no health monitoring outside of a daily pulse check, and no aspirin. Belinda told me he has not had a mattress since he arrived in August. Belinda has been trying to contact jail representatives representative to help her and has not been responded to at all. Emails, phone calls, and 311 complaints have not been responded to. She and her son are at their wit's end, and that's only two of the thousands of people impacted by this experience. Let me be clear, cash bail is the single biggest driver of the crisis on Rikers. Thousands of people are being held simply because they cannot buy their freedom. This crisis and these deaths are on the DAs who seek bail and the judges who set it. They must immediately end bail practices. They must not oppose writs brought forward by defense attorneys seeking the release of people held in these torturous conditions on Rikers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambert. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Assemblymember Zoran Mandami, as well as Senator Jessica Ramos. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. My name is Assemblymember Zoran Mandani. I've been sitting through this hearing for four hours, and I am just as furious as I was when I logged on this morning. And that's because Person after person is speaking about this issue as if the solution is external to them, and it's the other department, and it's the other executive, and it's the other office that can take action here. We just listened to the DA from the Bronx saying that most people in Rikers should be treated humanely. 
Every single person on Rikers has to be treated humanely. And DA Clark's office continues to request bail on nonviolent offenses, sometimes even putting bail above $100,000. So it's ridiculous that we have people saying that this is a crisis, we have to take action, but not for me. We have the mayor's office not entertaining the possibility of 6A. And I do not care if it's just 60 or 65 people you think are eligible. 10 people have died this year. And if we save 65 people from death, it's worth it. And we have voted for less is more. We are calling on the governor to sign less is more into action. But as Emily said, and as Alessandra said, as so many others have said, we have to pursue every single thing that we have available to us. And at its core, this crisis is about decarceration. We cannot hire our way out of this crisis. And it is just... We talk about people who are on Rikers. We say that these are people for serious crimes, for murder, for assault. What we are doing here in this moment is allowing state-sanctioned murder. 10 people have died. I spoke to someone who tried to take his own life two weeks ago. More people will die the longer we do not do anything. To my colleagues in the city council, I plead, I beg of you to visit Rikers. You can do it on any single day. I am going to go back. All we can do, everything that is in our power, we must use it because we have brutality in its most banal forms where we have medication that is not being given out to people. If you're HIV positive and you miss your medication for HIV, then that drug ceases to be effective. And Time has expired. I apologize, Sergeant Perez, but I'm going to go on for a little bit because I've listened for four hours. Right. I understand, but we have a lot of folks here too, Assembly Member. I, I will certainly grant you an opportunity to finish your testimony, but I understand and I think I said you can finish your testimony. Thank you, Chair Powers. It's just to make the case that there are many different ways to deal with this. We have to do every single one of them. These are people dying. Their blood is on our hands. The number one thing that can be done is to stop requesting bail, to stop opposing the defense's writ motions, to release people on bail, and for all of us to do all that we can in our power to highlight this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Everett. I, I appreciate all of you folks being here for a very, very long time. I, I know it's a uh, much to wait and to uh, I have an opportunity to weigh in. Thank, appreciate you, your uh, patience in being here. Next, we'll hear from Senator Jessica Ramos. Time starts now. All right. Well, uh, thank you to the chairs and to all of the committee members present. My name is Jessica Ramos. I represent the 13th district uh, in the New York State Senate, which includes Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, and parts of Astoria, uh, Elmhurst, and Woodside. Um, you've all been listening our accounts of our visit uh, earlier this week. Uh, there's reports of chronic staff absenteeism, incarcerated individuals languishing in intake, self-harm, and more. Um, what we witnessed was really uh, nothing we could have possibly prepared ourselves for. Um, there were about a dozen uh, men that we saw packed into small cells with no beds. Uh, they're being deprived of food, water, uh, showers, and medical attention. I met one transgender woman who had been misgendered and assigned to male housing and abused. Another individual with HIV hadn't received his medicine in over a week and was housed with other men who contracted COVID-19. A few diabetics had not had their sugar checked in many days, and a handful of men I met had been unable to access the methadone clinic. I met a man who admitted he began cutting himself just so that he had open wounds that would get him to medics and maybe he'd actually be given the medicine to treat his mental illness. I met another man who told me that he suffers from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but had not received medication in weeks. Assembly member Jessica Gonzalez Rojas and I even witnessed the man try to take his own life before our very eyes. He had tied a blanket at the top of the bars and made a noose um, and stepped up as he uh, put the noose around his own neck and jumped. Luckily, it didn't work. Um, but there are images, sounds, and smells we're likely never going to forget. 
The violations of human rights taking place in, Rik in Rikers Island are rampant. The population on Rikers is largely comprised of people who have not been convicted of crimes they've been accused of. We're talking about people who are too, post too poor to post bail, which is why we're asking for cash bail to be eliminated. Time has expired. I have a lot more to say, but in just, I, you know, it, it's really unconscionable uh, that we're allowing this to happen. I, I didn't get to this part, but I chair the Labor Committee. Um, I did want to speak up for the correction officers who, de who deserve to work in under safe conditions. Um, and I, I want to pitch, of course, my own bills, both the treatment, not jails bill, and I, I carry the bill in order to do with, away with triple shifts uh, in, in our jails. These are things that we must pass immediately, as, as well as have the governor sign uh, the less is more bill. But please, we have to refuse to be complicit in the system, each and every one of us. We cannot shame on us for perpetuating this violence because it's cyclical. And we can't continue pretend to pretend that anyone in this prison, prison industrial complex is being rehabilitated or being corrected by any means. This isn't making any of us any safer. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for sharing your stories. I, I did see your comments, press conference too, about that situation. Appreciate you being here today. Um, did either of the chairs or any members have questions for this panel? I don't see any hands raised. No, I just want to thank them all for being here. I know that uh, it was a, um, uh, an important visit to go at this moment. And I know uh, some, of the, some of the folks who organized it are here today and appreciate them. And I want to say uh, the comments here are, are, are correct, that uh, it's at, at the city level with the mayor's office, like we were all very disappointed to hear that they would have taken the single action that was in their power to help lower the population here. We had the Less Is More Act, which I know many folks on this hearing uh, worked very hard to support, uh, sitting on the desk. And I, obviously, we all together have to make sure that gets signed into law immediately. And, and, and want to work with the folks there. And again, uh, the visit that the folks are talking about is exactly why the public advocate and myself and others have said it's important that the first person running the city of New York City is out there as well. And we're not, we're not going years without uh, uh, stepping in front of like many of us do often and ongoing. So um, I want to just thank the, uh, those who uh, spent the time here today because they, they didn't have to be here. They didn't have to go in there as well, but they're doing their duties as representatives of Rikers, uh, others as well. And we will be following up with all of them to talk about ways we can uh, further uh, work on lowering the population, addressing the issues inside the jails, working on city and state legislation uh, together to address those. And we want to thank them all for being here today. And thank you for your long wait as well. I, I certainly concur with, with Chair Powers. I want to thank my colleagues in, in the state government um, for the work that they're doing in the state to 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 mitigate these inhumane uh, conditions that we find on Rikers Island, uh, working for the detainees and, and the men and women that are there to serve and protect them. Uh, and we look forward to working collaboratively with you all in the future. Certainly, um, uh, uh, Councilmember Powers, Chair Powers, let's please, if we can facilitate something that we can all get together, uh, our bodies in, in the near, near future, to, to work collaboratively uh, to make something happen. Let, let's do that. Um, we got to get all stakeholders together, but your commitment um, is, is, is beyond reproach and, and, and it, it precedes you all, at all times and, and, and part of the work that my colleagues are doing in their body as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. We will now turn to testimony from a number of relevant labor unions. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and will also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. First, we'll hear from Benny Bostro, followed by Patrick Ferreuolo, followed by Joseph Feramoska. Time starts now. Please allow me extra time. Good afternoon, Chairman Powers, Chairman Miller, and the members of your committees. My name is Benny Basio Jr. and I'm the president of the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, the second largest law enforcement union in the city of New York. 
Our members, as you know, provide care, custody, and control of approximately 6,000 inmates daily. Today's hearing focuses on the horrific conditions in our city's jails. With the limited time I have, I want your committees to the, and the public to understand how the conditions in our jails have deteriorated. Who, was, who has been responsible for this deterioration? And to reaffirm the changes COBA has been calling for over the past year. But before I begin, it must be said that this is not the first time I've testified before you, Mr. Powers, and your committee. In fact, I raised the very same issues before in hearings you held in December of last year and in March of this year. Since that time, you have not reached out once to offer any support to our members. We were also made aware of the fact that you recently held a private meeting between various city agencies to discuss the absolute emergency facing Rikers Island, as you described it to the New York Times. Why was COBA, one of the biggest stakeholders in the city's jail system, not invited to that meeting? So how did we get to the dire conditions of our jails, uh, our jails currently face? Let's start with jail violence. In 2016, when Mayor de Blasio unilaterally ended punitive segregation for inmates 21 and under, we saw a major spike in violence. In fact, jail violence has risen every year for the past eight years, including inmate on inmate violence, stabbings and slashings, and assaults on correction officers, which rose 23% over the past year, and we believe that percentage is actually more. Despite the increased violence, Mayor de Blasio and other progressive politicians decided to give out Game Boys and hold pizza parties for inmates while seeking to end punitive segregation completely. Without our ability to separate violent inmates from the general population, repeat, of, repeat violent offenders continue to terrorize nonviolent inmates and correction officers with impunity. Time has expired. There is a Rikers Island Prosecution Bureau physically located on Rikers Island. The Bronx DA has repeatedly declined to prosecute many cases involving stabbings and slashings, sexual assaults against female correction officers, and other violent felonies committed against correction officers. In fact, the Bronx District Attorney's Office has the highest number of felony cases that were not prosecuted last year. So here we have two major failures in our criminal justice system, a failure to hold inmates accountable for their violent crimes committed behind bars, and a failure to provide us with the ability to separate violent offenders from the general population. A third major failure of our criminal justice system emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic. 1,800 officers contracted the virus with nine officers tragically succumbing to it. At the height of the pandemic, the officers were first to work triple shifts. At one time, almost 3,000 officers were out because of the DOC failure to provide us with PPE. COBA filed a lawsuit over the triple shifts, and on April 24, 2020, Mayor de Blasio said, quote, triple shifts were a dumb managerial mistake, and they will never happen again. Fast forward to today, and now the entire world knows what COBA has been saying for over a year. Triple shifts and even quadruple shifts are happening every day. When an officer is on a shift, he or she is not afforded breaks for meal, breaks to use the bathroom, or even breaks to seek medical attention. It's nothing short of inhumane. Since February 2019, Mayor de Blasio yeah, yeah. and his administration, and even this city yeah. council, watched the inmate population rise, the numbers without our, our workforce dwindle. Yeah. In fact, just one year, the inmate population has nearly doubled from 3,400 to 6,000. Our workforce sh has shrunk from over 9,000 officers to 7,600 today. Much of that reduction was the result of nearly 1,300 resignations on top of retirements. In my 22 years as a correction officer, I have never seen so many officers leaving their jobs after just a few years because of the horrific conditions in our jails. We Time has expired. For the staffing crisis, yet Mayor de Blasio hasn't hired new class of officers since February 2019. Even with the department's promise to hire 600 more officers this fall, they won't enter the jails until January, likely to lose 600 officers between now and then. If your committees are truly interested in improving the conditions in our jails, then it's time for once to listen to the boots on the ground. 
fix the staffing crisis by fixing the humanitarian crisis, make our jails safer for everyone by holding assaulted inmates accountable for their attacks on our members and other inmates, demand the Bronx DA's prosecution of felony crimes committed on Rikers Island, allow us to separate violent offenders from the general population and demand that either this administration or the next administration hire the 2000 officers needed to relieve officers working 25 plus hours right now. We didn't create this series of systemic failures that have created these dire conditions and we damn sure didn't turn a blind eye while they were unfolding. We continue to do our jobs in an impossible environment every day. All we're asking is that you do your jobs and give us the support and resources we need immediately to make our jails safer for everyone. With that said, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and I appreciate you giving me the extra time. I, I, I'm going to, Kevin Mayor, if, if I may, I, I got a couple of comments directed at me at the beginning list. So I'd like to respond to, uh, to Mr. Basio. As a starting point, I did have an all hands on meeting last week with all the agencies. I didn't invite every stakeholder in the city of New York. This was about getting accountability on the agency's issues. You were talking about staffing, about releases, about all these other issues because of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, I, I take issue to the allegation that we're not inviting you to that meeting because that meeting was for the city agencies that are responsible for the jail and the city council. I, was, I, I do want to go to another issue. You have a 21% sick rate right now, 1,789 members who are called in sick today. Undoubtedly, that is contributing to triple shifts and double shifts. You have opposed the mayor's and the DOC's policy, from what I can tell, to change the way that we handle sick policy. We have 100 individuals today who are AWOL, not showing up to work, 98 according to their stats that they reported earlier. Why would we need to hire more officers when we have 17, 1,789, I mean, and they are hiring more officers, but of course. 1,700 individuals, to almost 1,800 individuals, 22% of the population of our staff who have not shown up to work and are calling in sick. Are, so let me start this, let me start here. Do you believe that 1,800 individuals are sick today and calling in sick because they have an illness? Yes. We have you correction do? officers that are suffering from major injuries from these assaults by inmates. We have okay. officers recovering from uh, long-term effects of COVID-19. And, and to add that, this new sick leave, sick leave policy isn't working because it's, it's forcing officers to be out sick longer than they need to be. An example of that is a correction officer called in sick for one day on September 7th, and they have to report to Mount Sinai, right? But Mount Sinai didn't have an appointment available until September 10th. Now I'm forced to be out more sick days than I intended to be out. So this policy isn't working because Mount Sinai isn't giving us an appointment within 24 hours. So now you lost a correction officer for four days. So this is contributing to the sick leave policy. And if you're working 25 plus hours a day without meal breaks, right? Who's expected to be on their best? They're exhausted. Officers are, are physically and mentally exhausted. Let me ask you a question, Keith Powers. If you were forced to work that many hours without being afforded a meal, would you, and not, and not to add insult to injury, my officers are not getting paid their proper amount of overtime being worked. So this has turned into like modern day slavery. You're forcing me to work 25, 30 hours a day with no breaks. And then when it comes time to pay me for my overtime work, I'm not being paid. So you tell me why your officers are not coming to work. You, you said they're sick. And now I, you're just told you, not, I just told you I'm a numerous you, amount of reasons why my because, office is because, here, because here's why. Here's why. Because when we have had conversations about, and we have, with, with your representative, about triple shifts and double shifts and even quadruple shifts, which are unacceptable, there are people that are calling in sick that seem to be doing it inappropriately and taking advantage of a sick policy and leaving your other members with it working triple shifts. How do you know Nobody that? should accept that. How do that you should know not that? Be, do you, did they give you a physical count? That's an unprecedented level of sick leave 
for any city agency in America or any imagine it. It is an unprecedented amount of sick leave. No it other is, city agency is working as many hours as we are in these okay. deplorable conditions the that every legislator just told you about. Not you every city the same agency policy is working that the under FDNY those conditions. And the NYPD Chairman Powers, for sick leave. They haven't hired in three years, Chairman Powers. Correction right. officers haven't been hired in three years and over 1,300 resignations because of the deplorable conditions, inhumane, that every legislator just got on here and told you about our reality every day. They came one day. Nice. I'm grateful to everybody that came. The mayor hasn't been there in four years, right? Yeah, these, I, these agree I agree with you. I agree Conditions that we are under every day. So I'm glad that everybody came because this lesson, less is more great. That's great. But this is our reality every day. And I know everybody came for a nice photo op and to get on the press conference. That's great. But come on, okay, this so is our let me reality ask, every day, sir. What, what, let me ask you a question. There's 98 individuals who are AWOL today. I'm asking you honestly, what, what should the city be doing for individuals who go AWOL? Well, look, we have a lot of single parents on this job, right? So just to be clear about why some there are some AWOLs, right? If I call the job because I have a personal emergency, right? Because I have a child that I have to take to the emergency room, for example. If the tour commander denies my personal emergency, I am now AWOL. And if I'm a single parent and I have to take my child to the emergency room, the next day I'm supposed to show documentation proving my personal emergency but I'm still considered AWOL at that point. If I'm working 24 hours straight, when I come off tour, I'm technically supposed to be starting my second tour. Guess what? I'm not gonna be able to work that second day because I'm getting off after working 24 hours straight. This is what is contributing to AWOLs. I, okay, my question, okay, so let me ask you a different question. At, at what point, I'm, I'm, this is not like, I'm, this is a serious question because, you know, I, what is the point or how many AWOLs do you believe in an individual before there should be serious disciplinary action for somebody not we, showing up? We have, we have policy in place for disciplinary action for officers that are AWOL, right? We, they, they're handled at the command level, not suspensions for 30 days. Four days are handled in the command level as informal charges. Now you want to charge, the example I just gave you of the, of the single parent right? Because the, the tour commander denied my, my personal emergency. I'll now be in the street for 30 days based on what the commissioner and the mayor wants to do. And guess what? That's going to contribute to more uh, triple and quadruple shifts. So, so how are you fixing the problem, right? Clean, make our jail safe. Clean up the deplorable conditions. Give us the amount of offices that we need to backfill because we're recovering from these injuries. Re re restock um, our emergency service unit to handle the violence. You know, this is fix broken cells. Like they told us it's going to take 12 months to fix broken cells on Rikers Island. It's because you guys don't want to fix Rikers Island. That's the reality. This is years of neglect. Chairman Powers, years of neglect. You guys don't, you, this is the city of New York. We build bridges, tunnels, skyscrapers. You can't get a maintenance team to go fix the cells so that everybody on Rikers is safe, including inmates. Inmates are not receiving their minimum standards because we don't have the staff to take them to the clinic and law library and all the other um, programs that they're entitled to get. That's why we need more correction officers so that inmates could get everything they're entitled to get. And right now they're suffering and we're suffering as well. And what have you done? Every time I come here to ask for your help, I asked for the city council's help. I met with senators. I met with Senator Salazar talking about um, four months ago about the triple and quadruple shifts. Get yeah, she came because less is more because they want to let more inmates out into the into New York City. I, I, I just I, let me let's, let me bet. I, I, I'm gonna this is gonna be my last comment, and I'll hand it over to Chair Miller. I think you are seriously failing to acknowledge absenteeism, right? That's happening right now in our city jail. That's contributing more to those problems. The mayor and their team have put out a plan. They have tried to acknowledge that the uh, uh, that there they need more officers here. That's obviously something people have argued against. But there is 1,789 people, it's 22%. And when you add everything else, it gets to 32% of individuals who are not eligible today to, or, or aren't available to work today. 
I think you, I, I, I hear it. I, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Chair Miller now. I think you're really failing to acknowledge that, and that is contributing to a, a large uh, increase in triple shift and other issues, too. And I think if you want to, I, I, I hear you on the other issues around, around the conditions, but I do think that is a problem that is glaring and staring at us right now in the face. And it's not being acknowledged. So I, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chair Miller. And you're, you're, you're failing. You're failing to acknowledge the uh, amount of assaults on, our, on my members. Can, can, How many can, times we've been assaulted and the broken bones and the injuries we're recovering can, to? Furthermore, can, you're failing to for, hold the DOC okay, accountable. Okay, I appreciate it, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Powers. Uh, before I know, and I know we have some others that that want to get to us. I'm going to be very uh, uh, very brief in, in my line of questioning here. And I did want to talk to you about seeing that AWOL is a specific problem, just the nuances of it, and, and you did express some of it. Um, 30 days, a lot of the things that, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the time and attendance issues, including the AWOL, are already addressed in collective bargaining agreement. Is that correct? Yes. And then and then if 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 there is changes uh, to um, the, if there if, if there are specific concerns that or crises, emergencies that that cause a change in policy or the policy or the collective policy of collective bargaining is superseded, then uh, it is then subject to impact bargaining, right? Because it then changes the terms and conditions of employment. Correct, and they fail to bargain with us in terms of this sick leave policy. So, so I, I it, it, in my experience, prior, prior to, prior, and, and I know you're new, at, at the fairly new at the position, has there been negotiation around sick leave policy with COBA over the past two years? No, no, they're basically shoving everything down our throat. The same thing about this emergency plan with the mayor. We didn't even, we weren't even given a heads up about it. We found out after his announcement. This, so, is, how they, this is how they do business with labor in New York City now. Okay, so so it just, just uh, and then secondly, um, has there been a grievance uh, filed uh, because of this executive order, or is it something that you think is is uh, can be complied with? Well, this executive order just came out yesterday, but yeah, we're going to take every legal action possible to deal with this, it, especially that that NYPD is going to take over our jobs in the courts. That's another issue that we so, have. So, so, but not uh, even a heads up. Precisely that is is there is there. Yeah, is there a concern about bargaining unit work and, and seniority uh, in accordance with that bargaining unit work? And 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 uh, so um, there was in, in my opening statement, we talked about the value of the merit based system around uh, uh, civil service work. Uh, do you feel that any of the actions taken in recent days is in uh, inconsistent with that or in violation of, of, of those uh, civil servant, uh, civil service charter? Yeah, it's union busting. We're trying to get another union to do our, do our jobs instead of, you know, not hiring in three years. And now we're the blame for everything that's wrong with the criminal justice system. They blame correction officers for everything that's wrong with our criminal justice system. And we're tired. So we're trying so, to be blamed for everything. Uh, President Basil, let me just, so let me just, with, and, and specifically with the AWOLs and, 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 and the penalties that um, we just in the council uh, passed legislation uh, in the past year that created a matrix around discipline. Uh, discipline is also a term and condition of, of employment and is generally collectively bargained. Uh, to a certain degree, not necessarily the penalties, uh, but tracks and, and, and so forth. Um, a wall, you 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 began to allude to um, 
uh, some of some some of the discipline that was applied because of AWOL and other time in attendance and infractions. Um, is have they? If a person, do you know how many people um, that are coming off with doubles and triples? or I've worked numerous doubles or triples during the course of a week, have, have uh, called in sick? Uh, is, look, is, I mean, if you and, is, doing... and is sick, and is fatigue, and exhaustion, uh, mental fatigue, physical exhaustion, is, is that a uh, acceptable uh, reason for calling out sick? Absolutely. 25 plus hours without a meal break. If if I live up in Orange County, now I got to get out, drive home after working that many hours. You guys have made it up, not you per se, um, Council Member Miller. It's now become a public safety concern because if one of my members drives home and crashes be, you know, behind a truck on a highway or God forbid kills somebody because you guys are forcing us to work that many hours, like now it's a public safety concern. Right. So, so, but, but, but my point is, we think that that is, it, it is a health and uh, concern, um, but is that acceptable? And are you then required to go to Mount Sinai because you called out sick? Yes. 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 This is, yeah. So imagine that. And then, and then, and then not giving me a, an appointment within 24 hours and I got to go three days later which nobody wants to talk about that that's contributing to the sick numbers every day. So, I, I do, yeah, but I do understand that they, they, they are contracting additional independent physicians to, to, to do that. But so after working 24 hours, if you call out sick, then you have to leave the house to go to the doctor to, to do what? Because under normal circumstances, if you're out sick one day, does that require the new policy a doctor's is note? now yes, the new policy that they've created is now forcing officers to go get an appointment within 24 hours. For so every time on, you on call out first, sick? On their first every time they call out sick, this is the new policy change. Before we didn't have to deal, we would go to the health management division and eight the first eight days out sick, you would get 24 hours out the house. Then nine, the ninth day to the twelfth day, you would get rec hours, and you, you know after you hit chronic status, you would have to go visit HMD doctors, the health management division doctors. Now they make you go after one day calling in sick, you have to go to Mount Sinai to, to see doctors. But now we can't get an appointment in twenty four hours. You're causing me to be out sick more. Uh, okay, uh, okay, I, 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 you know that that could be. I can see where that's problematic, but I think that that requires further uh, conversation, but from the parties involved, and I, I would have hoped. And 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 again, my 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 questioning was, uh, I I think when they talk about bonuses, did they did they negotiate with uh, Cobra or any of the units involved no. uh, around the bonuses? No, they sent us an email saying that they wanted to do these incentives. You know, we've been trying to meet uh, to discuss this sick leave policy and all the other danger duress conditions that we're, we're under. Um, okay. You know, look, the, the communication with Chiraldi is a little better than it was with Bran. But look, we have, we have mountains to climb. And, you know, th these um, policies are affecting everyone behind, behind in the jails. And this is what we're dealing with. We need help. We need help from the people, from the policymakers. I've come here time and time again, basically begging and pleading for help, but we're not getting the help. And, and I don't understand why. Four months ago, I go see Salazar, like, come on, you coming yeah, now? So, so this is, we, we want to make sure that everybody has a voice, all the stakeholders have a voice. Absolutely. And, 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 and you were allotted additional time Thank because you. that you are genuine and, and the unions involved are genuine stakeholders and, and, and you know, and being impacted as, uh, you know, as well as uh, those that are being detained as well. So we want to hear from them. We don't have an opportunity from here to hear from those who are detained today. 
um, and and we were employed to visit. I don't have to, you know, be asked to visit. I've visited. I've, you know, I mean, look at us. It's a part of our DNA and who, and, and, and who we are. Um, and, and we want to make sure that the conditions on Rikers Island are as best as they can possibly be. So so thank you. And, and there'll probably be another question, but I know that we have some others um, that are waiting to give testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. And we deeply care about the detainees that we have in our custody, but we need the resources so that we can better give them the services that they need. Okay. Thank you. Now we will hear from Patrick Ferreulo, followed by Joseph Ferramosca, followed by Kevin Collins. Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, uh, First, I'd like extra time. Second, Joseph Ferramosca, my legislative chairman, will not be speaking, but I would like the opportunity to speak and I would definitely need more than two minutes. Uh, I'd like to know, first of all, the Department of Corrections, the commissioner and the deputy commissioner and his staff are still on this uh, Zoom meeting. Because I've been The staff, through... staff is still here. They have still have staff here. They're still here? Yes. Okay, because I don't I don't see them in the boardroom. Okay, so a couple of things I want to uh, there's more than a couple of things I want to address. First thing I'd like to address is um, I want to acknowledge District Attorney Clark for her support. I appreciate that. I want to acknowledge Councilman Miller because he's always been supportive of of us, and I want to really thank. Councilman Holden for his remarks. Um, I feel that his remarks were very appropriate and he is someone who uh, sees the real issues that the Department of Corrections has, our unions. A little bit about myself. I'm a union leader for a long time. I've been with the union since 1989. I've been with this agency 40 years. So I take offense to men and women that know really nothing about the insides, inside of the walls of Rikers Island and what correction officers and my captains do on a regular basis. I take offense to Dr. Cohen when he talks about violent attacks on inmates. I take offense to Dr. Cohen when he alleges that there's a job action. That's a very strong accusation to make with no merit to it. As of today, there are at least 10 captains that are illegally shift reduced off of security posts on and off of Rikers Island. Time has expired. And working other posts, um, leaving their post unmanned with inmates, uh, and violating my collective bargaining. So this is an everyday occurrence, but yet the commissioner says, we don't need captains. Well, if you're gonna violate my contract every day and continuously blame COVID, when quite frankly, I don't have um, more captains out than before or after COVID, my my uh, number runs around seven to eight percent. It's probably less than that today, but yet the department continues to violate my contract and shift reduce uh, captains. Uh, Councilman uh, Miller, I want to answer some questions that you posed that were either disingenuously answered or not answered at all. Number one. Correction officers and captains and anybody who does a triple tour cannot get paid that overtime because the system that is set up in payroll does not pay overtime after a double tour is done. So for someone in administration or 
anyone of high power to say that they don't know or they're or we're going to take care of it is just ridiculous because if they don't know that then they're completely out of touch that's number one number two benny had mentioned it but the answer to your question about the mayor the mayor has not been on rikers island for this whole second term matter of fact the mayor has been so disrespectful to correction officers that even when i lost a captain and two of her children from a house fire, he didn't have the decency to come to the funeral. He hasn't been to one of my captain's funeral and I've been running this union for a very long time. So has he really cared about corrections? I doubt it, that is my opinion. As far as collecting a collective bargaining is concerned, again, I will uh, just be a little, uh, repetitive as to what Cap uh, President Basio said. The commissioner fails to bargain with us on every policy that he set forward. He informs us of the policy and then he goes forward with the policy. That is a direct violation of collective bargaining. The answer to your uh, question as to is there a safety officer or a safety mechanism or a unit and your ans the answer from the administrative team was that there's a chief of administration, quite frankly, is absurd. Your question was, is there a safety unit or a safety officer? And the answer is positively no. Um, you know, I think this, I think Councilman may have some actual questions to ask too. So we'll give the time to get to those questions. I just want to be respectful of how many folks we have uh, uh, lined Excuse up. Excuse me, are, are you saying you're limit, limiting me? I think we might be have questions, so we're going to get to them now. I had to cut some colleagues off. I'm not. I'm not months. finished, and I'm and my. You had my legislative chairman speaking. I, when he's I understand, speaking. but we've given you a lot of time. I'm not trying. No, to No, I've waited over four hours, so lot, I deserve I'm, my time, Councilman Miller. I do deserve my time. Questions. Excuse me. I said, we, yes, well, you can finish up, but then we have questions for you as well. I believe. That's fine. So, okay, That's fine. You can... That is fine. Now, you know, a few members of the council and other men and women that have spoken have talked about the amount of correction officers that are out sick. And there was this whole discussion between you and President Basio right now, uh, just a minute ago. But no one has really addressed the cancer that has occurred after Nunez litigation was uh, settled and how it impacted the morale of the Department of Corrections. Now there's been many litigations that are settled and they've been, had positive impacts. For one, the Shepard litigation, the Fisher litigation, the, um, there's a few others, the litigation, the name escapes me that brought in, started bringing in the cameras, which I, you know, supported because more cameras, more uh, transparency in the jails. I don't have a problem with that. But when the Department of Corrections under Heidi Grossman sat down with the federal judge on or about 2013 and started to come up with new changes in policies, the elimination of CPSU, the, uh, new, the new directive on use to force policy, the new directives on discipline without negotiating with the unions was also obviously a direct violation of collective bargaining. How has that impacted and snowballed this agency into where we are today? Well, I'll tell you how. You've seen the violent attacks on correction officers and captains. Yet, when they try to defend themselves, they wind up with charges. A lot of the charges are frivolous. A lot of the charges should never have been written. And they don't start with corrective discipline. They've been taken 60 days, 50 days. Uh, they offer you could resign. How do you think that affects the morale of the men and women 
that don the uniform each and every day. Um, it's a horrific situation and it needs to be changed. The elimination of CPSU is the worst thing that the Department of Corrections should have ever done, okay? I personally was a punitive segregation captain in OBCC for a couple of years. Even the inmates there felt safer. Some of them actually used that tool to get out of general population. Look, I worked on this uh, island when there was 22,000 inmates and we didn't have the problems we have today. We Mr. President, Mr. President uh, we, we have a couple of questions. So if you can begin to wrap up, please. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay. We, want, we want to make sure we leave time to ask questions. Okay. And yes. some so, so let's address the cell doors for one second. Myself and President Basio have gone to the commissioner and we've told him, yes, the cell doors are broke. Why don't you move those inmates to other facilities where the cell doors work to know yeah, about them? There are jails with, excuse yeah. me. Okay, so look, if you have questions, I could go on and on and on, but the truth of the matter is, um, the men and women in the Department of Corrections, like Benny said, have been working these triple shifts. How do you expect them to come back to work? Whether they're physically sick or mentally sick, they are sick. I've had officers myself call me up on quadruples without getting a mail. It's horrendous. I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, we have a question from Council Member Levin. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairs. Um, I have a question. This uh, I apologize. I was on another hearing before, but um, this could go to um, Mr. Ferriulo or uh, Mr. Basquio. Um, what is the percentage of uh, your members that are currently vaccinated for COVID-19? We, uh, I personally couldn't give you a percentage for COVID, uh, but I could tell you the last number I heard that's unofficial was around the 50% number. At first it was in the 30 range, 30% 30 range. Now I'm told mm -hmm. it's getting over to over the 50% number. 50, is that right? Well, I'm just telling you that's a number that's been thrown out. Statistically, I can't say for sure, but that's a number that I have heard. What about COBA members? That's, a, that's the whole department, Councilman Levin. That's the, the whole department? That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's all uniform staff. And I want to- All uniform I, staff, sure. While you're yeah, asking that question, while you're asking yeah. that question, I want to bring something up related to, to that question, actually. You know, um, the commissioner said that the inmates are quarantined before they go into population. That's not true at all. Okay, the inmates are packed into bullpens, they go through their medical, and then they get put into housing areas. I was there just the other day. There are no masks available, available for inmates, nor are they given a test when they come in or are they given a vaccine? So, Doesn't make okay, sense. is, is uh, uh, I think um, uh, Victoria, Dr. Phillips just uh, posted 48%. So, okay, that's, that's within range of what you were saying. Is that an acceptable number to you of your members? I mean, that's, that's hovering around 50%. There is, there is not a person in New York City that does not have access to a vaccine right now. Right. That's, that's a fact, okay? Right. So is it acceptable to you uh, or to the leadership of COBA that the vaccination rate is so low? Because what we are talking about, one of the, look, I, I appreciate uh, uh, the situation that your members are facing of working double and triple shifts. Is that acceptable, Part of that reason, Councilman Levin? Is that acceptable? I'm asking you. Is member, asking time you? has expired. Is a 23% increase in assaults on our, our members? Is that acceptable? I asked the questions. Oh, well, is I'm it asking acceptable? you a question. 
I'm no, just, no, no, no. Excuse saying. me. me I asked, I'm asking you the question, sir. Okay. I asked the question. Guys, guys, you, guys, and, please let guys, the council member ask let, his questions. And please. Ben, I let, asked the question. Let me, Excuse let me, me. Give my, let me give my perspective. Let me give my, my, my answer. Would I personally like to see my membership vaccinated? Uh, that's my personal feeling. I'm vaccinated. I'd like to see all my members vaccinated. I'd like to see them safe. However, yeah. being the president of the union doesn't yeah. give me the right to well, say- You're to a say, president, you're, you're, excuse me. You are a, a person of influence. You have membership and you're a leader. Finish. And you're a leader. So have you called on your members to get vaccinated? I haven't publicly? finished. Let me finish. Okay. Let me yep. finish. I yes, as a matter of fact, in the if you go back to the chief newspaper, I did encourage them to be vaccinated, but I can't force anybody to be vaccinated. It's an individual. How do you, how do you feel? How do you feel about mandates? Mandates for your for your membership to be vaccinated? Um, you know what? I I don't think a mandate would be right because you'd have to weed out religious rights. You'd have to weed out okay. certain. You know, there are exemptions. Every every vaccine mandate right. has 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 exemptions for religious or medical reasons. Right. That does not that does not explain a fifty percent vaccination rate among your members when you have a thousand correction officers calling out sick or or uh, but they're or not AWOL calling per out day, sick for COVID per day. Well, they're not that, calling out. They're not calling out sick for COVID. Well, this, this situation, we you did not have a thousand uh, correction officers calling out sick prior to COVID. So if what has would, changed since COVID? If, if COVID you would have, has changed no, since COVID, okay? If, no, if you would have heard what I said, okay, this has been a snowball effect. I understand and that. Nunez, I get that. And and but, Nunez, Nunez is a major component, okay? Because correction morale? officers. But that's you, you mentioned yes. morale. It's morale, not just, morale is morale is it, not a medical is not is not it, sick. It's I'm not sorry. it's not morale. I said I said it, whether they're me medically sick or physically sick or even mentally sick because of the conditions that they're in, they're sick. That's what I said. Okay. Now listen. I lost members to COVID. I lost their friends to COVID, okay? I would urge men and women to get the vaccine. There's no dispute in that, okay? There's, I have no issue with that. But we all know that we cannot force one to get the vaccine, okay? Sure we can. Okay. Is, is, is that, do you have another okay. question, council member? That's it for me, thank you. All right. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from members? No. Nope. Okay, we'll hear from the next uh, test, uh, panelists. Yes, thank you. Next, we will hear from Kevin Collins, followed by Alicia Butler, followed by Lily Carino, followed by Anthony Wells. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairperson uh, Powers and Miller and members of the Committees on Criminal Justice and Civil Service and Labor. My name is Kevin Collins. I'm the executive director of Doctors Council SEIU, and we represent uh, attending physicians and dentists throughout the health and hospital system, including at Rikers Island and many other cities and states across the country. Um, we thank you and the other elected officials for taking the time to address these issues, and we look forward to continuing working together with you. The topic of today's hearing is the condition in our city's jail. The answer, not good, horrible, and unsafe for the timely delivery of good care and the safety of the detainees and staff, including our members. Basically, our members want two things. Number one, the ability to deliver timely and quality care to detainees, and two, be able to work through our shifts without being assaulted or killed. There is a vital shortage of correction officers, a failure to properly assign correction officers, and a failure and inability of the Department of Corrections and Correction Health Services of Health and Hospitals to ensure existing policies are adhered to and new ones created to address the growing health and safety crisis confronting healthcare workers. And this also impairs the ability of detainees to receive needed care in a timely manner. In July, for example, we had a doctor who had a shank placed at his throat 
while trying to deliver care, could have lost his life and is dealing with the emotional trauma and impact of that. We have doctors reporting to us that while they're trying to uh, administer care to a detainee, other detainees are walking around in the area, uh, interfering with that care being delivered, interfering with the detainee, um, creating an uh, agitated and unsafe situation. Um, I'm gonna focus the balance of my comments because of time um, on possible solutions. Um, I refer folks to the written testimony that we have submitted. Um, when we make suggestions for improvement, what we hear back either from the DOC or the city is that it cannot be done, they cannot make any change, or they admit they violated their own policy, but there's no clear accountability or follow-up. Um, some of the things that we've raised and keep raising is OBCC was not the right facility to have intake at. For months, months, we've been saying go back and use EMTC. It's much better designed, has three clinics, one mental and two medical. X-rays, it has air conditioning, OBCC does not. It has a house for mental health detainees, OBCC does not. And this was known, this was known. Um, Time has expired. Finally, we were informed last night that tomorrow night, beginning at eight o'clock, EMTC will be reopened. One has to ask what took so long for that to occur. But this is just one step. There used to be six buildings doing emissions and more needs to be done now, such as doing emissions at AMKC and, and other areas. Um, as an example, one day last week, we needed 15 officers to provide medical and mental services. There was only three. No admissions were done, and 125 were pending. We need more officers. We call on the use of correction staff from across New York State and other nearby states until the situation stabilizes and more correction officers are hired and working. And we need more medical staff, especially to decrease waiting times, including on tours two and three. Other examples I can give you is, um, for example, Last week, the situation, which is becoming the norm about not having enough uh, officers, uh, no medication distributions occurred, no activity in clinics, no medical follow-up, no mental health, health services follow-up. On another day, we estimate that less than 25% of what should have occurred did occur, less than 25%. We need detainee pa patient escorts, bring in detainees in staggered shifts, so not all at once to, for a better flow and to minif minimize wait time and anxiety and other aspects in terms of opening a, a, a medical clinic at the lower level of OBCC. Um, the proper use of detainees and pens should, should be uh, looked at so that folks are not um, interfering with the care administered to other detainees. Um, in terms of responding to uh, emergency situations, we need to be able to have um, a dedicated clinic line to call from the emergency site if more staff or equipment is needed and the emergency area must also be secure with enough officers before medical personnel can respond. We need a DOC captain and officer in place prior to medical staff arrival. And we need officers in all clinics, including dental. The next sentence is just, we need to reduce the waiting times for EMS to get an officer is escort in order to, to move detainees to a hospital. Obviously, if a detainee needs to go off the island to a hospital, that is a critical, urgent situation. And we shouldn't have to wait for an officer to be found um, to get that person the proper and timely care. There are other suggestions we have that, that deal with different policies, that deal with um, administration and giving of care to people with mental health issues. Um, but for the sake of time, yeah, I'll we'll, wrap we'll up. Yeah, in writing if you can send them over. Yeah, I, I did. I sent it over to uh, Ch uh, Chair, Chairman Powers okay. and okay. Miller and your staff. You, know, that you should have gotten that this morning. Um, we refer you to that. For the sake of time, I'll, I'll wrap up to be respectful to others who've been waiting. Um, I'll just note that part of being a healthcare worker and a union member is to advocate for ourselves, our fellow members, and those we care for. That is what we're doing. And if that advocacy cannot result in solutions, then we'll continue it until it does. We remain willing to work together with the city and the DOC, but that must be real, transparent, collaborative, and timely. There can be no more business as usual. We hope the follow-up will be different. Our members need it. And so do the detainees. Please respect us and protect us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Alicia Butler, followed by Lily Carino, followed by Anthony Wells. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Alicia Butler. I'm a registered nurse working for New York, New York City Health and Hospitals Correctional Health Services, and I have worked on Rikers Island for 19 years. 
I'm a member of the New York State Nurses Association, which represents over 43,000 registered nurses across the state. Thank you, Chairperson Powers and this committee for holding this hearing on the conditions in our city jails. Just visualize, if you would, an intake unit, detainees first exposure to Rikers. It is a pen with benches and no place to sleep. Yet detainees may spend up to three nights in the pen with limited food and water and unsanitary conditions. Recently, a pen housed 47 detainees, far more than the maximum capacity. Our intake needs to be restored back to a more appropriate setting and more, with more capacity. Delays in care are rampant and any obstacle in examining detainees robs nurses of critical time needed for assessment and treatment for things like COVID-19, diabetes, cardiac conditions, and serious illnesses. I wanna to speak to the paramount issue of safety concerns. Nurses continue to deal with COVID-19 pandemic, including the de Delta variants. Causes of COVID are increasing while efforts to isolate and contain are often met with, met with serious challenges. These challenges increase the risk of spread and possible outbreak. Threats and violence are a daily occurrence at Rikers. Acts of violence against nurses have led to serious injuries and palpable fear. Nur nurses working in an unsafe environment where chaos reigns have been victims of violence, including physical and sexual assaults. I myself am currently recovering from an attack at Rikers that required surgery. The health and safety of inmates is also an issue. Between July and September of 2020, the self-injury rate for inmates nearly doubled that of previous quarter, the previous quarter. We had over 500 incidents of inmates hurting themselves between April and June 2021. Inmate suicides are increasing at an alarming rate. Needless to say, there is a mental health crisis among inmates that needs immediate attention, but access, is care, but access to care is routinely delayed. We have seen a lack of accountability from the city, DOC, and New York City Health and Hospital regarding conditions in our jail. Whatever reforms and changes are to come to the jail system, it is imperative in the meantime, day in and day out, that the city provides safe conditions for civilian staff and quality care to all inmates. Time has what expired. Is plan, what is the plan right now to protect healthcare workers so we can do our jobs and provide proper care? We have seen recent proposals, but none of them have what it takes to do so. We seek, and I quote, a safe and effective solution for colleagues who, who face great personal risk simply by fulfilling their professional duties. Staff works under fear of losing their lives or being assaulted and in fear for their health and safety every shift. We Thank implore you, the you city to take to action to protect patients and staff in our correctional facilities. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for testimony. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Lily Carino followed by Anthony Wells. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity to testify regarding conditions in our city jails. My name is Lili Carino Higgins, and I am here today on behalf of 1199. We represent 500 healthcare workers in correctional health services working shoulder to shoulder with the civilian and uniformed workforce. We have testified several times before this body about widespread safety issues but the current situation is dire. We have a real emergency on our hands. Our members only seek to treat patients with dignity, yet they have been themselves physically and sexually assaulted, splashed with urine and feces, held hostage at, gun, at knife point, threatened and assaulted with weapons, and have sustained serious injuries and trauma. More recently, last week actually, we learned of a plot by some detainees to take over the clinics and hold the workers hostage. This is unacceptable. The Department of Corrections has a responsibility to ensure that all staff and detainees are safe. They must adequately staff our clinics or turn that function over to another entity. This is not negotiable. Staffing shortages endanger everyone in the jails, the civilian and the uniform workforce, Detainees and visitors are, are also at risk. When detainees are brought to the clinics, they oftentimes have extremely long waits to be seen, causing them to become agitated, angry, and aggressive. Those who are mentally ill decompensate without proper care, spiraling downward towards self-harm. 
Never before have our members found themselves not being able to do their jobs. But as you heard, last week, appointments had to be canceled, medication could not be dispensed. The lack of correction officers meant that detainees in some instances could not be fed, they couldn't be brought to the clinics, and the medical staff could not be escorted to the housing units to provide the care that they are there to provide. How long is it appropriate to allow those needing insulin and other life-sustaining medication to go without? Time has expired. I'll sum up, um, I have a, several recommendations that will be in my written testimony, but um, I just want to um, state that uh, we have an emergency situation. It requires an emergency and serious response. Uh, we cannot, uh, we have to change the culture of Rikers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Thank you. Now we will hear from Anthony Wells. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the chairs Powell and Miller and apologize, uh, Chair, Miller, uh, Chair Powell, for holding this oversight hearing on the conditions in our city jails. My name is Anthony Wells, and I'm honored to be the president of SSEU Local 371, District Council 37. We represent associate correctional counselors, correctional counselors, program specialists, community titles, and workers from H and H assigned to Rikers. This moment requires blunt and truthful talk. The problem of New York City faces at Rikers did not appear suddenly. It took years. Blaming New York City correctional officers won't get us any closer to solutions than we are today. The facts don't need explanations. We need more correctional officers tested, trained, and hired. We need more promotions to advisory ranks done immediately, and that includes in civilian ranks also. No post in the jail can ever be left uncovered, and that requires trained personnel. It's not surprising we are experiencing more jail violence, more suicides, more assaults, or more correctional officers and civilians. If you're injured, you call in sick. If you can't take a day off because every post in jail must be filled and you're ordered to work, you get sick. The worst outcomes are happening. People are dying. More uniform personnel are needed in New York City, uh, correction department, and we need to get them checked and hired. However, without additional social service workers, without our members working at Rikers and throughout the system, our ability to reclaim lives will continue to decline. We know how to keep families together, bonds that are afraid when de de detainees await further court action, we understand connections must be maintained. We understand what intervention is required to assist, and we know which programs work and don't work. The latest attacks on correctional officers, civilians, and the recent rash of suicides and violence are symptoms of larger issues, and they predict clearly what will occur unless thoughtful people work together. Let me add that the physical conditions are deplorable and unacceptable. We filed a PESH complaint, which was upheld, but the conditions still don't exist. We're at a turning point. We can be bold or we can react. My request, be bold. Only more personnel, trained social service professionals, and sufficient numbers of uniform personnel will stop this tragedy. I ask you to do that. Let me also tell you that, that it's, it is, it's horrible what's happened to correctional. If correctional officers are not safe, the civilians are not safe. My members work intimately, intimately with, with, these, with, the, with the inmates. We provide programs, we provide services, we establish relationships with, with the inmates. And they have oftentimes got caught up folks and, 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 and a lot of things that are going on. They've been assaulted, sexually assaulted also. So this is a bigger problem. This is a problem of the system and getting it done. I heard a lot of testimony, my brothers and sisters from uniforms, I totally support them in their efforts because without them providing security and safety for, for the inmates and for the staff, none of my people are safe, none of them are safe. And um, thank you, two minutes. Thank you, thanks for being here, thanks for testifying, testifying. And, and, and I apologize again to you to the Chairman Powers Sorry. for, for naming hold, <laughs> not you. <coughs> Thank you so much, President Wells. Um, seeing no questions from any council members, um, we're gonna turn to testimony from members of the public. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one and will also announce the person who is next. Once your name is called, please accept the prompt to unmute yourself and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. First, we will hear from Mary Lynn Werlwas, followed by Julia Solomons, followed by Orane Williams. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon. I'm Mary Lynn Rolas of the Prisoners' Rights Project of the Legal Aid Society. And we thank you, council members, for holding this hearing. It's a historic time. Just this week, we reflected on the lessons of Attica. And so, too, will people 50 years from now look back at today and judge how the city leaders fixed this catastrophe. As in any mass casualty, the first priority is saving lives. And there's only one way to do that, given the immediacy and magnitude of the threat right now, reduce the jail population through decarceration. The mayor's five point plan does nothing to save lives right now. It only hopes for results down the road. When the chief medical officer of the jails tells us human health is in danger, immediate action is required. Second, we need the city workforce to come to work. The abuse of public trust that has been tolerated is a scandal. The commissioner and first deputy mayor testified very clearly that the city has enough correction officers employed right now to fully staff the jails without triple shifts. So what possible rationale is there for the city to hire 600 more correction officers and to recall retired officers? The city already has more officers than incarcerated people, a staffing ratio unprecedented in modern corrections. This excess workforce, the monitor finds, is a cause of violence and chaos in the jails. And hiring new staff, bringing back old staff steeped in the old culture of brutality moves us backwards. It will not make us safer or bring us anywhere closer to closing Rikers. We've been here before. The Queen's House, the Tombs, rebelled in 1970, leading to federal courts halting intake and ultimately shuttering the facilities. The city has the power right now and the duty to avoid those outcomes and to solve the crisis right now. Ten deaths this year is ten deaths too many. Thank you. Thank you. morning. Next, we'll hear from Julia Solomons, followed by Orain Williams, followed by Kelsey Davila. Time starts now. Thank you. Chairs Powers, Miller, and committee members, my name is Julia Solomons, and I'm a social worker at the Bronx Defenders. We encourage you to invest in true decarceration efforts and resources that uplift communities most impacted by this crisis and to shift focus from punishment and neglect to care and support, which starts by truly ending solitary confinement and restrictive housing. People are being denied their basic needs and denial of those necessities is worse the more restrictive a setting the person is in. One Bronx Defender's client housed in a restrictive unit has been denied food and showers for days at a time, not brought to court for several appearances, and his life has been put intentionally at risk by correctional officers. The officers abuse the current systems of isolation and punishment to exacerbate violence amongst people in custody. This young person is someone who Koba would paint as violent and dangerous, but in fact, he is a child subject to torturous conditions and acute and ongoing isolation with no access to his family, education, or any type of programming. City Council must amend and pass Intro 2173 to ensure everyone in the jails is afforded true out of cell time and programming conducive to meaningful human interaction. DA Clark didn't address her office's bail request practices, but the Bronx District Attorneys continue to ask for excessive bail amounts that our clients cannot pay, and judges continue to deny the reality of the conditions in the jails. Our bail applications based on horrendous conditions continue to be largely unsuccessful. One client was beaten so severely while at OBCC intake that his eye was swollen shut. And because he didn't receive any medical attention, he was brought to his court appearance days later wearing the same shirt covered in dried blood. The best the judge could offer was the opportunity for his advocate to document the injuries before sending him back to the exact same conditions. The city council and the mayor's office must do more to facilitate the communication between DOC, CHS, and court actors necessary to reduce the pretrial population. CHS must be required to provide detailed letters to the court regarding any mental or medical health risks for individuals in custody, including documentation of requests for medical attention and outcomes of those requests. The commissioner must be directed by the mayor to brief the five New York City district attorneys as well as chief administrative judges on the conditions at each individual facility and explicitly urge increased scrutiny of bail requests and bail practices. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Now we will hear Thank from you. Williams, followed by Kelsey Davila, followed by Stan German. Time starts now. 
Thank you, Chairperson Powers and Chairperson Miller and committee members. My name is Oreen Williams and I'm a criminal, criminal defense social worker from the Bronx Defender. Today, I want to emphasize the importance of investing in community resources as an effective method, method to decarceration. Our city jails have been crumbling literally and figuratively for decades. Over the past 18 months, the global pandemic has sped up that deterioration to a point where we have, to a point where having bail set in a criminal case is very possibly a death sentence, yet the jail population continues to increase. The city must intervene immediately and correct the failures of the carceral and the criminal legal system. Our client basic need, not only for everyday survival, but also medical and mental health are not being met. If clients were to be released and were able to have their needs met in the community, it could mean a very different outcome for their lives. And in some case, that outcome inches up on what resources available to them in the community. Investment in community resources that support people up on release is equally important and has been proven to contribute not only to getting people released from jail, but also keeping them from going back in. One Bronx Defender clients went in custody already navigating severe medical needs, including bullet wounds after being shot by a police officer. Despite being housed in the North Infirmary Command, he went weeks up on intake without medical attention to his wounds and other medical needs, even with repeated requests from his advocates. Bail applications were made on his behalf, but they were unsuccessful, and he continued to languish without care until to the very to, to every to very recently a nerve damage um, from the bullet wound became so severe that he was at risk of losing his entire arm. He lost, a, an, he lost a finger and is being told that he may lose another one in the future simply because the jail was unable to respond to his medical need. The care system within the facilities are beyond repair. And the most important thing I'm the city expired. can do right now is to invest in the community resources that, that facilitate these re people release. One concrete evidence of investment proven to be successful is the creation of the Exodus Run Hotel overseen by Mark J. In, <clears throat> excuse me, in conclusion, a community resources that have been proven to increase release is concrete way to reduce the jail um, population and to do so safely in a way that offers people what they need to succeed and be successful in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now we will hear from Kelsey Davila, followed by Stan German, followed by Megna Phillip. Your time starts now. Hi, I'm Kelsey Diavila with the uh, Brooklyn Defender Services. Alarms about this crisis have been going off for months with no action. This mayor, the judges, the DAs are willfully playing ignorant of the situation. Prosecutors continue to set bail at ridiculously high amounts. And I agree with Assemblymember Gallagher who said today that these deaths are on the DAs who set bail on people who cannot pay it. In addition, judges are flagrantly abusing the bail laws. Judges have gone ahead and named themselves jail and medical experts by dismissing even the jail's own chief medical officer's pleas for help, who is telling us there is a collapse of basic jail functions and the conditions are leading to devastating and deadly consequences. Dr. Cohen just today called it an epidemic of suicides. I was at Rikers recently and I met with a man who had been in, been in OBCC intake for several days. He begged me not to leave him because he was seriously contemplating of killing himself. He hadn't had a bowel movement since he arrived and the toilets was no longer flushing. So for days, feces and urine was spilling onto the very floor where people were sleeping, which resulted in violence anytime someone had to relieve themselves. We sat together for hours while at the same time, multiple lawyers from our office are in court advocating with the judge who was refusing to accept a partially secured bond from a qualified surety. This person had the money on day one and our client could have gone out of jail before he spent even one night in that facility. Yet the judge refused to accept it. And even at one point refusing to call the case, forcing the attorney to come back to that courtroom day after day until they were heard. Our office spent an enormous amount of time and resources pleading with this judge who was abusing the process. And this is happening all the time. This is not a unique situation. We need and must hold judges and DAs accountable. We must listen to medical professionals calling for decarceration, and we must stop falling for NYPD's lies and fear mongering. I'm calling on city council to use any and all authority to make this happen. We must decarcerate to end this crisis. We've done it before and we can absolutely do it again. If we don't, more people will die. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for testimony and all your joining. Appreciate it. Now we will hear from Stan German, followed by Megna Phillip, followed by Alice Fontier. Time starts. Good afternoon. My name is Stan Herman. I am the executive director of New York County Defender Services. I've been listening since 10 a.m. this morning. And I have two specific requests uh, for the council, Councilman Powers and Councilman Miller. The first one is that Corey Johnson should authorize an investigation into how we got to this point. Even if you assume that the prior commissioner somehow didn't share what was happening with the de Blasio administration. I know for a fact that since Vinnie Schiraldi took over, he has been in constant communication with Gracie Manchin and the first de deputy mayor. He took over on June 1st, which means they knew about this in June. They knew about this in July. They knew about this in August and they did nothing. The fact of the matter is, was it not for community activists like the Jail Action Coalition, public defenders, the media, having press conferences and rallying around this issue, we would not be having this hearing today. We need to have an investigation into why this mayor ignored this problem and why he was ready to simply wait his time out for the next four months and let this go on to another administration. We have to have accountability and transparency in our government. Secondly, I have a five action plan. Number one, the executive must use 6A. Uh, Councilman Powers, you hit on the hypocrisy of the first deputy mayor calling on the governor to do her part, calling on the courts to do their part, calling on OCA to do their part, calling on judges to do their part, calling on DAs to do their part, but they refuse to, to, to use uh, Section 6A to release individuals. Clearly, they are seeing this through a political lens. And that is very disheartening. Number two, yes, the governor should pass less is more. Number three, I am calling on all city district attorneys to immediate cons consent to the release of anyone charged with a misdemeanor nonviolent felony. As far as those who remain, they should do a case by case review. Number four, OCA should prioritize incarcerated clients and their cases over all other cases. We should not be bringing out clients to in-person appearances when we have the humanitarian crisis that we have. And this is my second ask, Councilman Powers and Councilman Miller. And I do not make this request lightly. I am a public defender for 25 years, but I am calling on the federal government to take over Rikers. All of this was summed up by your very first question, Councilman Powers, very first one. Are you able to manage the situation at Rikers Island. And nobody, having listened to everything over the last five and a half hours, could honestly conclude that the answer is yes. Unions and commissioners both agree that they can't provide basic services. Healthcare officials agree. Workers, civilian workers agree. Um, I am going to reach out to Hakeem Jeffries. I'm going to reach out to Senator Schumer. I'm going to reach out to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because Rikers is in her district and we have to swallow our pride as New Yorkers and just be honest, we fail. We're not up Thank to you. the task and we need help and we shouldn't be Thank ashamed you. to do so so we don't have any more unnecessary deaths on Rikers Island. Thank you and I appreciate you being here. I know you mentioned it since 10 a.m. and others have as well. We appreciate everyone being here. Thank you for the recommendations. Next, we will hear from Megna Phillip, followed by Alice Fontier, followed by Sarita Daftery. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Megna Phillip. I'm a public defender at the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem. The jails cannot house our clients safely. New York City must decarcerate with urgency. As public defenders, every day we are witnessing increases in bail requests by prosecutors. A wider range of cases in which they are seeking bail, including even misdemeanors, and higher amounts of bail being requested and set. There's a woeful and willful blindness amongst DAs and judges when it comes to the current conditions at Rikers. Thank you to the elected officials who came to Rikers on Monday. I encourage you all to also come sit in criminal court arraignments and observe bail arguments. That is the ever-expanding pipeline to Rikers. 
As my colleagues have testified, the city council must put pressure on prosecutors and judges to immediately reduce the population at these failing facilities and to pass legislation to permanently dismantle New York's lethal, racist, and classist epidemic of mass incarceration. The observations of the elected officials who visited Rikers with us on Monday speak for themselves. Beyond the irredeemable horror of intake, our clients in all facilities at Rikers are also being deprived of their constitutional right to counsel and due process. Our clients are not being produced for legal visits and video conferences. On Monday at the RNDC facility, I met multiple people who have not been taken to legal visits and desperately asked me to contact their lawyers. My colleagues have on numerous occasions come to Rikers and waited for hours for their clients to be produced to no avail. We are told that there are no escorts available to bring clients down. We are told that our clients are refusing to be produced, but this isn't true because when we do speak with our clients, they tell us they are not refusing production and in many instances had no idea about the legal visit or video conference. This is unacceptable. Our clients have a constitutionally guaranteed right to counsel, but because of wealth-based pretrial detention and cash bail, they are living in unconscionable conditions that are denying them that right. They can't participate in their legal defense and we can't inform them about what's happening in their case. Time of expired. This also contributes to the desperation on the island right now. Clients need contact with their advocates. They need to know what is happening with their cases that are keeping them trapped on that island. And they need to be able to report their conditions to us so we can advocate from the outside for them. And doctors are reporting to us that the lack of access to counsel and information about cases is leading to increases in self-harm and attempted suicides. This all needs to change immediately and the city needs to decarcerate now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for everybody who's been waiting here for a long time. Next, we'll hear from Alice Fontier, followed by Sarita Daftery, followed by Darren Mack. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. I'm Alice Fontier, Managing Director of the Neighborhood Defender Services. I am testifying because I am deeply distressed that in this hearing that started at 10 a.m., and is still going at 342 is the time right now, you have not yet heard from Correctional Health Services Chief Medical Officer Ross McDonald. As many of you know, in a letter to Council Member Powers, Dr. McDonald stated, unfortunately in 2021, we have witnessed a collapse in basic jail operations, such that today I do not believe the city is capable of safely managing the custody of those it is charged with incarcerating in its jails nor maintaining the safety of those who work there. The breakdown has resulted in an increase in deaths, which we refer to as jail attributable, where jail conditions meaningfully contributed to the death. Death and injury are predictable consequences of repeated failures to perform certain essential functions due to unavailability of staff. Throughout this day, you have heard about a number of basic essential functions that are not being performed. Chief among them is a lack of medical care. CHS should be testifying about what they are seeing on a daily basis. I can tell you that on Monday, this Monday, in the intake unit at OBCC alone, I personally observed two individuals who were suffering from an obvious and acute mental health crisis locked in showers. One of them was completely naked. Two other men who appeared to be suffering acute psychotic symptoms were locked in a filthy cell with an overflowing toilet. Another man sat catatonic on a dirty floor, rocking against the bars. In another cell filled with about 20 people who reported having been in the cell from three to 13 days, three different people showed me their open wounds and injuries. They also showed me their discharge papers from Mount Sinai and Bellevue. They had been brought directly here and stuck in a cell. Given these conditions, it should come as no surprise that a man tried to hang himself in front of Senator Ramos and Assembly Member Gonzalez Rojas. Dr. McDonald continued in his letter, without the ability to attend basic jail operations, we are poorly positioned to control COVID-19 transmission. We are seeing the results of this today. Defenders were told that no one from a number of houses on the boat, BCBC, could be produced to court because they were in COVID lockdown for the next two weeks. 
OBCC is meant to be a two week COVID clearing intake facility. We met people that have been housed there for months because they cycle back and forth into COVID units after being exposed. Dr. McDonald also pointed out that decarceration efforts, which are a proven health response to COVID-19, have not been meaningfully pursued since 2020. Rather, the city focuses on case processing through the courts, a slow remedy which also does not meet the urgency of the moment. Contrary to what the commissioner and DA Clark have argued today, court is open. Our attorneys are in court every single day. Yes, there are limited trials. But on average, only 1% of all cases are resolved through trials. Every other court appearance is, is currently happening. The problem is that incarcerated people are not being produced to court. People who could be released, people who could plea and be sentenced are not being produced to make that happen. They have yeah, I, just, Justin, just, I, know, I know you have a lot more to say, but uh, we just have a lot. I have of one more line. Okay. They have limited access to counsel and even more limited access to court. This is a corrections problem, not a court problem. The blame game and finger pointing has to stop. 6,000 lives on Rikers Island depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. Now we will hear from Sarita Daftery, followed by Darren Mack, followed by Brandon Holmes. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Sarita Daftry. I'm a co-director of Freedom Agenda and a member of the Jails Action Coalition. While I wanna thank the council members for having this hearing, I have to state the outrage of taking a hearing that was scheduled because people have been losing their lives in rapid numbers on Rikers Island and turning it the first five hours of it into an opportunity for the union that has seven times more officers than every other jail system in the country to complain that they can't do their jobs. With that aside, you are going to hear from everyone else about the need for decarceration. There are, a, you've heard from public defenders, that is urgent. In addition, city council members should put, every single city council member should put out a public statement sent to all of your constituents and media to condemn the police commissioner's blatant and repeated lies about releases from jails due to COVID and about bail reform. The root causes of crime are complex and the NYPD has no ability to address them since most of them are rooted in unmet needs and systemic disinvestment. Dermot Shea has no real answers about how to keep communities safe, but wants to maintain and expand his power. So he and his officers decided to launch a coordinated campaign of lies and fear mongering. NYPD's own data debunks the commissioner's efforts to blame incidents of violence on decarceration. The public deserves the truth. And if the mayor and the NYPD commissioner won't provide it, the council must drown them out. The mayor may be content to let people die on Rikers to appease Dermot Shea, but the council cannot allow that. Further, there is renewable Rikers legislation that should have meant that EMTC was already transferred out of DOC's hands. And now it is being reopened to accommodate the desire to continue mass incarceration. That should have happened already. That transfer should have happened already. And the council needs to hold the city accountable for maximum transfers in the quickest amount of time. And lastly, I just need to say, about the complaints from some officers that their hands have been tied by the federal monitor, I'd like to remind the council why we have a federal monitor, because officers were abusing their power with impunity and subjecting incarcerated people Time to expired. unconstitutional levels of violence, including head strikes, painful escort techniques, improper use of OC spray, and force that is disproportionate to the actual threat. For some officers, like the union leaders, that's their preferred approach. For others, they followed the example of officers who've been on the job longer. Either way, the council must remember that the only reason that recognizing the human rights of incarcerated people feels like oppression to some correction officers is because they were allowed to operate with impunity for so long. Um, and I just wanna emphasize because uh, council member Miller stated that the union could have more time because they had a gen represented a genuine constituency. Every single person on this Zoom who is working with people inside, who has been incarcerated, who has lost loved ones in there should get unlimited time the way that he did. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Now we will hear from Darren Mack, followed by Brandon Holmes, followed by Jennifer Parrish. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Chairman Powers, Chairman Miller and City Council. First, I also wanna echo that, you know, we're here because 10 people died in DOC's hands and we're not here to give uh, COBA uh, a platform. We are in another crucial moment and simultaneously 
for some city council members, it's a dilemma, a, a quandary, which is going to take brutal honesty, will, and courage in order to deal with this crisis we, we are all faced with. You know, COBA has a clutch on its members and the future of New York City. There are officers who believe in rehabilitative approaches, who believe in reform, who believe in closing Rikers, who don't want to see their own children targeted by systems of, of mass incarceration. And they voice that. But those are not the voices of COBA that COBA chooses to represent. COBA has vehemently opposed every reform from treating 16 and 17 year olds like 16 and 17 year olds with raised the age to bear reform. But thank goodness electeds wisely did not feed into the, their fear mongering and pass legislation to bring us closer to, to, a more, to a more just system. So COBA for decades of corruption and toxic leadership has created monsters, but not the people incarcerated. On August 31st, in response to calls for decarceration in the, in the wake of the suicide of, of Segunda Ualpa, an, an active duty correctional office commented on Facebook, and I quote right here, the inmate population will continue to decrease as long as they keep killing themselves. And that's in bold, keep killing themselves. That will definitely reduce the inmate population. That crook will no longer be in the street. It's a win-win. And I'm sad to say that this is from an officer who was a black woman, as is Rebecca, Rebecca Hillman. Time expired. Who stood by as Ryan Wilson hanged himself last year. These women have been indoctrinated to see incarcerated people as less than human, like too many others in DOC, and they cannot be responsible for human lives. Last, and I conclude, only two things would immediately address the crisis on Rikers Island. Decarceration and current officers coming back to work. And COBA has opposed both. This council has the power to disband the Department of Corrections and should be working to do so now. Finally, after years of absent leadership, DOC finally has a commissioner and deputy, deputy commissioner committed to change. The best thing the council could do is enable them to start from scratch. This has been done, done in Canada, New Jersey, with the, with the police force, in Mexico with the federal prison system. Like Rikers, DOC is too broken to be fixed. And how much longer can the council expect the people to sit this city to tolerate spending $450 thousand dollars per year per incarcerated person for a department that can't even keep them alive thank you thanks thanks for testimony now we will hear from brandon holmes followed by jennifer parrish followed by alana Sivin. time starts now good afternoon in the past nine months we've talked about countlessly rikers island has claimed 10 lives and I think Dr. Bobby Cohen said it best when he said this is a long, terrifying season of death. Two weeks ago, survivors of Rikers rallied outside City Hall demanding action from this administration. And the mayor spit in our faces when he said he would task NYPD with relieving DOC in courts. It has shown again and again that any crisis that New York City has, the only response is to double down on law enforcement. This makes no sense. As the acting DOC commissioner and chief medical officer have both said in their statements and in their letters that they need support in holding staff accountable, that DOC needs to be held accountable, that reducing the jail population and improving the immediate conditions is the solution. Will any of this be realized, right? We need to be asking, since the mayor has abdicated his responsibility to New Yorkers accused of crimes, despite his lip service to valuing our people, we need to ask, is this council our last hope? And we believe that you have to use your authority to hold all systems agents accountable. And after years of successful efforts to reduce incarceration and before the emergency release programs implemented in response to COVID, the number of people detained pretrial had been dropped to about 3,200 people in March, 2020. Since then, we've seen that uh, pretrial population rise to over 4,600 people, which is more than the entire citywide jail capacity was last year in spring 2020. So we need a deeper interrogation into why the administration has slowed or paused their release efforts, such as the 6A program supervised release, 
expanding investments into the hotel placement programs. And we really need to pressure the mayor on not reversing his stance on releasing people sentenced to a year or less. Uh, the council can take time expired drive and support decarceration, including this, is, this will be my last point. The council can require MockJ and future administrations to assess and report on each defendant's ability to pay. We continue to hear this excuse from the administration and from some council members that we can't tell judges what to do. We can't change the way judges use their discretion. But we know the 2019 state bail reform laws did not have a specific actor who was assigned to this task of assessing people's ability to pay. And since it's not happening, judges continue to set excessive bills that make freedom dependent on wealth. And now death has become a natural consequence of being poor in New York City. So we are asking city council, please create a parallel reporting process so that we can be prepared to ask DAs and judges why they would request bail of $10,000 for people who can clearly only pay $500. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to know, we had funded to the city council a pilot program to do an assessment in the Bronx around ability to pay. I think we're going to hear from folks from the Bureau Institute shortly who had uh, been running that as well. But appreciate it and something we'll look into uh, in terms of expanding and mandating. Thank you, as always. Now we will hear from Jennifer Parrish, followed by Alana Sivin, followed by Michael Rempel. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Parrish. I'm the Director of Criminal Justice Advocacy at the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project and a member of the Jails Action Coalition and the Halt Solitary Campaign. Thank you for holding this hearing and calling attention to the emergency in the city jails. Undoubtedly, right now, the city cannot keep the people in its custody safe. The deaths of 10 people in the last nine months establishes that. We need the city council support to pressure the mayor, the governor, prosecutors, and judges, all of those with power to release people, to act now so that as many people as possible are removed from these inhumane conditions and that no more lives are lost. Decarceration is clearly the priority at this moment. Now, I understand that the city council itself cannot release anyone, but there is action you can take. In addition to what Brandon mentioned, you can pass legislation to end inhumane jail conditions, and that is what you should do. We need to end the use of solitary confinement in its entirety. Solitary confinement is torture and has no place in New York City jails. There must be a law prohibiting this practice. The council should amend intro 2173, which council member Drum introduced in December 2020 and pass the bill. The legislation needs to be amended to make clear that ending the use of solitary confinement means that no one will spend their out of cell time alone in a cell. The Department of Corrections should not be allowed to move a person from their cell to a, into a cage attached to their cell and call time spent in that cage out of cell time. But that is what the department's plan to end solitary is, and it's unacceptable. The city council must make clear that ending solitary confinement means that people have time out of their cell with other people engaged in congregate programming and recreation. You have the power to pass this legislation and you should do your part in ending inhumane conditions in the city jails. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Now we will hear from Alana Sivin, followed by Michael Rempel, followed by Helen Skipper. Time starts now. Good afternoon, I'm Alana Sivin, Senior Advisor at the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, also known as the Lippman Commission, after a chairperson, former Chief Judge of the State of New York, Jonathan Lippman. I was able to speak with someone who was on this tour that happened of Rikers Island this past week, and this person came across a cell that was meant for one person and there were five people crammed in there. And it was an intake cell with one toilet. People were sleeping on the floor, cold concrete floors with nothing but cardboard to rest on. And this person described the stench within that cell and the cell where five people were crammed and said it was so unbearable that even with a mask, they couldn't be there for more than a few minutes. The people who were in that cell, some of them had been there for two weeks. People are dying, 10 have died this year, and more people are going to die if swift action isn't taken. 
Now the city council has the power to decarcerate and must do so. This is something that the city council assisted with at the onset of the pandemic and can do again. Um, but before I go specifically through some of the specific actions that we've outlined in our report that we co-authored with the Center for Court Innovation, I do want to touch on the 6A issue and just say that, you know, I would urge the mayor to reconsider because there are over 200 people who could be released. Um, when it comes to city council actions, we agree with the ability to pay assessment. Uh, it's, it's happened in the Bronx and it can be expanded to other areas because right now the majority of people who are in Rikers are there because they can't pay. There also should be funding for community-based wraparound support for vulnerable populations. We've seen how this has worked with programs like the Women's Project at FedCap. Uh, we can also see funding for uh, psychiatric assessments at arraignments because right now 17% of the people who are at Rikers Island are there because they have a serious mental illness. If there are people at arraignments who can assess those folks, then they can get out and get the mental health services that they need. There also should be an expedition expedition of the resolution of cases. The commissioner talked about how people I'm are expired. So we recommend that you look at the recommendations that are in our report. But that last one is having case expediters in every courtroom just has been done with the case processing pilot in Brooklyn and expanding that uh, citywide. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lana. As you know, these hearings are long, so I'm not going to ask any questions, but I will be in touch uh, with you and we'll look out for your report as well. And uh, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Next, we will hear from Michael Rempel, followed by Helen Skipper, followed by Jared Trujillo. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I am Mike Rempel, Director of Jail Reform at the Center for Court Innovation. Like some others, I too will focus on the urgency of decarceration. In less than 18 months, the city's daily jail population climbed by over 2,200 people, from 3,800 at the end of April 2020 to almost 6,100 today. Nine in 10 people now sitting in jail are presumed innocent of any crime. Here's how it breaks down. 74% are held before trial by the court, mostly due to an inability to afford bail. Then another 17% are held on pending parole violations. Only 4% are held on an actual jail sentence. Black New Yorkers make up 59% of yesterday's jail population compared to less than a quarter of the city's general population. Almost 800 people have been in jail before trial for one to two years and another 630 for over two years. In response, the council could immediately pass a resolution urging courts and prosecutors to review every single one of the over 400, of the over 4,500 people now in pretrial detention. Common sense release criteria could include one, diagnosed with a chronic medical condition, two, ages 55 and up, three, women transgender or gender nonconforming, four, jailed despite a recommendation for release by the city's validated release assessment, five, jailed on a first arrest, indicating a lack of past evidence of missing court dates as is required under the law. Six, held pretrial for over six months, the court system's own standard for resolving cases, or seven, held simply due to an inability to afford bail. The governor could order a swift review of the over 600 people held on technical parole violations or violations stemming from pending misdemeanors or nonviolent felonies. Such a step would mirror Time state expired. action at the outset of, of the pandemic. And, and I'll conclude in a couple more sentences. Finally, the mayor could in legally release over 200 people into the effective early release program. We have to address this current emergency, but as previous testimony indicated, we do also need a one, three, and six month jail reduction plan. We can't only continue to put out fires. Thank you again for having me. I agree, and I agree with that last point particularly. Thank you. Thanks for nice to see you. Now we will hear from Helen Skipper, followed by Jared Trujillo, followed by Donna Gould. Time starts now.
Okay, it looks Maybe like, we, yeah, we can get her to unmute. Um, okay. Okay, we'll go to uh, Jared and we'll try to get Helen back on. Time starts now. I don't see Jared in my list of, oh, there he is here, actually. He's unmuted. Okay. Jared, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, you're unmuted, though. Your sound's not on. If you try logging out and logging back in, that might work. We'll go to the next person. We'll come right back to you. You want to log back in? Okay, um, let's try Donna Gould. Time starts now. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. So um, I'm really humbled by listening to everything that all the people who have been working on working with uh, people in, in a jail have been saying and and I agree with a great deal of what they said and what they recommend. Um, so I only want to say that you've heard the, the horrific wave of deaths of people incarcerated at Rikers in the last few months. You have heard the horrendous conditions that our state representatives have described. How can we not understand the violence of some prisoners when we hear the conditions they are living under. The mayor, judges, DAs, and city council must fully decarcerate now because the city is not able to keep people alive or healthy or meet their most basic needs. Everyone in the jails must be released and not one more person should be sent to city jails. The city can no longer send people to an island, lock them in their cells without access to food, or medical care and leave them to die without them or their family's ability to do anything about it. The mayor, judges, and DAs must release people and stop sending people to Rikers. And the city council must pass any and all legislation that can help this decarceration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna try Jared again. Time starts now. Hi, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. There you go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Powers, uh, committee members. Uh, thank you for allowing uh, me to speak today. My name is Jared Trujillo. I'm policy counsel at the New York Civil Liberties Union. And while a lot of my testimony is going to focus on the lack of notice for this hearing, um, I did want to bring up a few points before. Uh, first, a lot of people from the city have, talk, have spoken about uh, the need to pass the Lessons More Act and uh, pushing on the governor to pass the Less Is More Act. I just wanna be very specific. The effective date for the Less Is More Act is March uh, of 2022. So if folks are pushing on the governor to pass the Less Is More Act, which is just one of, of many tools that are needed to address the humanitarian crisis at Rikers, it is just as imperative that you push for immediate implementation and that there are not further amendments uh, to the bill that was passed uh, by the legislature in June. Um, also, just briefly, I wanted to note that even though the Less Is More Act is important, there are still very intentional policy failures which have led to the, the humanitarian crisis at Rikers. That's the mayor's inability or refusal uh, to release people on, 60, on, on 6A. Uh, every time that DAs ask for bail that people cannot afford, that is a policy failure. Every time that judges set bail that people cannot afford, that is a policy failure. Uh, COBA, who, who just in this very hearing said, was asking for more people to be placed in solitary confinement while people are sitting in feces at Rikers, that is a policy failure. And then there are so many soft power policy failures that happen when any member of government enables, enables law enforcement 
uh, to to talk about uh, to, uh, to to spread misinformation about bail reform uh, and to spread misinformation about about rising uh, about rising crime rates. Um, I, I see I only have about ten seconds left. I just want to know that this meeting was initially supposed to be um, an in person and in person hearing. Um, at the very last minute, this was I'm changed expired. to. Uh, being a virtual hearing, people had almost no notice. That is, that is, that violates the open meetings law. Uh, there's no reason for this meeting to have been changed to being a virtual meeting with uh, with effectively no notice to advocates. That depressed who uh, actually did speak. And and finally, I'm I'm wrapping up. I'll just note that that looks particularly nefarious, given the fact that on September 11th, the mayor tried uh, the mayor tried to stop lawmakers from visiting Rikers. Um, a few days later, the chief medical examiner uh, released his letter. And given everything that's going on, the this city council should really care about transparency. And given the lack of notice for this meeting to be virtual, it, it appears that that's not the case. Appreciate that. I just want to comment on that last part because we are obviously going to the Delta variant. We have been given new authority to do remote. We have a lot of people wanting to attend this, some who cannot make it in person. And we have a lot of social distancing. And this hearing is, I think, I believe, important in access and availability for people. I do apologize if you do not receive enough notice to be able to change any plans or things like that. But I do think this offers an opportunity for more people to participate than a 10 a.m. Uh, hearing in person. But uh, we'll apologize to the city council if there was uh, 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 poor notice. Otherwise, thank you for the testimony. Uh, next, we will hear from Melania Brown, followed by Scott Paltrowitz, followed by Victor Pate. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. First, let me just say that the victims and the, 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 the loved ones should have went at the beginning because now everybody's gone. So who are we really speaking to? That's one. Now, two, I'm going to start off with Mrs. Clerk. We all heard when she said some people should be treated like humans, right? We all heard that, right? So I guess my sister did not deserve to be treated like a human, right? My sister, Lily Polanco, died on June 7th, 2019 in solitary confinement. And Miss Clark watched her two correctional officers laugh, open up a cell and laugh at my sister like she was garbage and close the door and then release a statement that she was not going to press charges on her correctional officers. So everything that she just said today is making more sense to me. She does not care about the life of these individuals, our neighbors, our loved ones, our, our incarcerated right now. She does not care about them. Her main concern is her CO. Why? Because she gets funded by the DOC. That's why. My sister deserves to be here today. She deserves to be here today. And Benny, all this jabbering that he does about his correctional officers, they're out on sick leave, but they're taking vacations. What they're doing is using the pandemic, all right, the crisis that we're facing to their advantage, the crisis that's going on in Rikers Island to their advantage. There's no testing that they're doing, asking the correctional officers to, to give them a test to see if they actually are sick or contracted COVID. There's no testing. As you, you heard, they even said that they don't, it's not mandatory for none of the employees to get vaccinated. We're talking about people are in cells and bathrooms, sleeping in, on, on feces, on pee. These are humans we're talking about. Enough is enough. Like, I mean, this, this right here, I've been here logged in since 10 o'clock in the morning. And I was Time dying expired. to get, excuse me, Rosie, the reporter, gave me her two minutes. You can keep going, keep going. Thank you. I've been dying to get on this line and speak to people, but people kept just logging off. Now, the CO, like I said, the CO's officers, they aren't scared. They're abusing the pandemic, abusing the crisis that's going on in Rikers Island. Also, hiring more NYPD, the same individuals that are out here right now killing people and getting away with it, hiring them to become correctional officer in a facility, do you think that will really make a change? That won't stop people from suffering. That will make it worse for them. That's that's the, the next one. Now, let's not talk about, let's talk about actually, let's talk about how the the city council, um, the city council banned the, the medical officer from testifying today after he said we needed outside help. Well, I just want to clear, we did not ban 
Anyone. Okay. Ever does. All oh. right. My apologies for that. Everybody I'll take that back. Kind of. Okay. I'll take that back. But now with the mass incarceration, this is what no one is paying attention to. The feds are just building cases and throwing conspiracy on people and throwing them in city jails and in 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 county jails and they're not even being part of the, these individuals that are incarcerated in these facilities they're not even being accountable for in the pob they're not they're not so nobody talks about that nobody talks about how they could sweep the nation and throw everyone behind bars no one talks about how they're not even in federal uh, 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 jails, they're being thrown in city jails, they're being, being thrown in, in county jails, and they're, they, these, it, these individuals, these loved ones, our neighbors, which most will call them inmates, but they're not, they're humans, they're not being accounted for in the BOP. Now, if that's not a concern that people should look into, I don't know what else is. Now, like I said, hiring new officers was not going to save my sister. My sister would have died Either way. Why? Because of the, the, the neglect, the lack of sympathy. Mrs. Clark just came on here and I almost wanted to go through the screen. One day me and her will have our day where I will be able to let her know all these emotions that I'm holding inside. But it was no secret to no one on this call when she said some, some should be treated like a human. We all heard that, right? We all heard that, right? Why? Because she does not care about these individuals. As long as she keeps getting funded by the DOC, she's going to keep turning her back. She's a disgrace to my kind. She's a disgrace to what she, what she did to my sister. I will never in my lifetime forgive that woman. And my day will come where I will sit down with her and I will tell her exactly how I feel. This is enough. Why are we still here when we see the problem right now as we host in this meeting since 10 o'clock in the morning? There's someone right now trying to kill themselves. There's someone right now sleeping on the floor, calling for their mother, calling for their brother, calling for anybody to come rescue them. God, there's nobody. You heard legislators talk about the conditions in this facility. You heard how the DA clerk basically says she doesn't care about them. Only some people should be treated like humans, okay? We, we hear how Benny comes on here and despite of him knowing that his correctional officers are wrong and taking the proper precautions and making sure that they do their job, he comes on here every single time and makes, and makes excuses for them. While these people are dying, his correctional officers are using a pandemic and using the crisis that we got in hand right now to take vacation time. This is not okay. This needs to end. I mean, I don't know how clear today was, but today was very clear to me. It was very clear to me. It was black and white. It was right there. It doesn't even need to go on a piece of paper. We've been in this meeting since 10 o'clock this morning. These individuals do not care about our loved ones sitting behind those walls. They do not care, and it's our job to end this, okay? You want to talk about uh, correctional officers getting her? But please explain to me how many got killed. Because my sister's dead. How many are dead? I mean, I'm pretty sure when you take a job, they give you your job description. They tell you that you may get hurt on the job, just like with cops. They tell you these things. So if this is not the job for you, then you need to find another one. You need to find another one because there's no excuse as to why these humans are being tortured. It is not our job to judge them. And what we have, please, what we have our jails doing, all you guys are doing, all they're doing is creating monsters. They're mm -hmm. going to come out into society one day. They're going to be around our children. They're going to walk around our parks. They're going to be in the movie theaters. They're going to be in the mall and the supermarket. After coming out of a trauma that, ha that happened to them behind those walls, they're creating monsters, yes. They want to complain about how people react. Let me tell you something. When someone doesn't feel like they're being heard, they start causing riots. That's just in our nature. They start causing riots. And so these correctional officers start being held accountable for their actions. This will keep happening. This crisis will keep going on and on and on and on. It's just that now,
the, 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 these loved ones, our neighbors are sitting behind those walls. They come to a point that they're causing riots. They're killing themselves. They, they doing whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring light into their situation. That's what they're doing. I mean, what you expect them to do? Just lay there and get beat, lay there and die. Well, I, mean, I, I want to I, I wanna give you a lot of time to speak, but I also want to make sure we can get to other folks. I'm not trying to cut you off, but I also want to... No, I, I, I get it. And other people should deserve to talk because we all have been on this call since 10 o'clock in the I morning. Know, I, I apologize for I the do, long during it. Yeah. No, it's okay. And I do appreciate you guys giving me your time. But seriously, everything was really clear right now. They make excuses for their CEOs and they're saying that only, like VA clerk says, only some humans are some people some people behind those walls should be treated like humans that means the rest are not humans to her that means to me it was a clear mes message that my sister was not a human to her when she decided not to press charges after i released a video through nbc news of her correctional officers laughing at my sister when they opened that cell when they could have helped her thank you councilman powers thank you appreciate that was always your words mm. Next, we will hear from Scott Paltrowitz, followed by Victor Pape, followed by Johnny Perez. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Powers and everybody for holding the hearing. I am just crushed, you know, by the weight of harm and death discussed today. It cannot be said enough that at least 10 people are dead in the last nine months because our city and state institutions killed them. People being locked in solitary confinement in showers amidst their own feces or in supposed suicide watch units without anyone watching. People not getting food or medical care. People being stuffed in crowded intake cells in the midst of a pandemic. I know and appreciate that so many of you officials and policymakers also feel that weight. And I only hope that the actions taken at every level rise to the gravity of this deadly crisis. I'm just right. going to highlight two urgent and necessary of those action steps. First, the city must release every person in its jails that it is capable of doing and not send one more person there. We cannot have a government program that takes people and locks them in an environment in which its own chief medical officer says exposes them to the risk of death and in fact continues to cause death. We are all responsible for each of the 10 people who died this year. And we all must do everything in our own power, as so many people have highlighted today, to stop the horrors and get people out. The mayor, the commissioner, DAs, judges, council members, state lawmakers, all have the power to get people out of these jails and you all must do everything that is within your own power to do so. Do what you can do. Second, and as one thing the city council can and must do immediately is to amend and pass legislation to, so, to end all forms of solitary confinement and utilize alternatives that are proven to actually reduce violence and improve the health and well being of everyone. Whatever it is called, a shower cell, RMAS, whatever the name, if someone is locked alone in a cell, it is solitary, it is violent, it causes devastating harm, Time it worsens violence in jails and outside communities, and it must finally end by city council legislation. You have the power to do it, and you must do it immediately. There are programs that involve separation without isolation, like CAPS that already exists in the city jails and the RSVP program in San Francisco jails that have been proven to be so much more effective to actually reduce violence. If we're actually concerned about safety, use these programs that work while they also improve people's well-being. Just one example, and I know my time is up. The RSVP program involved people who had carried out assaults, sexual assaults, other actions labeled as quote unquote heinous, and yet over a one year period that it was studied, violent incidents in that program dropped to zero. So we know what works, let's do it. I appreciate what council member Powers said earlier about the mayor's office doing what is in their control. I now urge the city council to do what is in your control. Amending and passing this legislation has been long overdue. Brandon Rodriguez is dead because he was locked in solitary confinement in a shower and left to die and he was 25 years old. And he is just one of the 10 people who have died in the last nine months. It is long past time to address this crisis. The city has literally killed New Yorkers with its jails and it cannot continue to do so. And everyone must do what is in your power to decarcerate immediately, to end solitary, to end medical neglect, to end abuse and to address 
this humanitarian crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Next, we'll hear from Victor Pate, followed by Johnny Perez, followed by Eileen Marr. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Powers, for creating this platform to hear from the voice of the people. My name is Victor Pate, New York statewide organizer for the Halt Solitary Confinement Campaign, formerly incarcerated, healing survivor of solitary confinement. September 1971, I was incarcerated on Rikers Island. And to think, 50 years later, I'm hearing horror stories, horrific stories of things that are going on at Rikers Island that was going on then. Not much has changed from 1971 to now. In light of the Attica riot, in light of the conditions that led to the Attica riot, we are still living in these inhumane conditions that people should not be living in. We heard these stories, we heard the same stories. I don't wanna be repetitive, but all I can say it is outrage. I am outraged, I am sick, I am tired to listen to the stories and hear the horrors of things that are happening to our fellow human beings at the hands of other human beings. We need to decarcerate. We need to really, truly end solitary confinement. I heard Bocicio tell a bold-faced lie that solitary confinement had been ended. He lied, it is not ended, and if they tell you that it has, they have deceived the public, they have deceived this, this panel, and they should be fired, and they should not be allowed to hold to position because they are not people of moral principle. If they believe and tell the people that they have ended solitary confinement and they have not, it is a blatant lie. It is just reprehensible. It is morally reprehensible to think and hear of the stories of that's going on to our fellow human being. I happened to visit Rikers Island the week before last. Time is I'm sorry, I have to finish this statement. I visited AMKC. I spoke personally with the people in there. Horrible. They're living in condition where you have up to 80 people in the dorms. They do everything in the dorms. They are living in solitary like conditions, no recreation, no religious services, no counseling, no medical care, no nothing. I happened to visit the women's facility yesterday. Oh, Rose M. Singer, hearing the same stories from the women, no recreation. I was no almost policy. a witness to an incident where the people were asking and begging the correctional officers for recreation, of which they never got. Where I seen the squad was ready to roll in the dorm and subdue only because they was asking for recreation. When I say to you, you have the power to make policies, to make things happen. Each and every one of you should visit Rikers Island. You should not allow this continuation of human rights abuse to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Now we will hear from Johnny Perez, followed by Eileen Marr, followed by Dr. Minister Victoria Phillips. Time starts now. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Johnny Perez. I work with Director of the United States Prison Programs for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. Uh, we're comprised of more than 300 religious organizations today, and, and today uh, uh, my remarks reflect over 75,000 individuals that we represent. I'm also a person who's been directly impacted by the system, having spent a total of 13 years in prison, uh, three of those years in solitary confinement, much of that time on uh, 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 Rikers Island, C-74, OBCC, and VCBC. I want to be clear about the fact that the mayor, the city council, and the, and, the, and the DOC has a moral responsibility to protect the people regardless of race, social class, sexual identity, and yes, even those who've allegedly transgressed against society. And to continue sending people into known and eminent danger on Rikers Island, as, as it was made very clear today, we can all agree that Rikers Island is dangerous. But to know that is dangerous, and then to and then and then to effort and then and then to continue sending people there is not only a miscarriage of justice, but a direct contradiction to the oath in which all of you legislators who are still here, for the one or two who are still here, took, um, uh, took getting into, took, uh, excuse me, taken into office. We heard some of the names before. We, we we actually really didn't even mention the names throughout this hearing, right? We've been talking about coronavirus officers' jobs and their and their benefits and bringing more bringing more officers and, and everybody's jobs and nobody's talking about the people. 
Nobody's talking about how Richard, Richard Blake died after telling staff he wasn't feeling well. Nobody's talking about how Robert Jackson died while locked in solitary without staff on for 15 hours. And I'm gonna tell you, I spent three years in solitary confinement and that is the worst. You do not have a right when you are in complete control of another human being, their care, custody, and control, whether they eat, you do not have a right to neglect them. It's a felony. It's a felony. Ask me how I know that. It's called neglect. If I let my daughter locked inside her room for 24 a week on end, time expired. I would, I would, I would literally be facing. I would literally be facing time. And, and, and we can talk about the time because I think how, Bill, how, how how the department and, 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 and the union responded to the to the lot of time shows just a glimpse, Mr. Powers. When he spoke over you, I saw that vein on your forehead. You didn't like that. When when, when he cut you off. When he didn't let you talk, now imagine if this person was under your complete control, you wouldn't feel safe. Nobody here would feel safe. We saw that. We felt, in fact, we felt that. We also felt what Melania said, when she said, some people, D.A. Clark, deserve, deserve to be treated like humans. Some, why not all? We're not reaching. This is a reflection of what we're dealing with. And the only thing I can agree with is that, yes, easier, this has been happening for years. So it makes us feel like, what are we doing? We organize, we put two people in position to represent the people. And you turn around and give the entire meeting to DOC and you got the people last? Where's DOC now? Who cares about the people? Where are the rest of the council members who care about the people? Somebody just checked off again, look, right? Because the advocates, the folks who are most harmed, who are, who are at the bottom of this conversation are always left to the end. And then we sound, then we sound oh, look at him, he's, he's animated. If, you're, you know, if, if your son died, You'd be animated too. I heard all oh, men, I'm sorry about the meeting here. And you know what? Say sorry to the families. I'm still alive, right? The city council can no longer send people to an island, lock them in their cells without access to full medical care and access to the courts and leave them to die without their family's ability to do anything about it. If you're a parent, you feel me right now. If your son or daughter was in a position that you couldn't help. We, need to not, we, we, need, we do not need to expand the failure of this system Right? And the answer is not more punishment, neglect, or reopening any more facilities that are centered on punishment. The only way to keep both existing staff and our family members safe is by advancing legislation that increases the rate of, of, of decarceration. And my colleagues already spoke about that. This is nothing new. The city must amend, I'm, I'm, I'm confirmed, must be amending legislation to truly end solitary confinement. Night crew told y'all years ago that they, they said no solitary. We saw all those key block numbers. I know I'm not the only person that saw it. I'm almost done. Right. All right. Thank you. All right, thank so, you. So, so we need so we need to make sure that we hold them accountable. Lastly, because and I appreciate the apologies, but when you change a meeting without little to no notice, people get excluded. So lastly, I'm going to add the last uh, two sentences from two mothers who would not be able to come here because as a result, really sure the only two sentences and says, uh, Mr. Perez, I'm writing you because my brother's on Rikers Island jail. He tells me that there are people starving, they're cutting each other, sex abuse. My brother's in danger, no officers there. He says, after 12, he says, after 12 a.m., my brother says, the purge begins. I know I'm not the only one that's seen that movie. And I fear for my brother's life. I hope this message reaches to those who it has to go. Really quick, the second mother, there's no, there's so much corruption there. They are locked for 23 hours a day, most days, barely get wrecked. The girls are withdrawn and thrown in a cell like garbage and left there to be checked on. Leaders have to really ask themselves, why did we take this job? It's not about jobs. This is about people. And this is definitely not about politics. It's about the truth. Thank you, Council Member. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Now we will hear from Eileen Marr, followed by Dr. Minister Victoria Phillips, followed by Donna Hilton. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Eileen Marr. I'm an organizer with the Justice for Women's Task Force, and I'm also a member of Fault Solitary and a civil rights union leader with Vocal New York. I'm a woman who has been formally incarcerated, spending over 14 months at Rosie's on the island prior to drafting upstate. I've been a longtime advocate for all of my past and present incarcerated sisters at Rosie's, as well as my male and male identifying brothers behind the bar, behind those bars. A few weeks back, I had the opportunity to tour part of the part of the Rose M. Singer Center. And to be blunt, I feel it was a horse and pony show. Some niceties, such as the implementation of new programs and services were paraded in front of us in the hopes of curbing our complaints and putting on a good show. However, it only reinforced my passion and calling to advocate for, for my sisters. 
frankly, I didn't see anything had changed since my departure from Rosie six years ago. And the COVID epidemic has only heightened these, uh, those poor conditions. I met and saw women and female identifying women who were living in units without properly working HVAC systems and a, and a steady infest, infestation of insects and black mold, an, epide an em epidemic that can only be remedied via trained mold removal specialists. Corecraft milicide no longer works if they're even getting it. Women confided in me then, as well as prior to and following my visit, as recently as this past weekend, that they are not getting sanitary products, aka Kotex, on a, on a consistent basis, and sometimes not at all. Some officers, when they can get a hold of one to ask, have even resorted to asking the women for quote unquote proof that they require a new pad via showing the said officer a fully used and soaked product. Time expired. <laughs> They had to show a CO a personally used pad soaked in blood. Women are not receiving routine and emergency medical care, including mental health care, finger sticks, medicine for diabetes and hypoglycemic medication, and anything else under the sun. In fact, a woman has recently confided in me that as a means to treat uh, chronic pain from sickle cell disease, they wanted to give her methadone rather than the non-narcotic pain Pain, rel uh, pain reliever she has used with success for the entirety of her life. She, and she has never had a history of using any opiates, making it dangerous for her to use the methadone. And yes, sexual assaults are on the rise at Rosie's. However, these assaults are being perpetrated by COs towards the detainees. This was rampant six and a half years ago, 60 years ago, and today. And yes, there are chronic and excessive incidents of short staffed and officers working triple shifts, as well as units going without staff for entire shifts. As a result of this, individuals are locked in their cells for days at a time with no human contact, living in their own feces, no showers, medicine, food, et cetera, et cetera. Thus creating an on the spot solitary confinement unit, AKA the Bing, something that is now supposed to be illegal. However, have you, ever, have you ever heard of the blue flu? Myself and many of my comrades firmly believe that the AWOLs and utilization of sick days are pre-planned with the blessing and orchestration of the officers and COVA. This must be stopped and they must be held accountable. These okay, individuals- We need to wrap up, thanks. Okay. We have a lot of folks left. I'm almost finished. These individuals detained are our mothers, brothers, sisters, and brothers. They are not convicted but regardless, they are still human beings. No human should be treated in such a manner, whether it be by accident or with intention. And with the epidemic of the officers using their blue flu, it becomes intentional. Mm -hmm. And this on top of an in international pandemic of a highly infectious virus. In conclusion, I am appealing to the city and state to step in and, uh, and remedy all of these actions inside Rikers Island Rosie's and the borough, jail, borough jails I have, that I've just described. I also urge the signage and passage of less is more and the, abol uh, and the abolition of paid of cash bail. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dr. Minister Victoria Phillips, followed by Donna Hilton, followed by Leah Faria. Time starts now. Peace and blessings, everyone. Can you hear me? I need some acknowledgement. Can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. We hear you. Okay, thank you. So first, I'd like to point out on the record, well, my name is Minister Dr. Victoria Phillips, and that wasn't actually put on today. I had to put a sign up to have my credentials added. But I would like to say I'm from the Jails Action Coalition, longtime member, Justice for Women Task Force, and many other coalitions around the criminal legal system and fighting for your constituents' rights. Um, I'd like to point out today that if white people were detained or the majority working on Rikers were white, this conversation wouldn't even need to be had. Let's just, let's be clear on that. And we do need to decrease population, clear the drugs out, get the officers back, and have DOC follow minimum standards. And so I want to say that I actually sat on DOC advisory board for the last six years, and now I'm co-chair for the Young Adults Task Force. So for over a decade now, I've come before city council providing direct unknown facts and stats regarding all that are detained, 
or work behind New York City DOC walls. I'm disgusted at this council today where three council member females, one council member male, asked about sexual assaults regarding staff, yet not one of you asked about sexual assaults regarding the detained. And you know what's crazy? I've testified before the city council regarding this exactly. And today, for the first time, you had DA Clark right here on the Zoom with us. And none of you asked her about the over 600 cases I brought to you several times on the record from 2018 that she testified April 2019 regarding the Priya in front of BOC and said over 60% of that six over 600 cases were against officers. How many has she followed up on to city council or the board of corrections? I'm still waiting for those numbers. Today, Doc, uh, Council Member Powers, no disrespect, but I'm disgusted with you as well because you I'm know expired. is one of two medical doctors on the oversight for DOC, yet you cut him off, you silenced him when his entire testimony should have been placed on the record. Lives are um are 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 being um lost because of this. And 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 I really want you to understand this because in 2021. Detained still can't call city council. So city council is not going to Rikers in the boat the way they should. How are the people that's being detained in violations and had their human rights be um, violated reaching out to city council if you're not going to them? Five years ago, I testified in front of you, council member powers, to increase DOC's budget. Why? So officers could um, take people to programming and that so investigation units could expand themselves to actually do proper investigations. They all have fallen short pre-COVID. So now COVID is an excuse, but it cannot be allowed. And lastly, I want to point out that we talk about the deaths. Today was supposed to be about the conditions in Rikers. You could have given part of the meeting for officers, but not the entire meeting and, and not speak about the detained. And I want to point out the new units for solitary are supposed to open November 1st, 2021. Yet DOC commissioner and all underneath him have told you they have no control of the jails. Their officers are not shown Went up. We have two people in 2021 that died in solitary, one person in 2021 that died in the MO unit, and yet you are still not ending solitary confinement in New York City, allowing DLC to open up a new solitary unit, and you have blood on your hands. Five people have passed away this summer. In June 2021, I asked the BOC chair how many more people have to die under her hand. I want to ask city council, why is the chair still the chair at BOC? When she comes late, she leaves early. She has never sat in a full meeting this year alone. And she has no follow-up. And five people have died this summer underneath her watch. Make change. Do your jobs. Step up. Now is the time. And actually listen to us before another death happens. You're thanking people like this is all new. But incarcerated individuals have come to you, poured their hearts out. I've come to you, poured my heart out. And you do no follow-up. Shame on all of you and blood is on all your hands. Peace and blessings. Next, we will hear from Donna Hilton, followed by Leah Faria, followed by Audrey Johnson. Time starts now. I don't know what else could be said behind Dr. Um, v with that one, but um, my name is Donna Hilton. I'm not even going to go into any uh, roles or anything like that right now because it doesn't make sense. I'm preaching to the choir, the same choir. So the choir that's left, I'm going to direct this at you. Um, Keith, we've been talking about this for years now. Since I came out nine years ago, I've been testifying and talking about Rikers Island since what, 2013, 2014? I, I don't know what else to say. I'm just saying this, you have the power in your hands to remove the mayor who right now is a public health problem. We have 10 deaths in nine months and no one's really talking about that. Everybody's left, no one wants to hear anything. We have families of people sitting here right now who should be heard, they should have been first. Forget about everybody else. If, you, if I committed a murder, you want to do something with me. So I'm saying now, I'm challenging you to do something with our city government. It's, not, it, it's inhumane and it's cruel. De Blasio has to go at everybody else. The deputy mayor that was talking, half of what he was saying didn't even make sense. He had no stats. He was running, running around circles and thought that we, uh, we were going to fall for it. We're not falling for it. It's too much. So I'm saying circumvent the crime, the, the crime bill. The money that was poured into um, the police unions and law enforcement and, and everything else, circumvent that. Put monies into communities and the programs that can help the people. We have people right here doing the work. 
We have organizations that are better able to support and serve the people that are on Rikers Island being murdered and being slaughtered, being abused, being victimized. It's not just that we feel for the officers, we feel for them. They're the same people in our communities. But don't tell me that right now we're gonna, we're gonna allow people to use COVID as an excuse, as an excuse to exacerbate the inhumane conditions that we know that's, that's Rikers Island. Shut that island down. We don't need to wait till 2027. Shut it down. And Time decrease. expired. And we should do that right now. This council has the power to do it. The, those of you that are left mimicking Dr. V right now, those of you that are left, you know what we can do. We've been saying this for years. We're tired of saying this. No more. Enough is enough. These are murderers. Exercise your power. This is a public health crisis. This mayor is a public health threat. Shut that island down and decarcerate and get rid of de Blasio right now. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Leah Faria, followed by Audrey Johnson, followed by Betsy Ramos. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Faria, and um, I'm here as a person that's formerly incarcerated. And we heard a lot of testimony today, a lot of blah, blah from, you know, politicians that came forth and spoke about issues that, you know, really affected more of the staff, the correction officers, more so than the, the individuals that were detained on Rikers Island. And in 1997, I was sent to Rikers Island and I spent three years on Rikers Island fighting my case. And the mental, the physical and emotional abuse that I endured, you know, it traumatized me to the point to where to this day, I feel like I would rather experience death than be, be, be reincarcerated at Rikers Island. Um, I lived in constant fear for my safety. I isolated myself in a cell for extensive amount of time, you know, just because of the condition that was around me. And, you know, I look at the situation today and it's, and it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, lives are being lost, families are being, you know, destroyed. And nobody cares, you know. I'm just baffled at, at DA Clark, and something just has to be done with her. And it, it's just sad to the point to where people are continuously, you know, saying it's a problem, it's a problem. Let's change the P into a D and let's get it done. That's what needs to be done. Right? Because I don't need to be closed like yesterday, you know. I mean, just to think about the, the history of Rikers Island, you know, you house garbage on Rikers Island. So you're basically saying that human beings, the lives of human beings are, are, are worth garbage. You know, that, 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 that says a lot. That needs to be dismantled and people need to be released. People are being housed there on technical violations. And for what, extensive amount of time? It's just, it's just it's ridiculous, it's unnecessary, and it's a straight violation to our human rights. So I just feel like Rikers Island needs to be shut down like yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Audrey Johnson, followed by Betsy Ramos, followed by Jordan Rosenthal. Uh, yes, my name, uh, yes, my name is Audrey Johnson. <clears throat> you know, I, I came here to, des to testify because I'm a formerly incarcerated woman. I've been out since 23 years, but it doesn't mean that I'm not in, I wasn't impacted. You know, this has been going on for decades. You know, I don't even really want to testify with my personal experience, but what I do want to touch on is the fact and being an echo of what everybody else said, right? Like we are left last to talk to one another. The, the, the leaders is not here to hear our voice, right? So it's like, to me, it's, it's a total disrespect. To me personally, I'm taking this real personal. I really am, right? Because I sat here for hours, wait to testify, wait to be heard. You know, because I'm out here, but I also have a cousin that's in there that has mental illness, right? He's not been, his mental illness is not being addressed, right? He's been in and out of the prison system, but yet still no one addressed the mental illness aspect of it, right? So we sit here to talk to one another, but I sat here to listen to the leaders basically argue and bicker with each other. That's what they did. And I said to myself, and I was listening, and then they was talking about the dreams and, and, and the hope of change. Lord's dreams awaken a new possibility to rise, right? We're talking about the less and more is bill, right? Less is more, it means let's talk more actions, right? Let's build a foundation here to make change 
with Raggedy Down. And let's start by closing it down. Let's start by, you know, with parolees, right? Not being violated just because of a curfew, a 10 minute uh, of curfew. And the first thing they do is be incarcerated. Not being a new uh, 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 crime being, being met. They being incarcerated, you know what I'm saying, because they have a drug addiction. They being incarcerated because they have mental illness. But nobody is not addressing the underlying issue. And this has been going on for de decades. My first incarceration is I was an adolescent. They offered nothing to young people. Time expired? Nothing. Nothing. So I really don't really want to talk to the people that's here right now. I suggest that, you know what I'm saying, whoever's left here, that the next platform, we do this differently. Like allow the people to be heard before everybody else leaves. We sat here a whole eight hours to listen to them, and they're not here to stay on the platform and listen to us. That is a total disrespect. And if you think that, you know what I'm saying, you've given us the opportunity to do something, this is not doing anything. We only listening to one another. Nothing is being heard. We are not being heard. As a community, you know what I'm saying, we are not being heard. Debt alone needs to be changed. All right. Thank That's you. That's the only way change is going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Betsy Ramos, followed by Jordan Rosenthal, followed by Lucia Alonso. Time starts now. Um, hello. Um, my name is Betsy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK. My name is Betsy Ramos, and I spent the year on Rikers Island 24 years ago awaiting trial. I arrived at Rikers Island, a victim of domestic abuse, and due to the media publicity surrounding the crime, I was treated horribly. My trauma as a victim of domestic abuse was never recognized by the Department of Corrections while I was there. Instead, I was assaulted by a female correctional officer and rearrested because of the publicity surrounding my case. And as a result of that, I tried to kill myself three times. I was placed in a mental health unit for in-depth treatment, and the mental health unit recommended that I be given in-depth treatment and not be placed in solitary confinement. Department of Corrections overrode that and put me in solitary confinement. Um, I never received any type of help for my trauma nor my mental health. 24 years later, nothing has changed in Rikers Island. People are still being assaulted rearrested for being assaulted, being denied mental health treatment, but most devastatingly still dying. The Department of Corrections and most specifically, Rikers Island has failed to provide a safe and humane environment for those who are placed in their institution. Please let, let, let us not forget that those who are placed in Rikers Island are innocent until proven guilty and should be treated as such. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the testimony. Next, we'll hear from Jordan Rosenthal, followed by Lucia Alonzo, followed by Danielle Gerard. Time starts now. Hi, so my name is Jordan Rosenthal, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Women's Community Justice Association. And I want to thank the chairs for having this important hearing. But more importantly, what I really need to say is that this hearing should have been a visit to the jails themselves that included Rosie's. Um, I've heard people talk about the women, but we've heard so little information about the conditions that women are currently facing. I wrote this whole testimony and I will submit that separately, but I want you to also think about the conditions that they're facing. I've heard from an anonymous source that during the um, really intense weather we've had, it actually flooded in Rosie's. Can you imagine being in a cell and then there starts to be flooding, thinking like that's another way that I'm going to die? How can you even like, we need to have better conditions. We need to release people. The number of women and gender expansive people who've been detained since the beginning of the pandemic has more than doubled. We need to close the Rose M. Singer Center. And I want us to have a moment to thank Carlina Rivera, Stephen Levin, and Helen Rosenthal for publicly committing and signing on to the Beyond Rosies campaign, saying that they want the closure of the Rose M. Singer Center as soon as possible. 
and I urge you as well, um, council member powers, I know you are an advocate for this and it probably, may, hopefully it just haven't seen it, but you know, this is urgent. We can start decarcerating. I've seen the data myself, as people have said, people are still being held on a misdemeanors who have bail that don't have parole holds, but we shouldn't even be talking about that. There's we need to put the violent versus nonviolent binary away and talk about the fact that people are innocent. And even if they aren't innocent, we are talking about human lives, regardless of what other people may have said. In I'm expired. I thank you. And I'm sorry for getting so emotional. Um, I really appreciate everyone who has stayed on and for your time, council member powers. And if there are any other council members or staff people on it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, we'll hear from Lucia Alonzo, followed by Danielle Gerard, followed by Melissa Taylor. Time starts now. Good morning, members of the New York City Council, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lucia Alonzo, and I work with the Women's Community Justice Association. I am infuriated and disgusted. This is despicable. I've been listening all day about people speak about the humanitarian crisis on Rikers, but everyone continues to point fingers at each other and not take accountability for their own departments and agencies' failings. I keep hearing people blame incarcerated people for the violence on the island, but they are the ones dying and being forced to live in inhumane conditions. The answer to stopping the horrific violence on the island is not additional correctional officers, but to release people from the island. The city has shown us time and time again that they are unable to keep people alive and healthy and meet their most basic human needs. The city must stop sending people to an island, locking them in cells without access to food, medical care, hygiene products, and leaving them to die without their loved one's ability to know or do anything about it. In regards to the women detained on Rikers, we must close the Rosam Singer Center immediately. The number of women detained has more than doubled since the beginning of the pandemic. Rosie's is a decrepit building that is vulnerable to flooding as seen in the past two severe storms we have had. We have gotten reports from women on Rikers that there's no access to hygiene products, including pads and tampons, leading people to bleed on themselves and through their clothes. There's no access to mental health support for weeks at a time and no one to speak to about general health issues. What is meant to be a jail sentence has turned into a death sentence. The mayor, judges, DAs, and city council have the responsibility to fully decarcerate now and stop sending people to city jails in order for this crisis to end. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. Now we will hear from Danielle Gerard, followed by Melissa Taylor, followed by Shadika Hampton. Time starts now. My name is Danielle Gerard, and I'm a senior staff attorney at Children's Rights, a member of the New York City Jails Action Coalition. As you have heard, people incarcerated in city jails are suffering a life and death crisis. They are going without food, water, and basic medical care. At least nine have died in 2021 alone. The most recent man to die on Rikers was 24 years old. Hundreds of correction officers are on sick out or just not coming to work. Violence is way up and nine times higher for young adults than for adults. Youth report there is more violence than they have ever seen on the island. They also state if there were meaningful programming, there would be less violence. The commissioner himself has acknowledged that programming and supportive services are not simply tools for safety and security. They are safety and security. The endless finger pointing we read about in the press is not saving lives on Rikers. It is not making incarcerated persons safe. It is not improving conditions for the correction officers working double and triple shifts to make up for the third of their coworkers who don't bother showing up at all. Responsible officials have taken action before and must do so again. Early in the pandemic, the number of people incarcerated here dropped by thousands. We urge you to pass legislation immediately to deal with this crisis. It should prioritize decarceration, increase mental health diversion, eliminate bail payments, and otherwise get as many people out of jail as possible. Data concerning just who is incarcerated make this legislation critical for the fair, just, and humane treatment of persons accused of crimes in New York City. Ask yourselves, what kind of society throws thousands of people in jail and then abandons them? You can and you must stop this wretched treatment of our fellow human beings, especially the more than 1,200 who are under 26 years old and who will surely be scarred for life. 
The time to act, the time to force the mayor to act is now. How many more people must die before our elected officials take action? Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I refer you to my written testimony for data and other details. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Thanks for being here. Now we will hear from Melissa Taylor, followed by Shadika Hampton, followed by Messiah Ram Kisun. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Melissa Taylor. I'm representing WCJA. I thank you for hearing me, my testimony committee and chairman. I'm telling you the reports of conditions in Rosie's we are getting are deplorable between flooding and way hotter than what you would call humane heat in their cells. You know, being you're treated like a caged animal. Would you leave your beloved dog at boarding in these conditions? No, I know these people are incarcerated, but I'm formally incarcerated myself. And I know the normal conditions in that you go through being in Rosie's. These conditions are not acceptable because being locked in a cell alone makes you lose your freedom. Why the torturous conditions on top of all this? Staff shortages, inmates running around with open wounds. I just can't imagine the chaos. Can you imagine this being the daily life for your relative? Thank you. Thanks for being here. Now we'll hear from Shadika Hampton, followed by Messiah Ramkissoon, followed by Susan Shaw. Time starts now. Good evening. Thank you to the chairs and committee for holding this meeting. My name is Shadika Hampton, and I'm here as part of the WCJA Beyond Rosie's campaign. When it was announced that Rikers would be closed down and that the Renewable Rikers Act will be implemented, I was filled with hope and pride as a New Yorker. I thought we were well on our way to show how America could truly be the land of the free. Now it saddens and frustrates me to know that people have plans to reopen to facilities. This is a breach of confidence and we must demand more integrity. Instead of taking an egregious leap backwards, I propose that the 317 women in the Rose M. Singer Center are released as they should have been in 2020. We, Sorry. We can't continue holding people captive in these increasingly deplorable conditions, flooding a poor air circulation and inadequate access to physical and mental hygiene necessities are some of the issues that can be remedied by decarceration and alternative to detention programs. Spend more money to keep citizens locked away is like just insulting, counterproductive and embarrassing to say the least. Overcrowding is an issue in our jail. And again, it can be easily solved by the immediate decarceration of Rosie's. Also getting rid of cash bail is another way to ensure people are not stuffed into cramped cages simply because they're low income. Lastly, investing in affordable supportive housing programs will decrease recidivism and improve outcomes for families and communities. I'm asking we do the right thing for the most vulnerable among us, starting with the 317 women at Rosie's. Supporting this cohort, cohort is a feasible drop in the bucket that will signify our commitment to uplifting, healing, emancipation, and reconciliation. It's beyond time to move beyond Rosie's. Thank you. Thank you. And just while we have a moment, I want to recognize where, uh, th thank you. We've been uh, rejoined by Councilor Riley and of course, Councilor Adams and Councilor Gibson are here as well. Thanks so much. Now we will hear from Messiah Ramkistoon, followed by Susan Shaw, followed by Wendell Walters. Time starts now. Chairman Keith Powers and all present, um, on behalf of Youth Justice Network, I would like to express my sincerest condolences to the families of the 10 lives who were lost. Um, I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Messiah Ramkisun, and I serve as the Senior Director of Programs and Community Partnerships for the Youth Justice Network. I ask the council and this city to act with urgency to keep black and brown lives alive on Rikers Island and to put in place a tangible supportive infrastructure so they may be able to make a life and future for themselves upon being released. 
Youth Justice Network, formerly known as Friends of Island Academy, was founded in 1990 on the school floors of EMTC, where there were 21,000 people a night on Rikers Island, 3,500 of whom were black and brown teenagers. Our founders were teachers and advocates who worked inside and outside Rikers and who created an intentional response to the absence of transitional and aftercare services for the youngest people in custody. 18 months ago, the COVID-19 pandemic produced an intentional effort by the city to keep people alive, literally by getting them off of Rikers. Through these collaborative efforts at multiple points along the case process, daily population at Rikers dropped to below 3,809 on April 29th, the city's lowest since the 1940s. Last night, the census was 6,082. Nearly 1,100 of those people are between ages of 18 to 25. We must keep the closure of Rikers Island on track. Today, we can take intentional, swift, and collective action to reduce the average daily population by reducing admission and accelerating releases. Our recommendations are as follows. Release any young person who's not otherwise remanded by the courts and has a cash bail that they cannot post by expanding use of supervised release. Release any person who's held on a technical parole violation reducing the number of technical parole violators. Time expired. Please give me a few just to wrap this up. I'll make it fast. Reduce the number of technical parole violators will reduce, reducing the number of technical parole violators will reduce the population by 272 people. Governor Hochul can immediately take action by signing the less is more legislation. Invest in private resources and work with the city and DOC to build on alternatives to detention pending disposition of the case process, especially during the pandemic. Clear bureaucratic pathways. The city justice agencies contract with many exceptional small and medium sized organizations who stand ready to help. Accelerating the processing of payments and contracts to their organizations so they can devote all their energies to the job at hand and not to meet payroll or laying off committed staff. Speed intake and service connection. Do not allow young people to languish in intake and admissions units and connect them immediately to case process and triage services to determine whether early bail advocacy can help secure their release. Invest in community-based reentry, access to in-custody programs and services, mental health services, last but not least, use data about different gatekeepers and pathways into detention and tailor alternative pathways and alternative policy approaches to minimize decisions which result in detention or extended detention. As a coalition of partner organizations working with young people, we stand ready to intervene and to provide support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for the testimony. Next, we will hear from Susan Shaw, followed by Wendell Walters, followed by Annette Belk Tomlin. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Powers and members of the Criminal Justice and Civil Service and Labor Committees. My name is Susan Shaw, and I'm the Managing Director for Racial Justice at Trinity Church Wall Street Philanthropies. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of Trinity. Trinity carries out our mission of faith and social justice through advocacy and grant making to break cycles of mass incarceration, mass homelessness, and housing instability in New York City. I've submitted detailed written testimony, so today I will focus on five imperatives for addressing the immediate and long-term crisis in our city jails. First, provide the DOC Commissioner Vinny Stiraldi with all of the support and the resources that are needed to effectively address this crisis through the end of the current mayoral administration and into the next administration. Second, Recognize and acknowledge that more jail produces less safety in New York City, especially during a pandemic, and we must shrink the population immediately in our jails. This means closing the Rose M. Singer Center on Rikers, improving the pretrial decision-making process and speeding up case processing times and funding alternatives to incarceration for people with serious mental illness and also sentencing more people to existing community-based ATIs. Third, reaffirm the city's commitment to equitable jails by advancing the, play, the plan to close Rikers by 2026. As faith leaders, we believe that there is no humane path to make Rikers an acceptable place to detain our brothers and sisters. 
Fourth, implement a series of measures to protect the health and safety of those who are released from Rikers and other city jails during this pandemic by providing everyone who is detained with access to the vaccine, COVID testing upon release, and immediate access to Medicaid coverage upon discharge. We also encourage you to pass Council Member Gibson's intro 2394 before the end of this current session, which would provide IDNYC cards to all New Yorkers upon discharge. Time expired. Really quickly, five, invest in comprehensive coordinated reentry by strengthening Local Law 103 of 2026 to improve coordination of all reentry initiatives citywide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Wendell Walters, followed by Annette Belk Tomlin and Bilal Malik. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Wendell Walters, and I am a senior policy associate at the Osborne Association. Osborne has worked in DOC facilities for more than 25 years, and we have staff on Rikers Island providing services in the housing and visiting areas five days per week. New initiatives to address the long-term issues for the betterment of our city jails are very important. But now, now is not the time for long-term planning. Now is the time for action. First, we call for the immediate reduction in the amount of people sent to Rikers. And this relies on the collaborative efforts of those outside of DOC. Prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges should aggressively explore alternatives to detention and diversion programming wherever possible. Bail should be based on ability to pay and any decision to detain must take into account the cost and risk of the overwhelmed nature of detention in DOC custody. Second, greater decarceration efforts are also needed and we know this can be done. Bold action that led to the census of 3,800 people in custody during the height of the pandemic a year ago should be reinvigorated. The census is now almost double. We call for the utilization of Article 6A and for the release of those on parole violations. We also call on our DAs to use the power of their officers to expand the use of community supervision. The state readies need to be transferred and DOC must prioritize, still prioritize getting defendants to court. And lastly, the glaring staffing shortages negatively affects all aspects of jail operations leading to unsafe conditions for living, working and visiting the island. The burden put on those who come to work for doubles and triples leads to even more dangerous conditions as some units are without supervision resulting in cuts lockdowns and other units staffed by others or by officers who are sleep deprived. We know this can continue. We hope the mayor's emergency action effectively addresses staff shortages and improve the really poor attendance. It's obvious the department needs immediate staffing assistance and Osborne supports the help of other jurisdictions to alleviate this condition. We know there are many other critical issues like the intake Time and expired. the impact on programming, but we want to help amplify the most important. We echo all those who call for immediate action. This urgent call is not a critique of the current DOC leadership. We believe they are sincere and working around the clock to fix these problems. We need a transparent, all hands on deck approach in order to ensure safety for Warren Rikers as we work to shrink the population and ultimately close the island in favor of borough-based jails that are smaller and more humane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Thanks for being here. Next, we'll hear from Annette Belk Tomlin, followed by Bilal Malik, followed by Mark Moses. Time starts now. Good afternoon and greetings to all. My name is Annette Tomlin, and I am a proud member and leader of Vocal New York. Although I have never been incarcerated, my loved ones have been. I am horrified more so now than ever, of what's going on in our city jails, and it is totally inhumane. It is a reminiscent of the horror of the transatlantic trade ships, where people were stolen and they were forced to live in tight sanitary spaces. People are dying, not just because of the pandemic or the conditions, but because of it has been in existence prior to. The fact that millions of dollars are being spent to warehouse people for days, weeks, months, and years without access to services that they need is outrageous, and it is criminal. These same monies that can be utilized to revitalize the communities uh, that are suffering and that are lack of the investments in permanent houses and job opportunities, such as also food securities and accessible to health care, 
we would truly like for you to actually build a city that is fair with equity and true transparency and accountability. And if we need you to meet the demands of the moment, and it has to be to close Rikers. Stop this million dollar industry and corruption and abuse of power that has been replayed since the beginning. And I expect you all and your comrades to step up to the plate and do the right thing or step aside and those that have integrity, allow them to do so. Close Rikers and decarcerate now and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And to everyone, thank you for waiting. I know a very long day. Next, we will hear from Bilal Malik, followed by Mark Moses, followed by John McFarlane. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chapman Bilal Abdul Malik. Um, I'm here to testify that my son, is on the island. He's been there almost a year and back and forth, the courts are closed. They need to open up the courts because there's a whole lot of people sitting there that could be in the street with their loved ones. He had five kids that's missing him a lot. And he got a big family that we miss him a lot in the street. They scooped him up, brought him back here to New York, got him sitting in, in Rackham Valley, for nothing. They don't have nothing. The penal law says the same thing. It depends on the case, how long they're going to hold them in there. That six months, like they were saying, is over. It's over. Let my son out of there. And if he got the COVID, he, he, he mentioned over the phone that he's not getting the proper medication if he got it. So why are you going to let his, his family? Suffer. My son need to be home with his, with his loved ones. Open up them gates, close it down. Even back in 1968, when they cleaned out the tombs because of the same trash that's going on in, in Racket Island, living like that. The whole Racket Island is a special housing unit right now. We're living in feces, uh, uh, in closed rooms, stuff like that there. It's not not healthy, it's, it's a long human life. Those you got a death trap there. There's a death trap for the uh, uh, COs, the death trap for the inmates, death trap for the custodians, death trap for the administration. It's a death trap. And then also, I'm a veteran. And the veterans that have the PTSD, Hi, next bite. Down, they, they, they suffer schizophrenia, Bipolar, you got a lot of that there. You ain't got no, no doctors there for that. And that so-called uh, medical uh, building that you got is not updated. It's not updated. It's not a, 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 a for, for people. That thing is that's a, a, a give you a shot and send you back to the cell to die. That's it. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here today. That's fine. Next, you will hear from Mark Moses, followed by John McFarlane, followed by Carl Stubbs. Time starts now. My name is Mark Moses. I'm a vocal leader. And my minister, I've been, remember, I've been in jail. Can, can you speak up? Okay, oh, yeah, there you go. Can you speak up just a little bit? I've been in jail a thousand times. I've been in jail since 1979, back and forth. All right now, I've been through COVID. I've been I've been through COVID. I've been through TB. I've been over jumping, overcrowded. And it's the same stuff. And not just that, you know, behind CEOs, the CEOs is the problem. They bring guns in there. They gain members too. So they're part of the problem too. And the judges and the police officers, judges, police are already book, bullshit charges. The judges, the judges hang on to that. You need to change the whole to tradition system. The blind lady who can't shoot the unbalanced skill, you need to fix that. Lawyers, because that's part, that's where it starts from. Arrested to see the judge to Rock Island. Back to Rock Island. Look, we, this is not what to say. This sign tell you all right here. It's simple. Same right here. That's it right there. 
And y'all heard from you heard from the people, from the people, the real people. We decide. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. We decide. We decide. Next, we will hear from John McFarlane, followed by Carl Stubbs, followed by Scott Hines. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to the council members and all interested stakeholders. My name is John McFarlane. I am an active civil rights union leader at Vocal New York. But there is a growing crisis on Rikers Island that is quickly turning into an extinction level event. I term it as such because people are dying in Rikers and other jails around our city at an alarming rate. There have been 10 deaths this year alone, and if you have to ask why, then tune into the words of our elected officials who just this week witnessed the unbearable and inhumane conditions that detainees and others are enduring on this island. The people caged on Rikers have to share cells with insects the size of small birds. Others are forced to sit in their own feces under conditions of excruciating temperatures due to recurring New York City heat waves with no access to clean water or fresh air. Individuals locked themselves have resorted to sharing a jug, one jug of water in order to stay hydrated. There is little to no access to standard medical care recreational activities. Combine these deficiencies with COVID-19 and you have a perfect storm resulting in continuous fatalities under a system unwilling to reform in the name of humanitarianism. And while some might suggest that more funding to employ additional counsel, I'm sorry, to employ additional correction officers would significantly improve both the working conditions and living conditions on Rikers Island. I respectfully argue that this action would simply enable more correction officers to neglect individuals who are languishing behind bars, who will continue to be denied access to vital medication, life-saving treatment, nutritional food services, and recreational activities, all in the name of staffing shortages. I reason that the ultimate solution to the growing problem is to close Rikers Island, the whole facility, and release individuals from an institution that is responsible for imposing the ultimate penalty upon pretrial detainees without due process or just cause. Our elected officials, policymakers, legal professionals, judicial advocates, criminal justice activists, and the public at large must all have a role toward abolishing a penal system that punishes and oftentimes kills rather than rehabilitates. The time to act was yesterday. The time to act was decades ago. And we can't wait any longer to act. Crack the cell doors open and let these people live. And I want to conclude by saying this. I understand it's been a long day. But time and time again, and I'm not blaming the council member powers or any of his comrades, but black people are always left, the most impacted are always left to testify at the end of these hearings. That is discrimination. And maybe we need a new speaker that's a woman of color who understands the significance of allowing black people to testify to, um, among COBA officials among elected, among union officials and, and, and prison officials. We shouldn't be relegated to be testifying at the end of these sessions, talking to each other. Everybody that's left here understands, understands that what we're talking about is life and death. We wanna to talk to the people that are opposed to releasing people from prison, that are opposed to changing the standards of living on Rikers Island. And it's not fair that we are always left to talk to each other as social justice activists and criminal justice reform uh, 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 activists. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we will hear from Carl Stubbs, followed by Scott Hines, followed by Andre Ward. Time starts Hello. now. Hello, my name is Mr. Carl Stubbs. Hello, my name is Mr. Carl Stubbs, that are old time. Member of Vocal New York leader, 
Okay, this is my second time. And seven years ago, I testified by closing the right to down. All right. Mm -hmm. And still, it got worse than what it was in my seven years ago. Okay. And it's a shame how your people are working for the billionaires to keep rackets open. All right. I had, a, I had when I was in Rackets Island, I had rats jumping on me, working in the mess hall for the officer. All right. I was in solitary confinement because I refused to work at Hoss Island to bury bodies I didn't even know about. All right. 14 days in solitary. All right. I am very tired. I'm 69 years old now and going to the same thing. All right. Rackets Island is run by billionaires. Why? And I'm asking the council, please let the feds take over Rackens Island. Close Rackens Island now. It's filthy and it needs to be closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the testimony. Now we will hear from Scott Hines, followed by Andre Ward, followed by Tamara Carter. Time starts now. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Scott Hines. Um, I'm a resident of Brooklyn. Um, I'm grateful to be here with uh, Vocal today, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a public defender. Um, I don't work at an agency or foundation, and I'm certainly not an experienced activist. But I do have a dear friend of mine who is in Rikers right now, as I know many others on this call today and hearing uh, have. And I'm here today to see if I can just help give her some sort of a voice in all of this. Uh, my friend Amy was locked up in Rikers and has been there since the middle of the summer. Um, she has several months left on her sentence. Amy is not her real name, and I'm not going to use her real name because we definitely are afraid of any sort of retaliation that might happen, even just by me being here sharing her words in this hearing. Um, she calls me multiple times a week and her stories of what's going on at Rikers Island and what she experiences at the hands of the Department of Corrections staff is absolutely horrific. Uh, the abuse and aggression that is carried out on her and her other inmates. I wanna say that I think it's shameful today that this hearing is being held without any incarcerated people present and allowed to testify. And that the people that are most impacted by the decisions of council members and union leaders here have been kept out of the entire conversation. I spoke with Amy earlier this week, and I'm going to now read some of her words that are her first-hand account from what's going on at Rikers right now. Please, I ask you to take this to heart. These are Amy's words and not mine now. The conditions of Rikers Island have turned my life into a living hell. I am a bird trapped in a cage. The suggestion that more money for the DOC will fix the situation here at Rikers is a lie. It is a lie. Things are terrible here now, and the CEOs brag to be a hump about how much money they make. But at the same time, they do not care about my safety or my well being. They see people here that need help, and they do nothing about it. The CEOs harass us. They join in when there is an argument and join in on the fights, or they completely ignore us. If we make That's a statement that goes nowhere, the staff at Rikers read your statement and throw it in the trash. If you're in here and you call 311, you face retaliation. If you're a correctional officer, you're supposed to correct, but anyone in Rikers who reaches out to help or for oversight gets treated as an outcast. They say you're supposed to shut up and take it. If you complain about clogged toilets, they say you clogged it to get attention. In my time here at Rikers, I have seen fellow incarcerated people put on suicide watches. The COs say it's just to get attention. I know if I were suicidal, if I were up on a ledge, they wouldn't talk me down. They would tell me to just go ahead and jump. If I could talk to the bosses of the Department of Corrections, I would ask, why are you even working? Why did you sign up? Why put on your uniform if all you are going to do is harass us and hurt us every day? If you're in jail in New York, the COs are just another form of punishment against people. If I could talk to the politicians that know what's going on in this jail and still keep it open, I would say, stop using us, stop ignoring us, stop putting us in jail. The lawyers, the courts, the police, the jail, it's all getting so much money for every incarcerated person and it's all so wrong. My public defender pushed me into jail. They made it seem like I didn't have a choice. Everything about the system is wrong and you on the city council need to shut it down. Thank you, Phyllis. 
I yield my time. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Next, we'll hear from Andre Ward, followed by Tamara Carter, followed by Henry Robinson. Time starts now. Yes, good evening, Chairman Powers and Chairman Miller, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak. Although to someone's point earlier, we serve as the last to speak, um, which is rather unfortunate. But my name is Andre Ward and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. And Fortune's been around for over 54 years, serving folk in the community to essentially build and strengthen the lives of the people that we serve. I'm also a formerly incarcerated black man who spent three and a half years on Rikers Island from 1988 to 1992 as both an adolescent and an adult. And during this period, I experienced and witnessed countless episodes of abuse, neglect, including overcrowding of dorms, uh, people not being uh, treated because of their mental health conditions. Um, I even witnessed um, people who were detained themselves harming each other that resulted in their deaths and correctional officers harming those who were detained that resulted in their death as well. Fast forward now 29 years, and according to research and the experience of the people that we serve, Rikers Island continues to bear the conditions of the past, as we all know, right? Dorms still remain overcrowded. People who have mental health issues are not being supported and addressed. People are harming each other, both on the correction side and those who are detained themselves, right? And we know that those who had the most mental health needs are not being supported, especially when, you know, Rikers is one of the three largest providers of psychiatric care in the country. So it's a really, really important issue for us to note. And so COVID-19, as we know, has exacerbated the conditions on Rikers Island. Everyone who's spoken before me, and we thank them for their time for being here, has mentioned some of those things. So there are four things just want to stress really quickly is that one, decarcerate. Others mentioned earlier that the mayor could use Article 6A, right? Through that program itself, 312 people have been Time sentenced expired. and only a few people have returned, maybe four or five or six people. So it's really effective and it works. Um, provide greater transparency, right? The Board of Corrections, City Council, the mayor can create more transparency, more oversight on what's happening in terms of the deaths and those who ultimately have COVID-19. Um, Pads legislation like less is more and ending solitary confinement. We know that many of the elected officials, city council, and those in the Senate has said how the ending of solitary confinement is more in name only rather than in practice. And lastly, disband the New York City Department of Corrections, right? For decades, the culture of the New York City Department of Corrections has made for a demonstrably insufficient practice in providing for the safety and health of those incarcerated. From January 2019 to August 2020, 56% of the more than 270 correctional officers who were disciplined, including a dozen supervisors, lied, misled investigators, or filed incomplete or inaccurate reports. At least 17 officers made false statements in interviews with officials investigating those allegations. So I want to thank you, Chairman Powers and Chairman Miller, for allowing me to testify today and thank all of the advocates and activists for their sacrifice and time. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you always for the Fortune Society for all the work you're doing and, and for being patient today, but of course for the testimony as well. Next, we will hear from Tamara Carter, followed by Henry Robinson, followed by uh, Gabrielle Parks. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Tamara Carter. I'm the mother of Brandon Rodriguez. His name was mentioned a lot of times today which made me cry. There's nobody here that I really want to talk to anymore that's going to give me answers. I don't see DOC up here anymore. They don't care enough. I don't see the mayor. He doesn't care enough. Nobody. I, I don't really know what to say. Our family is broken. We have no answers. We're in pain right now. My son is not here. He's not coming back. And it's been 35 days that we have been crushed. The shower cells that y'all talking about, that's where my son died. 
Who's giving you the answer to that? Nobody. Where are the councilmen right now? I don't see nobody's faces. Why? I want to say, I want you to say sorry to me, but I'm tired of hearing sorry because regardless of how many sorries, he's not coming back. We need answers and immediate action. While we're sitting here today, there's people not eating, people just like Brandon, nobody cares. It's been 35 days since he's passed. And if people on Rikers Island are going through the same thing, no one cares. So why am I even speaking? The Board of Corrections, why is, uh, oh, I can't even read this. Can you read it for me? Time expired. As, as, far, as far as the report, the preliminary, the preliminary report, it's available after five days. Is it also released to the family? I have no answers to why my baby's not here no more. Why? 25 years old. He hasn't lived his life and he's gone. A week after someone else. Two weeks after him, someone else. Nobody cares. And it's disgusting. I would like answers. Our family would like answers. His sister, his brothers, his father, we want answers. We want something to happen today. I wish it would have happened before he was gone. He wasn't even in there a week and now he's gone. I wasn't even notified by DOC that my son was gone. I found out through Facebook, why? Everyone here that's left, that has some sort of pull should be ashamed of themselves. You should be ashamed. While you going to sleep with your loved ones tonight, I'm going to sleep with one less one, my baby. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony. I know you don't want to hear it, but we are all very sorry what happened. And I, I do know DOC is here and uh, text me as we are here saying that they're listening to the testimony. But I will say to them that uh, a mother should not find out about this on social media, they should go or anywhere else. We shouldn't have any deaths. There shouldn't be an 11th or 12th, 13th death in, cu in custody this year. And our duty, and I'm an elected official, and it's all of our duty is to protect people and keep them safe from harm. Um, but anything that we can do in terms of getting you information, getting you answers, we are here to do that. It will not help bring anyone back, but we certainly, you. You have our deepest condolences and for the department, everybody here who's still watching I hear, I hope you've heard this testimony and I think it adds a, another level of urgency to everything we're talking about today when it's taking people out of custody, when it's getting people out of harm's way, when we're talking about uh, situations that are putting people into further harm. And I wish the folks that we were talking about earlier when we were talking about things like people not showing up to do their, to do their duty. They would listen to, they'd be here to hear that testimony. That's the whole, that's what we're talking about. Thank you and I'm, I'm sorry, but of course we will talk to the department and the board if, as needed, if we can help you get more information. And uh, I hope I, so, we've been waiting 35 days. I, I really hope so. Okay, we'll talk to our staff here and we'll follow with them and uh, uh, I, I have the department, I think, is, has told me they're still watching. Obviously, do the same. Thank you for being here, sir. Next, we'll hear from Henry Robinson, followed by Gabrielle Parks, followed by Marvin Mayfield. Time starts now. 
Yes, hello. My name is Henry Robinson. As a community member for Brooklyn and a member of the Cattell Center for Equity, Health and Justice, I strongly urge the city to decarcerate our jails and accelerate plans to close Rikers Island Jail Complex. Um, you know, as I listen to what's going on, and I'm a person who has been in Rikers Island, you know what I'm saying, and, and went through the things that's there. And I, I would like to say my condolences for those who lost people while they was in it. And that's something that is, as a prisoner, they fear. I noticed that they fear that because I felt it myself to fear, you know, to die in prison alone without your family and, and friends and everything. And, you know, just the, 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 the fear of the unknown, not knowing when I'm gonna get out this situation. We speaking on mental health and, and, and they don't and not only go for the people that's coming into Rikers Island, but also the the the, the COs that's there. Because a lot of times people don't even know that pe they don't even know how to handle mental health people. And a lot of the people that's even governing the prisoners have mental health issues themselves. You know what I'm saying? And the only reason they in a position they at is because of the opportunity. So when the individuals in there, like I was in there for um you know, a, 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 a violation, curfew violation that was made up for my parole officer, you know, because the parole officer didn't like that uh, I had a voice that I wanted to speak up for myself. And it, and it was another parole officer where, I, where they made false allegations just to get me in Rikers, subsequently put me in a situation where I was jumped by uh, 15 or more individuals and, and I got medical attention 17 hours later and I was the victim. I got hit with crutches on my back and we had a riot. They rioted for me and another individual for medical attention because I had a broken foot where I had um, right, next riot. where I had um pins and needles in my foot. The next individual had nails and, and wires in his foot. We didn't get no medical uh, medical attention while we was there. We had to call 311. We had to get outside forces. And that's the only time change is going to happen when you have somebody on the outside to help, you know what I'm saying, to monitor what's going on. The officers in there is not, they not good people. What's going on in the street with police in general is the same thing that's going on in these correctional facilities, but more so in Rikers Island because of the, the uh, culture, you know what I'm saying? Because of the culture of Rikers Island and it's not right. It should be shut down and, and restarted and they need classes for people, they need to know it's a different time. People that's coming in Rikers Island having mental issues, they coming out with worse mental issues. They ain't near scared. They don't know when they gonna get out because there's no court date. They don't know when they gonna get out the cell, out those conditions that's not normal. It's inhumane for individuals to be in those situations. And even to ask the federal government for help. When I was in the feds just recently in 2018, I was involved with the blackout where the feds, where we got a where they got a class action lawsuit that I'm a part of because of the fact of due to their negligence and the people of authority being negligent in their job duties. You understand? So we need everything changed. We need Rikers Island closed down and out the way and started over appropriately. And we need outside, we need a, a, a way for out, people from the outside to connect with people in the inside more so that they could feel more security. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what it is. And that's why they acting like that. They scared and they don't know what's going to happen. And right now they're in a position where it's like they don't care what happened because everything they, they in the worst conditions that they could be in right now in their head. You understand? Hey, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. All right. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from Gabrielle Parks, followed by Marvin Mayfield, followed by Jane Elkey. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Parks, and as a member from Brooklyn and a member of the Cotal Center for Equity, Health, and Justice, I strongly urge the city to decarcerate our jails, accelerate plans to close Rikers Island Jail, and demand Governor Pocho to sign the Lessons More Act now. The current crisis on Rikers is unacceptable and has put it incarcerated individuals in life threatening situations. People are being forced to sleep in showers, toilets, and overflowing inside the cells. And incarcerated people are being left without their medications, no access to medical care or recreation time. 
and without transportation to the very hearings, which may lead to their release. This situation is ripe for disaster and more preventable deaths will occur without swift action by both city and state level officials. It is immoral and unconscionable to treat human beings this way. Um, throughout the summer, I had a loved one incarcerated on Rikers Island. My loved one has pre-existing health conditions and contracted COVID-19 while incarcerated on Rikers. This caused stress on myself and my family. As we know, there's no healthcare access much on the island um, as far as services and extremely hard to get. It was incredibly hard telling my children <clears throat> that he would be all right, when in reality, I didn't know what was gonna happen if I would, if I would make it, if to hear from him again, I don't know. Um, this put immense stress on my entire family and network. We were all locked up with him. Unfortunately, the situation happens to thousands of people across New York City. My loved one was not sentenced to die on Rikers, so he should not have been put in a dangerous situation that negatively affected his mental and physical health. Um, these are children, siblings, fathers, uncles, mothers, daughters, you know, aunts, and it's disgusting how we treat incarcerated individuals in this city and state. They are all part of the human family. Every single Time person expired. is family, and they deserve to be treated with dignity. The mayor, city council, governor must do everything in their power to address these dire crises. This year alone, we have seen record numbers of deaths on Rikers Island, which is only getting worse with district attorneys and judges continuing to send people to jail pre-trial and correction officers missing work by the thousands. This combination has led to the population of Rikers growing to over 6,000 from below 4,000 at the height of the pandemic, which is leading to overcrowding and unsafe conditions. This address, to address this current situation, the city needs to immediately start decarcerating the jail system, accelerating plans to close Rikers and incarcerating people or allege for technical parole violations. Um, I just I just have an important question. Why does the city and state feel that they have the right to take human life? Because for as long as human life continues to be treated inhumane and the longer it takes for the less is more bill to be signed, that's exactly what you're doing. Let's not wait another few numbers to go up in death again for something to be done. At the end of this meeting, this bill shouldn't be put up for consideration or debate. It should be signed. And that's that's my time. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Now we'll hear from Marvin Mayfield, followed by Jane Elke, followed by Elliot Rosa. Time starts now. Um, thank you, uh, Councilman um, Powers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I, I appreciate it, but I'm a little disheartened that the people who most need to hear this message are not here. I look around the Zoom bosses and I see my comrades. I see people who have been hurting. I see people who have been directly impacted and affected by this, which uh, as others say, we've been preaching to the choir. So um, I hope that in future meetings, future uh, uh, hearings that the directly impacted people will have a greater role to, to reach those who we need to speak to. Um, but my name is Marvin Mayfield. I'm a lifelong New York City resident and a survivor of Rikers Island and the boat. Um, I'm here to demand swift action to stop the death and the, the atrocities of Rikers Island. Since the day that Rikers Island opened in 1932, it has been synonymous with violence and death. And it is unconscionable to know that in this present day and age, we are still faced with the horrific reality of death and despair in a place that has never been proven conducive to the so-called uh, uh, rehabilitation objectives of the criminal legal system. So for years, we as advocates have stood on the steps of City Hall and warned this, the administrations of the city that Rikers is a death trap. And if things were left as they are, that further life would be lost. So, so it's, it's a real tragedy that we're once again here carrying the names of the dead carrying the names of those who, who, who died needlessly because of violence, apathy, brutality, and negligence of a failed system. So today, while we mourn the loss of our loved ones, we are demanding that the mayor, the DAs, the city council move quickly to end the torture of Rikers Island. It's, it's, it's not only the, the right thing to do, it is now a humanitarian rescue effort. We're already too late for all the people who have suffered and died there. 
But before we lose another I life to Torture Island, we call on our lawmakers to pass any and all legislation that can help decarcerate our jails in New York City and to use your legislative power to save the lives of those who are suffering as we speak. I have seen and experienced things there that I cannot forget and I deal with the trauma to this day. We may never know the real toll of, uh, of the trauma which may reveal itself long after a person has endured the hell of Rikers Island. As we all know, Khalif Browder made it out of the cage only to carry the weight of those, those cell bars with them. Just yesterday, I received a call from a man in OBCC who details the horrible conditions that they are forced to endure. He explained to me that, that meals are hours and hours late, that medical treatment is being denied, that correction officers are not manning their posts, which allows the gangs to take over. People are not being taken to court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've heard it all day. I have 13 minutes of testimony from this man who is in the belly of the beast as we speak. So I challenge any of our legis legislators who still may be on this call uh, to listen to this urgent plea. It's, this is not some game. This is an urgent public health crisis that is unfolding in New York City jails. And the only way to stop the death toll from rising is to, and to stop the suffering is to stop sending people to this hellish place. And yes, we call on the governor uh, to sign the Less Is More Act and stop uh, caging people needlessly for technical parole violations. Rikers Island is a tool of a bygone era which has proven to be non-effective. And that includes the Vernon C. Bain Detention Center, which was uh, supposed to be a, a temporary fix. If the DOC can't live up to its claim of care, custody, and control, then there's no longer any justification for its existence. 10 people have died this year. Uh, at Rikers, many by suicide. And I'd be interested, interested to know how many attempts there were during the same period. And if I could offer a piece of observation, it seems like it's painfully obvious as to why employees are not showing up for work. It's because Rikers Island is a stain on the spirit of everybody that it touches. And to our city council and our state legislators, we know that many of you stand with us and I'm grateful and encouraged by your support, but know that we will not sit still while the lives of our brothers and sisters are devalued and placed in jeopardy and we call on you to free them now thank you thank you for being here and thank you for like with everyone for waiting such a long time today Thanks for being here. now we'll hear from jane elke followed by elliot rosa followed by christina sparrick time starts now i'm jane elke and thank you for this opportunity and thanks to all of you who have hung in for this long day I live in Brooklyn. I'm an advocacy volunteer in the movement to close Rikers. And I do want to say, uh, Ms. Tamara Carter, testimonies, stories like yours are what fuel our compassion and our those of us in the private sector and volunteer-wise or nonprofits and advocates. It keeps us going, it keeps us caring, keep those stories in front of us. And a few of you have mentioned there's a major glaring deficiency in the hearing today. We don't have anybody who's currently held at Rikers. I can't believe that the state and city legislature are just now seeing the problems and the extent of what's going on. Um, I'm thankful to those who today who have emphasized the need for a whole new system. Though I realize today we're addressing the immediate crisis that we're currently in. I'm going to use my time to speak on behalf of a very close friend who has been held pre-trial at Rikers for almost nine months this year, since early January. His case is actually still in the discovery stage. So um, I hope you'll give me a little grace time so I can pass on what I hear from him. He's not wealthy, he's 59 years old. He was working two minimum wage jobs to try to get out of the shelter and stay out of the shelter be independent uh, during and his arrest and in his time at Rikers, he's had bail set too high for him to pay. So he can't buy his freedom, which keeps him in Rikers. It means he's lost his employment. He can't be working with his attorney directly. He can't get even any information on his case because he has to get it through the law library that's not been opened. I'm expired. For most of the year. For nine months, his discovery court dates have been postponed off and off again, partly due to staff not able to get him to schedule video court times or getting him there late. And the judge saying, well, 
goods um, come back in two months, partly due to district attorneys negotiating for extensions. When he has access to one of the four phones in his dormitory housing 50 some men now down across, he calls and he tells me the conditions he's been living with. So I ask you again for a little grace time while I, I read from my notes that I've taken from my phone calls with him. We should give you a little more time, but we do have a lot of other folks who are still signed up. Okay. So I'll go right through this since he can't be here. I want to speak on his behalf. Men who are seriously mentally ill are being traumatized, brutalized, subjected to gang violence. They're mostly not able to sleep. They're not able to grasp what's going on. There's scarce attention to people with the mental health issues. When my friend sees mentally ill individuals transferred to another unit or facility for their mental problems, it's after they've already suffered days in the general population. The increased overcrowding for COVID conditions, many beds or most of them now are just three feet apart. Newcomers are sometimes not receiving any bedding for days, which means they're standing up against a wall at night while they can try not to call attention to themselves until they collapse and fall to the floor. Um, people aren't being escorted on time to video conferences for court appointments, medical services, time with family. Sporadic mail service, sometimes no mail coming in or going out for up to a week. Delayed pickup resulted in his absentee ballot for our primary getting sent out after the postmark required date. Incoming mail is not forwarded and individuals move to another facility. I've had that happen. Sporadic violent outbreaks as frustration builds among people whose basic needs are routinely ignored. The chaos and the violence have been escalated. There's more drug use in the dorm at Rikers. There's more access to it. And along with the mentally ill, there's people with addiction problems who need separate treatment. Days at a time with no toilet paper, men using rags for toileting, some weeks at a time with no clean laundry, no clean sheets, towels or washcloths, no or limited time outdoors, no drinking water available other than from bathroom faucets and limited bottled water from the commissary. We, we have to just wrap it up. We have to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next, you'll hear from Elliot Rosa, followed by Christina Sparrick, followed by Carol Eady. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Elliot Rosa, and I'm going to give you my testimony. My experience being at Rikers Island was terrible. I stayed in Rikers intake for seven days. Oh, I'm on mute. Oh, no. I stayed in the intake for seven days. There was no medical. There was no beds, no bed sheets. There was no, no blankets, no mattresses at night. There was no um, hygiene supplies for any inmates. Um, and the toilets was broken. People had to still use the, um, the toilets while they, there was urine and feces still overflowing from the toilets. Um, when it was time to eat, not everybody got um, food because they ran out of food. I didn't eat for three days. Um, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you, yep. Okay, um, um, when I, when I, I, I haven't ate for three days when I first went there. Um, it was, um, and when I did eat, it was half of a portion of something that you wouldn't even want to eat. And there was, there was people throwing up, people asking for um, medical, and um, the CEOs was looking at them as if it was a joke. When it, um, until, and as well, they was looking at it as they was waiting for it to get worse. Um, also, I didn't get to use the phone because the um, other inmates was controlling the phones. Um, another thing, um, I had no, I had no access of my family or talk to my family in, in um, on the outside of of jail, as well as. Um, going to court. I missed my court date because of the fact that I was Time explaining to the CEOs that I, had, that I had court and they just looked at me like they they didn't care. 
Um, there was over there was about 30 to 50 people in one cell. Most of them haven't been. Um, and most of them haven't seen medical. It was overcrowded. Some people didn't even get to um, lay down or you know um, rest. Uh, besides that, the urine. Um, besides that, um, the urine and feces. Everybody felt like you know it was. Hold on, I'm kind of nervous. All right, we'll give you a. a, a, a I I think we hit our time. Hello? We'll give you another minute just to finish up. What people was going through, it shouldn't happen. What people was going through, it shouldn't happen. Everybody was treated wrong. When I said um. There was a whole lot of people fighting in the cells and I didn't feel safe. There was no way to hide. And um, I sincerely give my condolences to the people that really lost somebody that's in Rikers Island. Because Rikers Island is really hard. The CEOs don't care. Certain things that happen, CEOs just look and wait until it, you know, escalate and see blood or you know somebody is really hurt and that's not cool and that's all i have to say thank you thank you for testifying and for being here and for waiting for so long really appreciate it next we will hear from carol edy followed by pamela neely followed by angie time starts now I'm in Good afternoon, my name is Carol Lee. I represent the Women's Community Justice Association and I'll be on Rose's campaign. I thank you for allowing me to testify. This morning's New York Times described Rikers Island as chaotic and violent. Yesterday, the mayor implemented some mandates as response to this chaos. Some of these should have been put in place a long time ago, but were not. And I feel the reason for that is the mayor hasn't been to Rikers in more than four years. Now he's quoted as having said he plans to visit at some time, some time. If he were to visit the island, he would see the conditions of confinement there. We've heard reports of flooding, lack of air conditioning, subpar meals, and 10 detainee deaths in just the last year. One detainee stated he was housed in a shower area which didn't have a toilet, and he vomited and defecated in the same place where he had to sleep. If Mr. Blasio were to visit, he might be more amenable to releasing the approximately 225 lowly charged persons whom he's able to release immediately. He agreed nearly three years ago that to decarcerate and close the deplorable set of facilities. He should not be reopening closed jails. As we know, challenges to the new locations and the pandemic have slowed down implementation of the four borrow model, but we can still close Rose M. Singer now. It holds, four, it holds women, the smallest but fastest growing population. It's a decrepit facility where women have been sexually abused and have no access to feminine hygiene products or mental health support for weeks at a time. Due to officer call outs, people are unable to attend visits, programming, and court visits, which recently resulted in Elias Johnson's mental illness related death while being held on a dollar bail. We're asking that Rikers Island be closed, that Rosie's be closed immediately, and that decarceration efforts continue in the midst of these closings. Governor Hochul, please sign the Lessons More Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for testifying. Next, we will hear from Pamela Neely, followed by Angie, followed by Georgie Pate. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Pamela Neely and I'm a member of WCJA as well as Beyond the Bar campaign. I have a speech prepared, but I don't even know, like this hearing that that sister, Ms. Carter and um, Laylene's sister speak, I just know that there are rules and regulations, there are things to be done, but we don't had a thousand meetings, we had heard a thousand sorry, and still people are dying. It just seems to me that in my mind, something, something else can be done. And I just say that for myself, I know that I'm gonna keep praying because that's where my belief is, but I also know that what's happening to people is not right. I don't even understand how some people can sleep at night knowing that they cutting ropes down on people's bodies, knowing that they lying to family members, knowing that they doing the things that they do. I know we are at the end of the day and I know everybody on this call is tired. 
But I think as a human being, we owe something more to ourselves. We owe something to those people whose lives are gone. There's no coming back. There's no rehabilitation. There's no re-entry. There's no nothing. They are dead. And this is just sad. I just feel like why are we continuing to try to fix a problem that's not fixable? I just feel that we should close down and, and, and I agree with everything everyone else has said on this call. Not only should we close Rosie's down, but we need to just look at what, what like Rikers Allen was built on and just hold, hold each other accountable for the part we all played in this. I'm going to continue to fight. There are too many powerful people on this call today that's teaching me everything. I'm going to continue to fight. And what I don't know, I don't have an area asking and how I can help. So I'm asking you, who are still on this call, how can you help? Thank you. I'm expired. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Angie, followed by Georgie Page, followed by Richenda Kramer. Time starts now. Looks like we don't have Angie, so we'll go to Georgie Page. Time starts now. Hi, sorry, I'm here. Go ahead, Angie. Yeah. Um, to the City Council Committee on Criminal Justice, I am attending this meeting to voice my support for immediate decarceration inside NYC jails, starting with Rikers. The city's so-called leaders must commit to emptying the cages immediately with a transparent and public plan to shut down Rikers, not by 2027, but immediately. We must take back your lie that Rikers is closing and take real action to radically decarcerate. 6,000 people are in deadly conditions right now, and the city must commit to releasing people caged on Rikers, fewer arrests, ending broken windows policing, improving conditions inside, and providing holistic non-carceral reentry support. The only solution is release and care for those inside, not more COs who have proven unable to manage the violence inside Rikers, not more cages which will not prevent the violence that is characteristic of New York City jails, and not more cops who send more people inside every day. As the city council, the deaths of those inside are on your hands as much as anyone else. You must ensure immediate releases in the thousands. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Georgie Page, followed by Richenda Kramer, followed by Grace Price. Time starts now. Not hearing from Georgie, so we'll go to Richenda Kramer. Time starts now. Hello, I'm sorry, it's it's Georgie. I just did the same thing as the previous caller. Um, can I go after the next person? Oh, go ahead, you're on. You can go ahead. Good evening, my name is Georgie Page and I'm a volunteer member of 350 Brooklyn, a local environmental group working to counter the global climate crisis crisis, which means that all of my advocacy work is unpaid. I serve as chair of 350 Brooklyn City Action Committee, and I'm also a member of their steering committee. I'm basically liquidating my savings so that I can do this work and hold our elected, elected representatives accountable to the people. This work that I feel is critical. I dedicate my testimony today to honor Khalif Browder and the 4,600 pre-trial detainees being held and brutalized at Rikers Island today. As I have joined in the fights for electric school buses and against peaker plants, I've also worked to help make 350 Brooklyn more inclusive. As environmentalists, it might seem to others that the plight of detainees is beyond our scope. And the reality is that whenever we think we are, wherever we think we are going as a movement and as a people, we cannot get there by leaving any of our brothers and sisters or our humanity behind. In fact, our humanity must come first. 
To paraphrase a famous quote, humanity is not a station we arrive at, it is how we will get there. So through that lens, I ask each one of us to take personal responsibility for what is happening right now on Rikers Island, for the pretrial detainees standing in pools of waste, for the brutality killings and the suicides, 10, 10 killings and counting in 2021 alone, and for motivating DOC employees with a new sense of mission as well. I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, and since the site seems irredeemable and is built on methane leaking pile of waste, it must continue to close. We must amend and pass intro 2173, legislation to end the barbarism of solitary confinement. We must release detainees being held for technical parole violations. We must hold perpetrators of abuse and brutality accountable with independent oversight agreed upon by the mayor, the city council, and the BOC. And the BOC must immediately release their reports about death, number of deaths in custody. Time expired. Personally, I think that the detainees should be involved in the oversight. I had more to say. I've submitted it as written. I would also like to request that um, my organization and at least our coalition be provided with the timeline that was spoken about earlier in the testimony for the closure of Rikers and the um, opening of the borough based jails. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Richenda Kramer, followed by Grace Price. Time starts now. Okay. Um, I've been a volunteer. I'm Richenda Kramer. I live on Staten Island. I've been a volunteer in working for prison reform for the last 20 years. Um, Today we've been hearing about um, the COs abusing people in their charge across the years, and yet nothing changes. We learned of um, police brutality through videos, and, and the videos have really changed the way people look at the police now. Um, but there's no such protection for the incarcerated, as there are so many prisons with broken cat with no cameras, so many places in prisons with no cameras or broken cameras. There needs to be more surveillance of COs and recognition that their power can corrupt them. Another issue I'd like to address is solitary confinement, which the DOC is intent on maintaining despite the Holt Bill, which was passed in Albany this year and which mandates 14 hours out of, out of cell with programming out of cell and with other people. I add my voice to others asking city council to amend intro 2173 to stress that out of cell does not mean sitting on a platform in a cage in front of the solitary cell for 14 hours and that programming must be a group activity. This is something you can do that has long been recognized as torture, to relieve something that's long been recognized as torture. And the third thing I'd like to mention is that there needs to be more pro programming in every prison in this country, but especially in, in New York. And that it's very easy to get volunteer volunteers to come in to teach. There are enormous numbers of people who are highly educated by. in this country who would enjoy teaching. Um, so I pass that on as a suggestion for programming in, any, in all of the jails in New York City. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. Next we will hear from Grace Price. Time starts now. Hi, I, I thank you so much for giving me the time, but I rescinded my time to Melania Brown and I'm gonna stick by that. But please pay attention to my written testimony. I outline a plan for the BOC specifically with the upcoming council. Thank you so much. Thank you, thanks so much. This concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, could you please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function now and we will try to hear from you. I have 
Zara who is testifying. Um, so we should call up. I also believe we have an assembly member who's gonna be joining us shortly. So let's just keep it open for a few more minutes just to see if they're attending. But uh, I see Zara with her hand up and uh, can invite her to testify. Time starts now. Um, hi, everybody. Good evening, chairs, powers, and Miller, um, and committee members, if you're present. My name is Zara Nasser, and I'm, a, I'm the deputy director at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. A little bit about AVP, we are the only LGBTQ-specific victim services agency in the city. Um, we operate a bilingual 24-7 hotline and provide legal and counseling services and advocacy for LGBTQ and HIV affected survivors of all forms of violence. We also have counselors that work with incarcerated survivors inside the jail system. And we've been saying for years, Rikers is a death trap, but now the level of overcrowding and lack of sanitation, safety, water, meals, and medical care means that we're in crisis. And in this chaos, LGBTQ people and people affected by HIV are extremely vulnerable to violence and death. Um, Isaiah Johnson, the young black gay dis disabled man who died in Rikers last week, is just the latest LGBTQ New Yorker to be killed within the system. LGBTQ and HIV affected people face increased violence and elected officials touring the facility this week reported seeing a trans woman placed in male facilities, deprived of hormone treatments and people, li people living with HIV deprived of life-saving medication. As a top doctor, as Riker's top doctor has said, the city is not capable of safely managing those in its custody. We joined the New York campaign for alternatives to isolated confinement and the Jails Action Coalition in calling for immediate decarceration and an end to solitary. The jail population has doubled since July 2020. The mayor, judges, DAs, and the city council must do what it takes to decarcerate immediately. Use the 6A program, push for less is more, utilize city bail funds, and most of all, stop sending people to jail when COs are unable to produce them for court appearances anyway, as in the case with Isaiah Johnson. The city council must also end con uh, solitary confinement, confinement by amending and then passing Time the legislation and this practice. I'm almost done. Um, we've been calling for an end to solitary since Laylene Polanco's death in 2019, and three years later, we'll st we're still waiting. I just want to echo Melania's testimony that this needs to end. Um, and the city must stop stalling and relieve people in jails from these horrific conditions now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arden. Nice to see you. Um, I see that Assemblymember Gonzalez Rojas has joined us. Time starts now. Yeah, so I'm going to call the assembly member up uh, to testify. She's here. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me and accommodating me at this time. Um, Chairman, Chairperson Power Miller and the members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Civil Service and Labor. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. I am the assembly member for the 34th district. I am also testifying as an advocate, a neighbor, and as a New Yorker. On Monday, I visited Rikers Island with several of my colleagues in the state legislature. This was the second time I had visited the jail, and it was the fourth visit I had made to a jail or prison in our state in eight months in office. So I'll be direct. Rikers Island is in an absolute state of emergency. The conditions are inhumane and we must act if we truly want to save lives because no person deserves to go without food, without healthcare, without life-saving medication and without basic sanitary conditions. No worker deserves to work triple shifts under unsafe conditions. And there is legislation that I am a co-sponsor of at the state level that would address this persistent problem. Rikers Island is, at it, as it has been known for so long, as Torture Island. So I wanna name a few names. Esaias Johnson, Brandon Rodriguez, Robert Jackson, Segunda Guapa, Wilson Diaz Guzman, Tomas Carlo Camacho, Javier Velasco, Thomas Earl Bronson III, Richard Blake, and Jose Mejia. These are all people who were incarcerated on Rikers Island and who had completed suicide. And why? Because the carceral system is not public health. The carceral system is not public safety. 
And we, as elected officials, should be sick to our stomach that these deaths happened under our watch. It nearly happened under my watch. On Monday, I witnessed an attempted suicide. A young man tried to hang himself in my presence. This is a crisis, so we need to act now. As I'm aware that the city has put forward a plan of action for Rikers Island, but as you know, as much as I do, that reform is not working. It has not worked. You cannot reform an inherently deadly institution. We must abolish it. I want to, I want to ensure that all people are safe, including all workers and all people who are incarcerated. So I'm asking for your help in accomplishing the following. One, the mayor, judges, district attorneys, and the council must take immediate steps to decarcerate the jails. Two, we can take a step in doing so today by calling on Governor Hochul to sign the Less Is More Act. And three, we must truly, truly form end all forms of solitary confinement. While this may seem radical to some, uh, but to have something we've never had, we must do something we've never done. We have never known a decarceral world that prioritizes our humanity and provides housing for all, universal health care, and relieves hunger. But we can achieve it only if we have the political will. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, and thank you and all your colleagues. Thanks, first of all, thank you for being, I think, potentially our last uh, person eight month, uh, to testify eight hours into our hearing. I appreciate you you coming and, and, and being here, and also the folks that uh, you joined on Monday for be going, seeing the conditions yourself, which I do, do, do think is important to understand the folks that are dealing with uh, the conditions there, doctors, staff, people that are, uh, are being uh, held there. So appreciate that. One thing I want to flag for you, and I also mentioned some of your colleagues, as we talk about the Less is More Act, and, and especially hoping that Governor Hochul will sign that bill ur ur urgently, um, as I spoke for, I know you have as well. Um, there is a, I, I believe, these, as somebody flagged for us earlier, the implementation of the start date of that is March 2022, and I think we all like to see that moved up. So uh, even alongside, hopefully, a signing will potentially be maybe a chapter amendment to help move that date to be even more effective yes. so for your yes. support. <laughs> She needs to sign it and uh, authorize immediate uh, execution of the program. Yeah, well, thank you for, for being here and, and taking time and taking time to, to go there as well and uh, appreciate it. I think we're gonna do just one more. So thank, thank you. And thank I think we're gonna do it. one more a survey of anybody who has we missed. Uh, I'll head back to my committee council. Yes, if anyone um, still hasn't testified, you may use the Zoom raise hand function now. I'm not seeing any hands. I think we're good to close out. Thank you. Um, I think the assembly member's testimony is, and, and the testimony right throughout the day, you know, provide a proper uh, ending to this, which is that the folks who have been there, who have experienced it, who work there, have all been saying the same thing uh, throughout this day, which is that the conditions at our city jails, uh, we are in an urgent crisis moment. That's why we're here today. That is why folks are going there to witness these conditions. And that's why we're been calling for things like the Close Rikers Island, to sign the Less is More Act and do a lot more. We're now uh, I suppose eight and a half hours into this hearing and the message has been consistent throughout it. And we appreciate everybody who has been patient with us uh, throughout this day as we've tried to get everybody an opportunity to testify and for folks that obviously could not today because they uh, because of the length of the hearing, we certainly will look out for written testimony uh, and obviously more ideas. And I want to thank the countless folks who have met with us leading up to this hearing as well. And of course, uh, uh, all the staff here at the City Council and my office who have been helping to work and manage this uh, 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 hearing today. And my colleagues, I see a couple still here, Councilman Rosenthal, Councilman Riley, Councilmember Adams. And of course, Chair Miller, who I know is uh, shuttling between events, but still on and paying attention and listening to the stories here. I want to thank them for continuing to be here for a very long day. But I want us to make sure we end it with a, sort of another recognition of the urgency here. And when we started, it was a, sort of making sure that the agencies, the mayor's office and others understood the urgency that was being reflected by people who had been there and working there. 
we've heard hours of testimony from people saying the same thing. I think it's not only important that all the leaders are going there and, it, and, and witnessing conditions, but that we're using all the tools at our disposal to address them. And I think one thing we have talked about today is that we still believe we're not doing all of that. We're not using all the tools at our disposal to help us address this. I will be out of Rikers um, uh, myself, and I would uh, you know, imminently, and I hope others will do that uh, as well. Um, I want to thank all the folks who are there, folks who are trying to fix these problems as, 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 uh, as difficult as they are. And I want to thank everyone who's contributing to that. Um, I don't have to repeat my opening statement, but we are in a crisis and it requires all hands on deck. And I'm, I'm hardened to see my state elected officials being here and, and understanding our relationship to fix it together. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you to everyone for being here today, for adding your voices. And uh, we are not ending at this hearing today. This is one moment to spotlight all the issues here. And we have a lot of work to do. And I am part of that solution as, as everyone else here. And so uh, with that, we'll close the hearing. I want to say thank you to everyone for being here and we will continue to do our work together to add that urgency and highlight at the city and state level and potentially federal level that they do everything we can to address these conditions of safety, security, staffing, and much more. So thank you everyone for being here today. And with that, we are adjourned.